Hello again, friends. The great Brian Last here. You there, and we're back with another special Jim Cornette Omnibus Edition, and this one, by popular demand, a collection of Guess the Program, the fun game we play on the show where Jim and myself try to trip one another up or just disseminate wrestling information based on old wrestling programs from our collection. And of course, the man who I played this game with is here right now, Mr. Jim Cornette. Hey, baby, we don't play no games here. We're serious. You know what? You sounded you sounded like a game show host when you did that introduction. And it's Guess the Program, the fun way to win prizes and cash. And, you know, you sound like... Stan Lane. I sounded like Stan Lane is what you Well, you, you sounded kind of like Stan Lane. Maybe Gene Rayburn or John Davidson. You ever notice nobody ever saw John Davidson and Eric Bischoff in the same room at the same time? But nevertheless... You, you know, everyone always said Eric Bischoff looks like a game show host. No, he looked like one specific game <laughs> show host. <laughs> but John, John Davidson. John Davidson looked like the epitome of a game show host. It's like if you... If you built a game show host, he would look like John Davidson if you built him from scratch. And then then there comes, you know, Bishop, he's got the fake teeth, he's got the fake hair, he had the fake tan, he had the fake talent, he had everything. But anyway, we are here <laughs> for an omnibus to get on the bus and drive down memory lane. Memory lane. Memory lane and turn right at Confusion Avenue and then go into comatose circle where we'll drive around for a little while. But uh, this is the game that we play. Games people play. You take them or you leave them. Things that they say, honor bright. If I promise you the moon and the stars, would you believe them? Games people play in the middle of the night, Alan Parsons Project. We're going to play these games today all in one compendium for the people who enjoy learning about wrestling history from our mental gymnastics as we try to figure these things out that's right. this is one of the many things we bring to you during the holiday season folks including crotch rot and and probably income tax audits that's right for those of you who say we really love when you guys do this on the show we go listen to it all day here's your chance there you go the jim Cornette guess the program omnibus starting right now It is what the now hell time. was that? It is now time for a new segment, Brian's Corner, here on the drive through Jim, we're going to play a game. What's in hey, your we're, pocket? We're going to play no. a game, and you're going to put me in a silo and say, try to find the corner. No, no, no. What I'm going to do is I have three programs I've taken off the pile behind me of things I need to file. I'm going to tell you the card. You pick which show you would have spent your money to attend. Okay, well, now, hold on. Hold on. Let's make this even more interesting. Give me the card, and I'm going to tell you, if after each card, I'm going to tell you what territory I think it was and what year I think it was, and then I will pick the card at the end that I would have attended. Okay, a couple of these I think may be easy. We'll start with this one. I'll go from main event down. I okay. know, I'll go from opening match up. Opening, All right. Opening match. Just be consistent. The opening match, Adrian Belagiron Belagian. versus the Russian Angel. Okay. Second match, Kojima Saito versus Cyclone Negro. Okay. The third match, Jack Dalton versus Sam Steamboat. Ooh. Okay. Fourth match, Jim Dalton versus Johnny Costas. Okay. Like a good old-fashioned show. Then we get a tag team match, the Dalton Boys versus Sam Steamboat and Johnny Costas. <laughs> okay. So this was probably not one of the bigger towns. And the main event, which I think will give away the show, two out of three falls, Sputnik Monroe versus Duke Kiyomuka. Okay, well, we're in Florida. One of the smaller towns. I'm going to say... In the area of 1965 to 7. We are in Fort Worth, Texas. What? November 13th, 1961. 60, holy shit. I thought that would have been Florida because of Steamboat and Kiyomoka and Monroe. 
I see that I was mistaken. All right. I thought this would be an easy one for you. I thought you would immediately identify Son this. Of a bitch. By the way, this program, it was originally sent to a fan. The fan's name from Trenton, New Jersey, James Morrison. Oh, my God. J.J. <laughs> Dillon. That's right. How did you get that? I've got a whole bunch of his. I got a whole bunch of different programs and magazines. And you look at the labels and you're like, how did I get this? I got a bunch of old big time wrestling and wrestling lives addressed to Les Milady. I've got some addressed to Angelo Poffo. I've got some addressed to Silvio Poffo. I've got some addressed to Nunya. Because I don't want you to know who they were they were addressed to. How about that? All right, well, you failed the first one. Let me give All you another right, card. I flunked out. That was the shits. The second card, the opening match, Alex Perez versus Jerry Kozak. The second match, Mr. Fuji versus Pez Watley. Ooh. The third match, Johnny Weaver and Scott Casey versus the Super Destroyer and Dennis Stamp. The fourth match, which may be the one that completely gives it away. <laughs> Swede Hansen versus Ricky Romero. And finally, for the World Heavyweight Championship, Terry Funk versus Tank Patton. Well, it obviously was the West Texas Amarillo territory. It was obviously, God, it would almost have to be, uh, let's see, would Terry won in um, 76? I didn't know Johnny Weaver worked Texas in 76. Lubbock, Texas, November 5th, 1976. There you go. And our final program, let me open this up to the card here. The opening match, Dennis Hall versus Big Bad John. <laughs> and then we get a mixed match, a midget lady and a grown man. Darlin Dagmar. No. No? Diamond Lil? Cuddles Anderson and Jose Battencourt versus Baby Celine and Pepe Lopez. Pepe Lopez. What did I say? You said Pepe. Pepe Lopez, excuse me. Pepe Lopez. And then we get two main events. The second main event, for the first time in town, Ernie Cat Lad versus Suji Sito. And the main event, a grudge match ordered by the NWA, Ken Lucas and Bob Armstrong versus the interns with Dr. Ken Raimi. Intern spelt I-N-T-E-R-N-E-S. Yeah, there was an optional E with the interns <laughs> back in those days. Um, it's the Tennessee Territory, I would think. And I would have to say that that's... God damn it. 70? 71? 72? April 20th, 1970. Okay. Birmingham. Birmingham, Alabama. But that's the Tennessee Territory. It is. It the is. The Goulas Welch Territory. Okay. Yes, and uh, you go back, Ernie Ladd um, made several appearances as a star, even in the late 60s, early 70s, in, in that territory, and they brought him in most of the time as a babyface for the African-American crowd. Peepee Lopez. I didn't say pee-pee. <laughs> well, you, you have a funny way of pronouncing things. For example, when you say things like cool whip or white, you, you say it white instead of white. All right, guess this card. You ready? All right. Joe Blanchard versus Paul DeGaulle. Ted Christie versus Herbie Freeman. Good Lord. Bob Nandor versus Argentina Bogney. Aldo Bogney. Right. Billy Darnell and Tiny Tim versus Hardy Crusscamp and Bill Brummel. Bo Brummel. It says Bull, it? B U L L. Okay. Jim Sixay versus Lord Bleers. Billy Varga versus Seymour Koning. And the main event, Fritz von Goring versus Nature Boy Rogers. I was, I'm about to say that, uh, that's California. That's 
1955, six, seven. No, 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 no. July 30th, 1958, the Olympic auditorium. Okay. So I was one year off, but you guessed three years. Well, I had a, a range there. All right. Billy Varga uh, spilled the beans on that being California. Count Billy Varga. There's a certain name. When I said Ricky Romero, I'm like, okay, this gives it away instantly. As soon as you hear this name, because some of those yeah. other names, you're like, okay, Scott Casey did get around and go some places early in his career, but Ricky Romero, that can only be one place. There you go. He, he was so successful, he didn't have to leave. You know what I've really become a big fan of? I got a few of these, and I'm trying to get more. I got one right here. The Nashville Wrestling News newspaper. You well, you've, the 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 wrestling news newspaper, but they did an a, it, like the wrestling news Norman Kites. No, 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 no. Before no, that, no, like from the fifties, the actual newspaper. Oh, okay. Uh, well, it, but it, was it a newspaper? Because I've got some of the old Nashville programs. It was just, it was a larger size, but it was just a one sheet folded over to four pages. I mean, in a way, this is that, but this is newspaper size. Wow, I have not seen that. Yeah, Matt Gossip by Nick Goulas. Let me see. Does it actually have a card here? Well, he knew all the gossip. He sure That's did. For sure. Uh, does it list the actual card in here? Uh, okay, here's the card. I'm sorry, I bumped the mic. Guy LaRose versus Danny Dusick. Cyclone Anaya. By the, by the way, wait, back up now. Guy LaRose, you know who that was. That's, oh, which uh, Frenchman is that who changed his gimmick? Hans uh, Schmidt. Hans Schmidt. That is the biggest German heel of the 1950s. He was one at, at one year in the early 50s out of Chicago, was one of the five highest paid wrestlers in the country. And Danny Dusick was an off-brand synthetic Dusick brother that was based in Nashville for years and years. Also on the show, Cyclone Anaya versus Tony Martin. And the main event, again, only three matches on the show in Nashville. That was a big show back then. The main event, history's biggest return grudge tag battle. <laughs> in history. No time limit. That's the way he used to say it. Nick would say, we got history's biggest return grudge tag team battle in history. No time limit, no disqualification. Two referees, both in the ring. Winner take all. The Fargo brothers were ordered to accept the return match or be suspended. Also, one of them must wear a jacket so they can be told apart when wrestling. The main event for the World Tag Titles, the champions, Jackie and Don Fargo versus Buddy Rogers and Tex Riley. Wow. How about that wow. tag team? Now, it, everybody's going, Tex Riley, who the fuck? Tex Riley was one of the biggest baby faces in the history of the Tennessee Territory in the 40s and 50s and into the maybe early 60s. And that's why he was in that match, because he was probably the big uh, he was a bigger box office attraction as a baby face in Tennessee at that point than maybe even Buddy Rogers would have been um but that's especially fucking cool because Jackie and Don Fargo took so much from Buddy Rogers and with their connection with Jack Pfeffer of course he encouraged their liberal borrowing of stuff like that but the strut and the blonde hair and the jackets they were a tag team version of Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. That's why they got over, and plus they could work. And so that was, and that's going to be 19, it's either going to be 57 or 58. Very good. June 18th, 1957, Hippodrome. There you go. Because they came in in 57, the Fargos in, in Tennessee, and got over so strong for the next three or four years, they would always have a run, then they'd leave and go somewhere and then come back in and have another run again. And uh, they were remembered so well when Jackie decided to stay there and Don left. That's what made Jackie the, the, the guy for the next 15 years. And Jerry Jarrett was so impressed by the Fargos when he saw him. He was a 12-year-old, 13-year-old kid selling the programs in the, in the Hippodrome in Nashville. When he got... His territory, his company started. Years later, he needed a babyface tag team. That's where the fabulous ones came from because he just redid the Fargo Brothers playbook, but starting as babyfaces and put Jackie with them to give them the stamp of validation. And it fucking took off like a rocket. 
Hey, you want to guess who wrote this? Uh, at least who it seems like wrote this. I'll read the opening paragraph here. Promoter Nick Goulis assigned another great all-star card for Tuesday night at the Hippodrome. Did promoter Nick Goulis write that? Probably. Either that or, you know, I mean, everybody knew his style. It was always the same verbiage. The newspaper ads looked the same. The way the, the matches were sold. No time limit, no disqualification. History's biggest grudge tag team battle in history, et cetera, et cetera. Everything was hyperbole. Everything was over the top. But unlike Bob Luce in Chicago, these weren't just provocative words blurted out. Kill, death ape, you know, what? hate, whatever, blood. This was somewhat complete sentences. But that was, that was the classic old-time Tennessee way of of doing the programs and and uh, the the programs between the wrestlers the ongoing rivalries and they'd start out with a match then they'd come back with a return match then they'd come back with a return match no time limit no disqualification then something dastardly would happen there and they'd return that with two referees it said you'd get every week so these guys would have matches for three four five six seven eight ten twelve weeks in a row until and they would keep it fresh until the ultimate blow off, which was if the baby face won cleanly with no rebuttal, that was it. Otherwise, your program was still going. DQ, count out, no contest, heel gets a win by a fuck, whatever, you can keep going. The people will come back if you do your job right every week until the baby face wins. Once the baby face wins, don't book that match again. Go to the next thing. It's not that fucking hard. Well, let's go to the next thing here, but that was our new segment where we look at old programs. Good job. That was our new segment that called Brian Last Pull Something Out of His Ass to Stir This Show uh, On to Victory. Let's get to our next segment here. The next segment is entitled Things That Are Jim Cornette's Fault. Uh, we don't have enough time for that one. Hey! We, we could try that for one of the omnibus collections, I think. But, Jim, it is time for Brian's Corner, where we do whatever Brian wants for a few minutes while we try to find some questions. It, surprisingly, was very popular last week on the show. So, once again, we're going to do the Guess the Program game. Are you prepared this week? Yes, I am, oh, great one. Well, I'm not. So, let me just grab these off the... Uh, <laughs> The pile here. Here we go. I got some. We'll start with this one. Let me open it up. I'm going to give you the card. You will guess the town and the year. I also want you to guess. Well, now, wait a minute. Instead of the town, can we go with the territory? Because it could be, you know, sometimes the territories had the same card, like Memphis and Louisville would have the same card, but I, I would know the territory rather than, especially you'll stick in fucking Oshkosh, Wisconsin on me. You can name the territory, bonus points if you get the town. Plus, okay. I also want you to name which match do you think was the one I said, that's it, Jim will get it, just based off this match. Okay. All right. We will start with the opening match. Mr. X versus Rick McGraw. Followed by Johnny Ringo versus Dean Ho. Scott Irwin versus Joe LaDuke. The Stomper, managed by James J. Dillon, versus Ricky Steamboat. Killer Tim Brooks and Bill Howard versus Porkchop Cash and Tom Jones. And finally, and this is probably the giveaway, the main event, Dick Slater versus Mr. Wrestling 2. I'm going with the Georgia Territory in 19... 79. Columbus, Georgia, October 6, 1976. Damn shit. God damn it. I should have gone earlier. The one I thought would cause you to get it was either the Stomper versus Steamboat or the Pork Chop Cash match. I thought you would either remember when Steamboat was there or you may know enough about where Pork Chop Cash was at various points in his yeah, history. Well, and I, I now in hindsight, I went because I was trying to date. And I now I realize I fucked it up. I was trying to date when JJ had this run with the Stomper in Georgia, and that was not correct. But anyway, so I was I had the territory. I missed the year. Okay, here's our next one. Let's see if we can get this opening bout: Johnny Brown versus Earl Rasmussen. 
<laughs> the second match, Danny O'Rourke versus Doug Dawkins. Good Lord. The third match, now you will know these wrestlers, Pedro Godoy versus Ray Urbano, who... Ooh, course, the original great Kabuki. The original Kabuki. And the main event for the tag titles, Tosh Togo and Tony Gardenia versus Sam Steamboat Jr. and Billy Varga. What the fuck? Oh, my God. Um, that would... <laughs> Early 60s, Billy Varga would indicate that it was out on the West Coast, but who is I didn't Sam say Steamboat? early 60s. I never said early 60s. I'm just saying that's my guess. I would think it, it, Pedro Godoy, Billy Varga, Tosh Togo, but who is Sam Steamboat Jr.? Um... I am stumped here on the, is this an is this an outlaw promotion? No, and actually the giveaway is in Sam Steamboat Jr. It's from October 5th, 1956, the Civic Auditorium, Honolulu. Honolulu, but he started there. He was Sam Steamboat Jr. He didn't lose the junior until he came wait, to the mainland. That's right, because he took the name from a what, a famous surfer or somebody that was that was known already as I Sam think so. Steamboat? Yeah. So that was Sam Steamboat, but that was when he started with Sam Steamboat Jr. All right. And Billy Varga makes sense because Hawaii is the other side of the West Coast, and so does then Tosh Togo and et cetera. You prick. This next one is extraordinary. If you get this one, I'll be impressed. Opening bout, Bobby Garcia versus Paul Harrison. The second event, Pancho Pico versus The Beast. A tag team match. Arion Lambracus, later known as Spiros Arion. Okay. And Andreas Lambracus versus The Mummy from somewhere in South America. And Gordo Shawawa, the Golden Stomach Squasher. Semi-final event, Cowboy Ron Reed versus Ken Lucas, two out of three falls. We're in Arizona. And the main event... The Mad Mongol, claw hold expert, versus Louis Tillet, French villain, two out of three falls. As I said, we are in Arizona. I am going to put the year as 1964. Let me commend you on getting the year. October 6, 1964. El Paso. Ah! Rat. All right. Well, El Paso isn't far from the state of Arizona. <laughs> so that would have been... Had the, the Guerreros weren't, weren't running El Paso at that point. Gory Guerrero was still active. Was he a promoter yet? Based on the look of this program... I think this may be from Leo Garibaldi, but I have to double check. Because it was a and certain look to the Garibaldi programs in Texas. Yeah. And I'm thinking that those guys, because Ron Reed worked the Arizona Territory and so did Ken Lucas uh, back in the days of, you know, Chris Colt and those guys and et cetera. So they may have been trading talent. And actually... If Louis Tillette's on the show, it may not be uh, Leo Garibaldi booking, but Jim, this next one, this is a tough one. That one wasn't? The opening bout, Bob Becker versus Charles Green. The second bout, Bill Hansen versus Ray Vilmer. The third bout, now this one I'm not exactly sure about, we'll talk about it, Sam Meneker, although it's, per it's spelled M-A-N-A-C-H-E-R. That Well, that's actually the correct spelling. Sam Meneker versus High Lee. Now, it doesn't say Sky High Lee. It just says High Lee, 290 Houston. That's, that's still him. The fourth bout, Ray O'Donnell versus Dr. Ed Miesky. And the main event, George Becker versus Gorgeous George. We are in... 
a smaller town in the Northeast in the either late 1940s or early 1950s. I believe this is Buffalo, November 19th, 1948. There you go. And I'm not a smaller town in relation. It wasn't New York. It wasn't the Philly Spectrum, whatever the case. So, yes, I, I, I claim victory. Okay, this next one, we have a couple more. The opening bout from Louisville, Kentucky, Stu Gibson <laughs> versus Rito Romero. Do you remember Stu Gibson? Uh, no, he was actually, uh, John Cosper has done some research on him, but he was actually before my time, but he was the tag team partner of Frank Scroy, who later became the Kentucky Athletic Commissioner. Stu Gibson, along with Black Panther Jim Mitchell, were the famous Louisville exports in those days. Well, that was one of the two preliminary bouts. The other one, Ray Gunkel versus Johnny Valentine. Wow. Suji Sito versus Angelo Poffo. Duke Kiyomuka versus Danny McShane. And the main event, Edmund Francis versus Gorgeous George. Of course, that being the future gentleman, Ed Francis, Hawaii promoter. Yeah, and that's some international names. There's not a lot of clues that would indicate one part of the country because all those guys were stars yeah. at one point. Well, not all of them, but most of them. Give me the, the, the two matches on top again. Danny McShane versus Duke Kiyomuka and Gorgeous George versus Edmund Francis. I think we're in Texas. We are in Fort Worth, Texas. Boom goes the dynamite. Now, year. I think we are in. Give me the preliminaries again. The preliminaries, Ray Gunkel versus Johnny Valentine. And Stu Gibson versus Rito Romero. 1958. 1954. June 21st, 1954. God damn it. I was going to go earlier, but then I say, you know what? Fuck it. But there it was. Now, here's one you'll never get. If you do, I'd be shocked. I'm going to try my hardest then just to make you. We only know two of the matches because there are three other big star bouts. But for the world's heavyweight championship, Rita Cortez versus Doris Dorsey. (laughs) And the main event G.G. Rogers, Bruno Sam Nartino, and the Mask Stomper versus <clears throat> Hobo Brazil, Harry Hamilton, and Lou Kez. I'm going to say Chicago or Boston, 1963. Akron, Ohio, Gosh. November 7th, 1964. And that is, of course, a, a, a production from our friend, the great Jack Pfeffer. That is indeed correct. And finally, Jim, since you really reacted well to this last week, I got another of my Nashville Wrestling News newspapers here. Now, this one, I'm telling you where it is, but listen to this card that promoter Nick Lewis is bringing, everyone. The opening match, Cheeto Gonzalez versus Prince Omar. The second match for the Southern Junior Heavyweight Championship. Now, of course, that's the future Southern Heavyweight Championship. Right. East Coast Junior Heavyweight Champion goes after the Southern Junior Heavyweight Champion, Tor Yamato versus Paul Carpentier. Now, I'm looking at this picture. This is not Edouard Carpentier. <laughs> no, it was his cousin. <laughs> and finally, the main event, a wild six-man Australian grood tag battle. They meant grudge, but they left out a G. <laughs> Winner take all, Jackie and Don Fargo and Ali Bay versus Mike Clancy. Herb Welch, and Ray Stevens. 1957. This is, hold on. November 5th, 1957. Boom! Wait a minute, hold on here. We got the applause. Yeah. Well, there it is, our guest the program game. Anyway, speaking of giving me nothing to work with, we have had a segment that is suddenly, we accidentally did it a couple of weeks ago on, on one of the programs, and it has accidentally become just the, the bell of the ball as far as new segments on our program. People are loving this. Like the cameos. I cut a cameo. I, one guy said, Cornette, 
do me a cameo on the screwy things that Brian Lass likes to eat and his food choices. So that's done 28,000 views on YouTube or whatever now. But also, you came up with just on the sperm of the moment, right out of your ass, you said, hey, Jim, I'm going to read you some lineups from some of the wrestling programs I've got in my collection and see if you can figure out the, the territory and the year. And we've done that a couple of times, and people are, are loving this. They're digging it, as the, as the young folks say. So we thought, I've, I, I really want another crack at it because I got a few, but I was off on a number of them just because of the exotic nature of the shit you pulled. So I want another crack at this. And, and, and the folks at home can play along. That's, that's, it's an audience participation thing. That's a good thing about this segment. It has become a popular feature on the drive through We did it once. It was literally, we're both tired. There aren't too many questions we feel like talking about. <laughs> what can we do? And it ended up being a lot of fun for us, and the listeners loved it. We did it again. They loved it. So now we're going to, I guess, do it here on The Experience today to give everyone an idea of what we've been doing on the drive through Totally blind. Completely uh, no preparation whatsoever. No, no uh, collusion between you and I. No. None. You're going to read a lineup from one of your programs, and I'm going to. Uh, we started out, I think, on the first one, said guess the town, but that's almost impossible since you got spot show programs from everywhere. So we're 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 going for guess the territory, and or part of the country, and the the year of the said lineup. With bonus points if you get the town. Okay, I can go along. And also, you have to try to figure out which match, as I'm reading them from the opening match up, that I think would be the giveaway that you would get the show right away. Okay. Okay, I have the first one here. I'm going to open this up. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get some note paper here so that I can... Oh, you've never taken notes during this. What's this? I'm going to write a couple of the matches down since you're giving me all these fucking stipulations now. Sounds like an AEW match. You got to get the territory and the year and which match gave it away and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, this one right here. My fucking chair. <laughs> God damn it. All right. Ah! I'm going to throw this thing out the window. This show here, the opening match, Rick McCord versus Mad Max. The second match, the PYT versus Mike Graham and Angelo Mosca Jr. Oof. Pistol Pez Watley versus King Cobra. Jesse Barr versus Brian Mr. B. Blair. And the main event, Crusher Khrushchev and Jim Neidhart. Versus Sweet Brown Sugar and Dutch Mantel. Well, second match gave it away. The PYTs against Graham and Mosca Jr. We're in Florida. Are we not? We are indeed in Florida. Okay. A spot and show in Ocala, to be precise. Ocala, home of Dory Funk Jr. Exit 352, I believe, on... I-95 down there. Uh, not 95, but uh, yeah, but 75. Um, and the year... I'm going to say... God damn it. It's either 1986 or 1987, but it could go either way, I think. Wow. I am surprised you got this completely wrong. What? 1984. What? Khrushchev and Neidhart as a tag team? Well, wait a minute. That would have been because Khrushchev wasn't Khrushchev. And Ni Khrushchev and Neidhart were both in Mid-South in 84. December 1984. Oh, they left when we left. No, well, Neidhart left at the beginning of the year, went to Memphis. Khrushchev was there at least through the summer, I believe. Okay, well, then I fucked it completely up because I was thinking, <laughs> well, and then I guess if I'd have fucking given any thought, Neidhart would have been in the WWF by 87 anyway, but I was trying to think, did, did Khrushchev, after the 86 run and he had tore his knee up, did they send him to Florida 
uh, when they bought oh. the thing is oh. that's where I was going with that. So I didn't, I, instead of, I thought it was after, but it was instead before. So never mind. I did screw that up. I you got know, the territory. I was three years off on the year, two or two and three years off. For the record, and I might be wrong, I don't believe they owned Florida yet when Khrushchev got hurt and went to the WWF to become Smash after Randy Cully was originally the Smash, and then they decided right. that everyone knew that it was a moondog. We can't do this. So I think, I'm not sure if he went to Florida then, but we could find That's, out. It, well, I, you know, he probably didn't. But it was, uh, I was there at Atlanta TV when he blew his, he was doing a clothesline off the top rope and landed on his leg and blew his entire, fuck, I think it was his, was it his right knee or his left knee? It wasn't his wee knee, but it, he had the same knee doctor that I did for my Starcade knee. And, and he said, Darso's just looked like a hand grenade went off in it. The uh, cartilage, the ACL, the whole nine yards. That's what he was off for. He Well, he was off from, that was early part of 86 into way into 87, I guess. Anyway, all right, I botched that one up. What's next? Here's the next one, the opening match. Mario LaPaterno versus Nick Bockwinkle. Uh, it's, uh, say that again three times fast. Frank Townsend versus Wilbur Snyder. Guy Brunetti versus Dick the Bruiser, a special added attraction. Ricky Starr versus Art Mahalik. Louis Martinez versus Waldo Von Erich. A spectacular <laughs> midget tag team match, two out of three falls. <laughs> Sky Lolo and Billy the Kid versus Little Beaver and Tiny Tim. And the main event, two out of three falls. For a championship I won't name, just in case it's a giveaway. Right. Pepper Gomez versus Kinji Shibuya. Okay, we're on the West Coast. At one point, I thought we were going to be in the Midwest. That's what I thought would happen. Uh, but, and, and at first I thought West Coast when I heard Bockwinkle and Snyder in the first two matches. Then... Brunetti and Bruiser, Art Mahalik, I was thinking we were going back to the Midwest, and the midgets could be anywhere, but it would have been more likely they'd have been in the Midwest. But then when we go with Pepper Gomez and Kenji Shibuya, that seems to take us back to California, doesn't it? It certainly does, and I actually thought that you would get thrown off by Louis Martinez versus Waldo Von Erich. Well, then that sounded something like a fucking buffalo yeah uh, territory or cleveland match, but, yeah or cleveland but now having said that the year of that would be in the late 50s if i am scoping this out correctly because i can't see all those people being in the same place well, maybe 60, 61. Uh, well, God damn it. Now that I've talked myself into that, is it 1961, My the year of my birth? San Francisco, California, the Cow Palace, September 8th, 1962. Oh! That's a tough one, though. That's a really <sighs> tough one. That's a tough one. But yeah, and 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 by the way, I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't say San Francisco because Gomez and Shibuya pretty well led me in that direction. But anyway, not bad, not bad. A year off. Let's go a little back for this one. This is a tough one, but this is an interesting one. The first bout: Brother Frank versus Robert Butch Madre, judo style. <laughs> the second bout: Brother Jonathan. Versus Rarney Bummy Rogers. A special added attraction, Jules Strongbow versus The Blimp, 640 pounds. Mart Martin Levy. That's right. Or Levy, but yes. Levy. Tag team match, Danny Dusick and Jack Claiborne versus George Lenahan and Hank Matheny. Wait, wait a minute. Hank Matheny, where did he become a referee? What territory in the 60s and, and thereabouts? I'm not sure. I'm not All sure. right. Anyway, 
there'll be a pot of gold drawing at intermission. <laughs> and then the main event, I believe, yeah, it is for the World's Heavyweight Championship. The champion, Babe Sharky versus Dave Levin. Okay. We are in the 40s. We are on the West Coast, I believe. By the way, uh, Jack Claiborne was an African-American, was he not? He was. He was, and which Dusick was with him? Danny Dusick. Danny. The who bullshit Dusick. He was a gimmick Dusick. <laughs> Sid Neighbors. He was a gimmick Dusick. Um, Danny Dusick ended up being a fixture uh, at the studio TVs of Nick Goulas and Roy Welch in, I think it was Birmingham and maybe some in Nashville uh, in the 60s and 70s. And he was a, a, a um, promotional representative. Guy, well, it's, it, I mean, they'd have him doing everything from ringing the bell to, well, we can Danny Dusick go get Nick Goulas on the phone, whatever. Um. Anyway, uh, geez, geez, Strongbow and the, I got to think, I'm trying to remember when Levin had the world title claim. Well, remember, Babe Sharky has the claim here, oh, which, but, which is oh, another whole interesting story that one day we should probably talk about. So, God damn it, 1947, um... Are we in Los Angeles or the environs of Southern California? Well, since you guessed that, I will say this is Los Angeles, California, the Olympic Auditorium. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say is somewhere between 45, 46, 47. Again, it's another tough one, but you got it. I'm going to say you got it at least. August 8th, 1945. Ooh, okay. And by the way... The match between Babe Sharkey and Dave Levin, the former champion, the winner gets the blimp. <laughs> the Goodyear blimp, or they get the blimp faces the winner of that match. Okay, so the basically the blimp gets the winner, not the so. winner of the world title gets the blimp. I see it that way. The blimp is the main attraction here. <laughs> well, looking you at this can program, see it any way you want. But he was just the main attraction because his pictures were most impressive. This next one's interesting. I'm going to read it as it's in the program, although one of the names, clearly not the main, the real one, but Ray Gordon versus Johnny Zenda, Tony Manos versus Gorgeous George, Danny Hodge versus Bob Orton, and the main event for a tag team title, the Assassins versus Chris Tolis and Jack Briscoe, two out of three falls. Okay, well, obviously that's not the real Gorgeous George. That was probably Gorgeous George Grant. It looks like, based on the picture, it actually may be Gorgeous George Jr. Uh, Ooh. Based on this picture here. Okay, well, that makes sense because we're in the environs of the Leroy McGurk territory. Um, Whether that be Missouri or Arkansas or Oklahoma, Given the uh, time period, is it going to be 19? And by the way, there Bob Orton was just Bob Orton because there was no junior at that point. Um, uh, 1966, McGurk Territory. You going to guess the town? Uh, well, that's not a big card. I don't think that would do. Tulsa or Oak City or Little Rock any justice. Springfield, Missouri, perhaps? November 21st, 1966. Oh! A Monday. A day like any other day. The Tulsa Assembly Center. Tulsa. So at what? Tulsa, three matches with a uh, gimmick Gorgeous George and a job guy as the opener. Well, four matches. It's a simpler time. Four matches and two out of three falls for the main event. Okay, was there four? That's, that's right. There was two nobodies in the... Okay. That's right. I'm looking through here. McGurk's Matt Chat. Some news and results and advertisements from around the territory. This one could be tricky or maybe an easy giveaway. First event, Paul Pershman versus Scott Casey. 
Grand Marcus versus Jim Drummer. Bobby Garcia versus Ken Patera. The semifinal. Red Bastine and Tex McKenzie versus superstar Billy Graham and Mr. Kung Fu. And the main event for the World's Heavyweight Championship. Jack Briscoe versus Black Jack Mulligan. We are in Texas. Woo. That has to be, well, it's got to be either 1973, 74, 75, or else why is it, Briscoe wouldn't have right. the world title. Right, that's a giveaway. Um, And I got to think that it would be Jim Drummer would be Count Drummer? Is that same I guy? think so. That's why I giggled. I thought that okay. has to be the same guy. From London? Yeah, Paul Pershman would later become Playboy Buddy Rose. And didn't he have Kevin Von Erich's first match, I believe, while he was I in think Texas? So. Yeah. So basically we're we're in uh we're in the Dallas territory and we're in nineteen seventy three. I'm just gonna put it the earliest year it could be. Because Paul Pershman is still Paul Pershman. August 20th, 1974. Shit! What town? Dallas, Texas, Sportatorium. Dallas. Okay. I didn't know it was Sportatorium, Fort Worth, whatever the case. Uh, This one you will not get. This one you will not get. Let me go to this one. Oh, well, you fucking just slough me off like I'm some rank amateur. Okay, hold on. I thought you would not get this one. Because I wouldn't get this one, I don't think. Okay. But you may. On the cover, just for the record... Famed gypsy wrestler here next week with a picture of Gypsy Joe and his wife. Here's the card. Alex Toro Perez. Perez, I never said it that way. Alex Perez. Alex, Alex Toro Perez. 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 <laughs> versus Juan Garcia. Pretty Boy Collins versus Silent Rodriguez. Of course, that's Salento. Silent. It only says Silent here. but Oh, okay. Of course. Ray Gordon versus Yaki Bravo. And the main event. Bulldog Pletchus versus Jesus Ortega, Jess Ortega. The Bull. The Bull from Spain. Um, Bulldog Danny Pleaches. Pleaches, excuse me. Pleaches and... Uh, da, da, da. And the Lady Angel is here next week. That's going... The year I'm going to take a wild stab... Alex Perez is still wrestling. Slinto Rodriguez is silent Rodriguez. I'm going to take a stab at the year as being 1966, that golden year. And I'm going to say that that is a spot show somewhere in the southwestern United States. In a sense, you're almost right, but you're completely wrong. Okay. <laughs> February 20th, 1960. Oh, a Saturday, off. the Civic Auditorium, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. Now, that's not a spot show because that technically was Mike London's town. I didn't say it had to be a big drawing spot show. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so I knew where it was. I was way off on the year. All right. <clears throat> I didn't know Salento Rodriguez was that old. Here is, but I but I should have figured with Danny Pleach is still wrestling, it had to be earlier. This will be our final one this week. I think All this, right. this one will be easy. I'm giving you a layup to end with. Oh, okay. Now you say that ahead of time instead of building up like Jim, you're never gonna get this one to make me look good at the end. That's right. I can, give you a, worker you I can give you a Jim you'll never get this one to end with. I didn't think that was the way to go no, out. Oh no, I wanted to build up like Jim, you'll never get this, and then give me the easy one so I look good. No, this is too easy. People would know. People would know right. it was a setup. Well, we can't impugn your integrity. The opening match, Prince Pullins versus Buddy Smith. The second match, Pepper Gomez versus Luke Graham. The third match, Mr. Clean versus Blackjack Lanza. The fourth match, Butcher Vashon versus Wilbur Snyder. A tag team elimination match, Red Lions and Red Bastine versus the new chain gang, Jack and Jim Dillinger. And the main event, Vern Gagne versus Baron Von Raschke. I'm not naming any titles that are here because it would be a giveaway. Right. 
Okay, well, we are in the AWA territory. Um, and I'm going to say, since that was the, that's the new chain gang, what year was it that the, uh, the old chain gang member got shot in the leg? <laughs> um, 19, it, it's Baron Von Raschke, and he didn't start there until his run in Montreal, Mad Dog Vashon wanted to name him Baron Von Pumpkin. Uh, I sound like I'm working this out on on who wants to be a millionaire. No, this is good. This is what I want to hear. This is what everyone wants to hear. Uh, Luke Graham is an oddity. Second match on, against Pepper Gomez. On that card, because he would not normally be in the Midwest talent roster pool. The Redheads... Uh, top babyface team, Lions and Bastine. I have got to go with either 1970 or 1971 in the AWA, and chances are it was somewhere in either, uh, it, would it be in, in, in St. Paul? Would it be in Minneapolis at the auditorium or somewhere in the state of Minnesota? Surprised you didn't get this. Ah, January 20th, 1970. I said 1970 or 71. The International Amphitheater. Chicago. Chicago, Illinois, promoter Bob Luce. Son of a bitch. Well, I, th I, I thought the chain thought gang was going to be the giveaway, to be honest. Well, I thought they worked for Vern also. The whole territory. I was thinking since... Because I didn't remember them using Von Raschke on top in Chicago and in, in Indianapolis in that area until a little bit later on than that. Well, I have the uh, program. We'll end with this. Wrestling Life, Volume 14, Number 1. Hate ape! <laughs> Destructive! <laughs> crippling! Inhuman! Who can stop the beast of Berlin? And as an arrow pointing to Baron Von Raschke. Baron Von Raschke, the new king of killer breed! Brutally shocking facts. It's all true. No one can predict how far this German will go. <laughs> it's so scandalous. Fact number one, the violent temper that takes hold of him in the heat of battle, turning him into a wild beast, indicates he may be psychopathic. Fact number two, certain experts say Raschke may be a former East German Olympic champion wrestler, explaining his great wrestling ability Fact three, doctors say his claw hold could be fatal. <laughs> Bob Luce, ladies and gentlemen. Dick the Bruiser says he must be beat. These programs are great. And then here's the new chain gang with Chris Colt and the chain gang on the back. They, uh, um, they did a story on Bob Luce in one of the Midwest, I think it was Chicago newspapers that I saw somebody had tweeted a clipping of a, a while back and and he's talking to the sports writer, and they're at the sirloin room. They're at the International Amphitheater, the 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 uh, the big steakhouse, right? And that's where all the you know guys like Bruiser and Crusher and those guys they'd have the cigar and be wearing a suit after the matches, going to eat steak. But Bob Luce, they said, even though he was the promoter, he wouldn't go to the matches. He would hang out next door at the sirloin room and fucking have cocktails and whatever the fuck and eat a steak. And he's watching all the girls hanging out at the bar and he tells the sports writer, he says, yeah, you see that girl? Yeah. She's a big fan of all the guys. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're involved in all those or <laughs> orgies. The orgies. We can go right to questions and we have a lot of them and there's a lot of things happening in wrestling that people want to hear what you want to say about. Did that make any sense? I don't know. <laughs> However, I will move on and I will continue with what I was saying. And I will say that the other option is if you wanted to, we could play a little guest the program. I don't know if you think we've done it too much because we did it on both shows last week. I'm having think? a ball doing it. So you want to do it. So I think we should do a little bit more of it. This first one here, I just got, I want to thank the person in a moment, but first let me go to the card. See if you can guess this. The opening match. Enrique Torres versus Mike Pedusas. The second match, Billy Two Rivers versus Rocco Perez. Oof. 
The third match, tag team match, as it says here, four colored girls, Ethel Johnson and Betty White versus Bab Swingo. No, and- it's Babs Wingo. They put an extra S in. Oh, it says Babs Swingo. Yeah, it's Babs Wingo. They, she was sisters <laughs> with Ethel Johnson. And Marva Scott. And Marva Scott. The next match, another tag team match, George Becker, who seems to always be on these shows, <laughs> and Mike Clancy versus Al and John Smith. Two more matches. Paul Anderson versus Hans Schnabel. And the main Schnabel, event, Schnabel, Schnabel, the main event, the great Bolo versus Larry Crusher Hamilton. We are in the mid fifties. And it almost seems like we would have to be in the Carolinas or somewhere on the East Coast. And God damn. Um, I'm just going to go with uh, 1953 in either the state of North Carolina or Virginia. The date, January 26th, 1959. Oh! The Charlotte Coliseum. Okay. Promoter Jim Crockett. And I want to give a special thanks to a friend of mine who I owe a phone call to, Frank the Collector. Oh, who notified me about this, and I immediately swooped in and purchased it. It's a series of three programs from 59. This one is autographed by George Becker, Ethel Johnson, Big Bill Ward, uh, Enrique Torres, The Smiths. Yeah, Paul Anderson. Alan Al John Smith, they were bearded. They had the gimmick from The Smith Brothers Cough Drops. Um, the reason why I got the year all wrong is I would... <laughs> I would have sworn that the girls tag match would have been earlier. That's what threw me off to the early fifties because I didn't know they were still working in that combination that late. Well, speaking of earlier, let's go a bit earlier with this next one on the cover of the program coming back next week, jumping Joe Savaldi. How can we miss you? If you won't go away, the card, the first bout K bell versus George Becker again, Uh, K. Bell is filling in for General O'Brien, who was not there. The second bout, and now I never know how to pronounce this guy's name. Hopefully you do. King Kong Cashy? Yeah, Abe King Kong Cashy. Cashy, who's, there's so much stuff of him floating around. Versus Paul Bosch, who is filling in for Sergeant Johnny O'Brien, who also no-showed. Two O'Briens no-showed. Then, Big Ben Morgan who's filling in for Kila Shikuma from Japan, who I'm not familiar with, versus Tom Zaharias. Two final matches. Semi-final. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Tom. Tom. There was there was George and there was Chris. I don't remember Tom. This is Tom Zaharias. Tom Zaharias. <laughs> the semifinal, two out it's, of three it's, falls. Of course, it's like George Liberace. Two out of three falls. Ivan Rasputin versus Sandar Zabo. And the main event, Bronco Nagurski versus Public Enemy. (laughs) Who it says here in the handwriting, because all the results and times are marked in here, it says Frank Cutler changes name every so often. (laughs) So that's Public (laughs) Enemy, apparently. My God, this... uh... This is definitely during the World War II years. Would that be? I'm. I'm, I'm I'll give you a no. heads up. No, this is not no. during the World War II years. It is immediately afterwards. No, that's wrong too. What? It's not before World War II. It is indeed before World. It War II. It is indeed before World War II. Son of a bitch, is it in the Northeast? It is not. Okay. Now, why did you think Northeast? Was it Bosch? 
Well, I was thinking Bosch because Becker also worked. George Becker worked the Carolinas. He was the top baby face and later on the Booker for 30 years from the 40s through the 70s. But he worked a lot in New York at that time. As his, his, hearing Bosch, knew he worked there. Nagurski could have been anywhere because he was a big name. Sandor Zabo was a big name as well. The rest, you know, uh, goddamn, okay. If it, then, then fuck it. I'm going to stay out of the Northeast, <laughs> and I'm going to say that this was in 1939, and this was in <sighs> California or Texas. The date? Wednesday, May 25th, 1938. Ooh. Portland Auditorium. Son of a gun. Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. All right. I bombed on that one completely. Joseph, and the girls are coming. Joseph Aldi on the front cover of the back says, the girls are coming. The girls are coming. For more than two years, we have been trying to get the Portland Boxing Commission and the City Commission to place an okay on a championship wrestling bout between Clara Mortensen World Lady Wrestle, excuse me, World Lady Champion, and one of the three contenders for the title available at Hollywood. But it's always been thumbs down. Once we had a petition with 2,200 names on it asking that girls be allowed to wrestle in Portland, but no go. However, Portland Matt fans are finally going to get a chance to see this fine girl athlete, Miss Mortensen, in action. Her Portland date is June 8th, and the bout will positively be held, and it won't be a private exhibition either. <laughs> the location of the bout, the time, and the contestants will be announced within the next 10 days. And now this is all in caps. But I'll guarantee one thing. The girls will appear here. <laughs> and apparently, listen to this, Clara Mortensen drew 8,000 fans in Seattle the last time she wrestled there. She yeah. drew 7,000 fans in Vancouver, in Los Angeles. She sold out the Hollywood Stadium and the Olympic Auditorium. And at San Francisco, she drew 10,000 people. Her hometown is Portland. And then it goes on a little bit about her. But she there was it is. the world women's champion uh, directly before Mildred Burke. And it was a spotty uh, situation where, I mean, she wasn't being booked on a regular basis all over the country because it was still on a case where she could actually legally appear, et cetera. But the answer to the trivia question, was there a famous girl wrestler before Mildred Burke? The answer is yes, Clara Mortensen. All right, Jim, this next one could be a little tricky or you could get it right away. Oh, boy. The opening match, Joe Scarpa versus Evan Marion. The second match, Pedro Godoy versus Judo Jack Terry. The third bout, Eduardo and Louis Martinez versus Tojo Yamamoto and Taro Miyaki. Taro Miyaki. And finally, the main event, two out of three falls, one hour time limit. Kurt and Carl Von Brauner versus Haystacks Calhoun and Dickie Steinborn. Uh, we are in the Goulas territory, aren't we? Or are we in Georgia? No and no. No? God damn it. And All no. right. Then could we be in Florida? Yes. I was actually about to say technically Goulas did have a different territory at one point or an expanded territory, and it was Florida. This would have been... In the era of 1961 through 5, I bet you. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say Tampa 1962. The date? Friday, January 19th, 1962. Oh! Miami Beach. Ah! All right. 200 miles off. 200 miles off. This next one is really tricky, I think, but you may get it right away. You keep saying that. Now, this one, well, listen to this card. The opening bout, 
Mario Galento versus Ivan Robert. The second event, the great Malenko and John Smith versus Tom Drake and Don Fields. The main event, one hour time limit, Billy Wicks versus Sputnik Monroe. Well, see, now you throw me off because I was about to say Birmingham. But now I want to bring it back to Memphis. You you dastardly uh dastardly villain, but that's not a Memphis card. Maybe, maybe not. What? I did, I did say it could be a bit tricky. I didn't think this would be just an obvious I'm not gonna just give you an yeah. obvious one like that. Yeah. It's not Memphis, but one would think because Billy Wicks and Sputnik Monroe is the main event, it would be. That's the trick. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm going to say 1959 or 1960. Mobile, Alabama. Son of a bitch. Lad Stadium, Wednesday, July 9th, 1958. Okay. So a, right. year, a year before everything in Memphis. Sputnik was in Alabama the year before he was in Memphis. So very so I got I got the state didn't get the city and I was a year off on the year. That's right. That is good. one more. One more. Let me, Let me uh, one more chance. Let me see if this one has uh, a lineup in it. This program. Okay. The opening match: Jim Grabmeyer versus Carl Campbell. The second match: Johnny Berend versus Ali Pasha. The third match: Oscar Verdu, of course, Crusher Verdu versus Bearcat Wright, and the main event, the Iron Russians versus <laughs> Nature Boy Rogers and Sweet Daddy Seeky, two falls to win. Uh, we're in... <laughs> the year is going to be 1961? 60, 61. I'm 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 not taking my finger off the checker yet. Uh and ah, it's going to be in the Great Lakes region. Let me just say I don't have now that I look an exact date other than the month and the year. I don't have the actual date. Okay, well I'm not gonna get fucking March thirty first yeah. or whatever, but um Let's go with with uh let's go with 1961 uh in uh, western New York state. August 1959. <sighs> Bobby Davis presents All-Star Wrestling the Fairgrounds Coliseum Marion, Ohio. Son of a bitch. Okay, when Bobby Davis got the opportunity to be a promoter around the Columbus area and, and, and the state of Ohio, and Rogers was helping him. And that explains Johnny Barrand, and that explains Rogers and Seeky, and Bearcat Wright was just around at the time, but it was a spot show, which is why there's only four matches, and who are the Iron Russians? I'm going to look through the program here. There's a couple masked figures on the back. Here's Bearcat Wright. Here is, that's a disturbing photo. I don't know who this is. <laughs> this must be that's Ali Pasha. Uh, I do not see anything. Don Lewin has returned to our area after a long absence, as also Johnny Moran. That's a weird way of putting it. Uh, next Saturday, August 15th, is the biggest wrestling show at the Fairgrounds Coliseum in Marion, Ohio. Nature Boy Rogers. Yeah, that's building up this one actually right here. This is an issue of Buckeye News. Buckeye Matt News. And that's guess and, the You program. know, Bobby Fulton is from right down the road in, in uh, Chillicothe, Ohio. And it's a Buckeye state. The Ohio thing is the Buckeyes, right? And Bobby Fulton, when I had a issue a couple of years ago with hemorrhoids, Bobby Fulton said, now this will work, Jimmy. He gave me a Buckeye. And he said, this will take care of your hemorrhoids. I said, you mean I have to shove that thing up my ass? And he said, no, you just carry it in your bag, and it's like a lucky charm. And and son of a gun, I've had no more issues since I got that lucky Buckeye. Once I 
figured out how to get it out of my ass before I talked to Bobby, it, you know, but after that, I've had no more issues. Jim, are you interested in playing some guests the program? Oh, sure. We haven't done that in a while. We have not. And we have some interesting ones here. Of course, these are all from I know my... You, you ambush me with this. These are all I from... Haven't done any preparation. No, you didn't even know I was going to do this. And these all come from my personal collection. So you're unaware of what I'm going to hit you with. Completely unaware. They've been sitting in a mayonnaise jar on Funk and Wagnall's porch since noon today. All right, Jim, here's this card. And you have to guess the town and if possible, the year. Uh, you know what? Guess the general vicinity for this one, okay? All right. The opening match, Bulldozer versus Tim McNeeny. The second match, Mad Dog Richard versus the Russian Mauler. That'd be Richard Charland. The third match, Tony Roy versus Terra Rising. And the main event, Superfly Jimmy Snooker versus the Iron Horseman Perry Saturn. Well, it the obvious answer would be it's in the state of Massachusetts, but po possibly because you would think that I would say that, it's actually in New Hampshire. And the year would be 1993 or 4. It is indeed 1993. Good job, Killer Kowalski's All-Star Wrestling presented by the Gardner International Brotherhood of Police Officers at the Municipal Skating Rink. It actually doesn't clarify if it's Massachusetts or New Hampshire. What, what is the town? Gardner. That's not uh, just Vince's Italian gardeners. No, it's what not. Are the, what are their names? The Freschetti brothers? I can never remember. Anyway, um, it's probably Massachusetts. It might be New Hampshire. And here's a picture of a young terror rising... Photo by Don Leibel wearing a championship belt in this program. And here's Tony Roy, but let's close this program. And, and he went on to become the son-in-law of the richest promoter in the world. That's Donnie right. Leibel, that's right. He came <laughs> went on to, no, <laughs> we love Donnie Leibel, but it was Triple H, Terror Rising. Okay, this next card, Jim. This is a bit of a tough one, but let's see if you get it. Let's see if anything tips you off. The opening bout, Jessica Rogers and Tina Myers versus Betty Garcia and Corinne Cordero. Oh, well, instantly I know where the... All right. The semifinal, 45 minutes, two out of three falls. Dick Beyer versus Tor Yamada. And the main bout, one hour, two out of three falls. The Mask Red Terror versus Wild Bill Longson. Whoa! Um... A little bit of a monkey wrench there, Bill Longson. A little bit of a monkey wrench. We're in Texas. Texas, I'm going to say. And, or, or not, now that I think about it. We're either in Texas or in upstate New York in the late 1950s, possibly 57 or 58. It is April 29th, 1958. Boom! Louisville, Kentucky. What? Louisville, Kentucky. Oh my God, you cocksucker. You threw in a ringer on me. <laughs> Boy, no wonder Louisville wasn't drawn in 1958. That would have been under the... Um, we Willie Davis. Yes, I was about to say the Goldenrod Athletic Club. We Willie Davis, because the Allen Athletic Club had folded in 1957 after the retirement of Francis McDonough, who took over from Haywood Allen, and Louisville went into a couple of year dark period where Wee Willie Davis was working at the Sheriff's Department here and was trying to be the local promoter for the Indianapolis office, and they were sending him cards like that. Um, and then finally Barnett took over and and started sending us some stars again. And we they called it the Goldenrod Athletic Club because Wee Willie Davis was on the $64,000 question in the 50s because he was an expert on exotic flowers. I have another program here in my hand, but I'm having a difficult time finding an exact year or place here. Okay, well, in, it's a fascinating if you can't card. Find it, you've got it here in front of you, then how am I going to do that? Well, here's the card. I mean, it's such a bootleg program. This is like a bootleg program from, I would guess, does it have anything on here? I would guess 71 or 72. Uh, it could be 73, and there's nothing here with 
but it's an interesting historical piece. Here's the card. The undefeated 278-pound Crusher Derek versus John Guzardo, Len Guzardo, and Don Reese in a special handicap match. A one-fall midget match, 30-minute time limit. A big midget match. The mighty Little John from Kentucky versus Little Tojo from Japan. Wild Man Alexi from Greece versus world champion Paul Christie Whoa. from Evergreen Park. And it's, the, it's Illinois. The main event, two out of three falls, 60-minute time limit. The graduate Angelo Pafo and Dr. Thunderbolt Williams versus the White Knight and the Masked Avenger. And on the cover here is warning the Von Brauners are coming into the Midwest story and pictures inside. Everything is handwritten in this program. <laughs> so this is almost, I mean, we could just talk about it instead of trying to guess because we don't know. It's like a pre-ICW ICW here. Paul Christie and Angelo Poffo and yes. Saul Weindroff yeah. running opposition. That, as a matter of fact, that's they would join up with Phil Golden shortly because if they're billboarding the Von Brauners coming to the Midwest, that's sometime in the later part of 1972. Phil Golden was just starting to line those towns up from southern Illinois all the way over to West Virginia along the I-64 corridor. Angelo Poffo was going to buy into that. Paul Christie was going to become uh, the babyface world champion for Phil Golden's All-Star Wrestling, and the Von Brauners and Saul are going to come in. Saul's going to be the booker, and he talked the Von Brauners into going in there for some semblance of a guarantee because they were mad at Jerry Jarrett and the Nashville office where they the Von Brauners and Saul had been working there up until sometime in 72. So that is an early outlaw show that Angelo was running somewhere in Southern Illinois, probably uh, before all of that took place. Again, it goes into my overall interest in how Angelo Poffo went from being a significant player in Chicago wrestling to working nothing but outlaw shows throughout the seventies. He always wanted to be the owner or one of the owners. He always wanted to be the promoter because that's where you made the most money. And Angelo's he his gimmick in ICW was the miser, and that was a rib. It was an inside joke because Angelo Poffo was known as being the tightest human being that ever walked the earth. And to the point where Rip Rogers told me one time that Angelo Poffo didn't believe in washing his clothes more than once or twice a week because when you put them in the washer with the detergent, it breaks the fabric down and wears them out. You got to replace them quicker. I mean, this is somebody who would go to any lengths to, and that's why for a while they were able to compete because Angelo had the money to buy their own cameras and editing equipment and stuff in ICW. Um, you know, it, they were able to be somewhat self-sufficient so that that's why they were able to last so much longer than almost any other outlaw group because he, he took, he he was kind of very Danny Davis-ish because Danny was a a tight son of a bitch when running a business. He would splurge on things for himself or, you know, charity or whatever the fuck. But he could make a... I saw him make a $4 profit on a $102 gate one time at a show. It's just, you know, so... But self-sufficiency, owning everything and getting the most out of everything. That's what Angelo's deal was it. At that point, nobody was wanting to book him as a wrestler. He'd already, he was in his late forties and in the early seventies, but he felt like he could own a piece of something and establish himself as a promoter. And that's where you made the money in wrestling back then, at least. Our next card, Jim, the opening match, Crusher Carlson versus the champ. The second match, Pedro Godoy versus Bobby Starr. The third match, potential giveaway here, Kubla Khan and Jesse James versus John Caruso and Wayne Cowan, Oki Shakina <laughs> versus The Avenger, Bill Bowman and Joe Turner versus Tommy Siegler and Ted Oates, Guillotine Gordon 
versus Dick Steinborn, Buddy Roberts and Jerry Brown, of course, the Hollywood Blondes, versus Ray Candy and Bearcat Wilkerson, Ox Baker versus El Mongol, no Jesus disqualification. Jesus this, this, this show will sell out the Omni. No disqualification, almost. And the main event, The Assassin versus Rock Hunter. And that would be Ann Gunkel presents uh, a, a card from 1970. Ooh, would it be two or three? I'll say three. Very good. It is from the City Auditorium in Atlanta, Tuesday, January 23rd, 1973. So Boom. two there months you. after the wrestling war started. And and by the way, and I was joking about the Omni because I know that they had, nobody was running the Omni at that point yet, but uh, the city auditorium was still open. But yes, that was the the lovely Ann Gunkles All South Wrestling. Joe uh, Joe Turner and Bill Bowman also wrestled for years at a cowboy team gimmick as Joe and Bill Sky, and Joe Turner was Dennis Condry's brother-in-law that broke him into wrestling in the Carolinas when they needed a, a guy to do Roop's shoot challenge and then uh dennis got a chance to start refereeing and turner trained him somewhat and then joe turner and dennis went to where was it first i think it might have been no they went to mid-south and were mephisto and dante under the mass actually not mid-south it wasn't mid-south then but louisiana leroy mcgurk uh they got the shit end of the territory and were mephisto and dante and then uh they both got booked and Dennis stayed for a while in Montgomery, Alabama in 74 before he came up to the full-time Tennessee territory. Uh, who else was on the card? Uh, Oki Shakina. Wayne Cowan. Well, I'm, I'm not there yet. Oki Shakina was the guy who got stabbed in Columbus, Georgia. He's coming back from the ring, and some guy took a knife and... As he, as Shakina's walking down the aisleway, they told me this while I was in the, the first time I worked this building, by the way. So it made me feel great. He's walking down the aisleway. The cops are around him, but one of the fans came out from the ringside seat and stuck a knife in his side and walked halfway around him and then fucking took off the other way. And they, the, uh, they honestly said people that were there said the cops had said, well, he's fucked. And his wife was there and begged them to call an ambulance that he could be saved, and and they did, and he was. Um, and Wayne Cowan was uh, a rookie at that point. He'd started the year before and was wrestling under his alleged real name. That's not the way you spell his real name, but it was easier to pronounce that way. And he would not become the Dutch Mantel that we all know and love today for about another year because he was, he also, after uh, he wrestled as Wayne Cowan himself, he also wrestled as Dutch Bass when he was partners with uh, Donnie Bass and was managed by Ma Bass briefly and was also Chris Gallagher for his first time in the Tennessee Territory when he was partners with Don Kent and managed by Sir Steve Clements. Should I go on? You could, but I'm going to go on and ask you about a couple more programs before we wrap up this segment. This is the tough one. This is the one I guarantee you won't get. Should I ask you or should we just move on? Well, now it's a goddamn challenge. It is. So give it to me. Aldo Bogney oh. versus Roy McClarty. Roy McClarty? Roy McClarty? Uh, it's not spelled that way, which is throwing me off. Roy McClarty. The semi-main event. How, wait a minute. How's it spelled? M-C-C-L-A-R-T-Y? Yeah, that's it. McClarity. McClarity, excuse me. Semi-main event, Australian tag team bout, Tiny Mills and Stan Kowalski versus Thor Hagen and Frank Townsend. And the main event, excuse me, the main event was the first match I read. The opening match, Joe Pazandak versus Lou Whitson. Well, uh, I would say Minnesota straight off the bat, except it could be you're throwing me off with some kind of Wisconsin or maybe some kind of Midwestern spot show because you said I was never going to get it. Um, 
Tiny Mills and Stan Kowalski were the team of Murder Incorporated uh, for the Midwest, and, and that was before, oh, was it before or right as the AWA was actually being formed? Wally Carbo may have had something to do with this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Minnesota or the environs, and the year would have been between 1959 and 1961. Pretty good, I think. Wednesday, January 20th, 1960, the Fargo Athletic Club, Fargo, North Dakota. This is the program for the first official event held in the new Civic Memorial Auditorium for All-Star Wrestling. And that would be a, an AWA event. So for those of you not familiar with AWA geography at that point, I was right. It's some far-flung spot show out of the Minneapolis office. That's right. Boom. Jim, this next one, the opening match, Bull Ramos versus Skip Young. The second event, Gene Lewis versus Jimmy Snuka. The third event, Big John Studd versus Gino Hernandez. The fourth event, Al Madrill versus Siegfried Stanky. Special event, Ox Baker versus Tommy Siegler. And a main event of Harley Race versus David Von Erich. A coin flip well, could determine the order of the matches. And it usually did. Um, obviously, we are either in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex or the environs of the Dallas-Fort Worth booking office. Somewhere in Texas or possibly southern Oklahoma, the year would have been 1970. Wait a minute. Oh, God damn it. Race and, and David is a world title match. I uh, didn't list it there, but let me actually check on that for the program here. David Von Erich tackles world champ race. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say it's 77. Very good. Will Rogers, Monday, August 15th, 1977. Well, and it's not at Will Rogers, Texas. It's Will no, Rogers no, no. Coliseum, Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Our final one this week, the opening bout, I believe what, the way it's listed here, Jesse James versus Bob Roop. Second bout, a mixed tag team match. Midget Bob Adams and Miss Sherry Lee. Versus Cowboy Lane and Miss Tammy Jones. Cowboy Lang. It says Lane. I'm reading what it says here. I know well, who Cowboy the, Lang it, is, of course, the famous it, midget Unless wrestler. Frankie Lane was three feet six. I like the it's... properness of this. Miss Sherry Lee and Miss Tammy Jones. Yeah. For a tag team title, Apollo and Lothario versus Lewis and El Lobo. For a singles championship, Mr. Saito versus Matsuda. The intermission match. This match was too late for scheduling a bonus event. I've never seen that before. The Kentuckian versus Mr. Smith. What? That's what, hold on. Who is Mr. Smith? Who is Mr. Smith? Hold on. Let me the see. Grizzly Smith was the Kentuckian. Right. So who would the Kentuckian fight that would be Mr. Smith? Well, we aren't going to get any answers here. Apparently not. Um, El Gran Apollo and Jose Lothario uh, would have been teaming together. I didn't finish the card, by the way. Oh, oh, I, I thought that was it. Okay, go ahead. No, that was just the intermission match. Okay. Thunderbolt Patterson, I believe, and the Missouri Mauler versus Eddie Graham and Louis Tillette, and the main event for the World's Heavyweight Championship the champion Dory Funk Jr. versus Jack Briscoe. Well, already we're obviously in Florida. I was going to say Florida when I heard Saito and Matsuda and Apollo and Lothario. Um, if it, now the world champion Dory is defending against Briscoe. Correct. Okay, then we're between sixty nine and seventy three. Uh, Bob Roop was in the Florida territory. This is 70. Eddie Graham and Louis Tillette, 1971. August 10th, 1970. God damn it. You're very God close to it. But and close. We're, in, we're in Florida, and that sounds like a St. Petersburg. Orlando. 
Orlando. Okay. Orlando. A big town. All right. Well, that has been the latest installment of Guess the Program, America's favorite game show. Are you clapping or getting the dirt off your hands? I can't I'm, tell. I'm dusting my hands off now that I've pretty much knocked the shit out of all of your questioning there. Let's uh, move on to something we haven't done in a while, Jim. Guess the program. I'm going to hit you with some classic Uh-oh. wrestling programs, and you have to figure out when they're from and where they're from. That's right. That's the rules of this. We already know why you're doing this, because the questions suck. Doing this because it's something that we will have fun with, something the listeners will enjoy, <laughs> and something that hopefully will put you in a good mood. Let's go to this first one. I'm opening it corn, here. Corn beef doesn't do the job. Not unless it's not unless it's from, what's that? The deli in New York now. They closed it. Well, you used to like the then Carnegie Deli. I like deli. to go to the Carnegie. If it's corn beef from the Carnegie, that'll put me in a good mood. All right, tell me when and where this card is from, Jim. Okay, I'm I'm concentrating now. I'm even going to take notes. Preliminary matches. Don Fields versus Gene Corsica. Corsica Gene. I know, but it says here Gene Corsica, so I'm reading okay. it the way it has it here. Okay. Millie Stafford versus China Mira. Hmm. A 10-minute intermission where lucky numbers will be announced. And then we have two main events. Farmer Jones versus Anton Leone, two out of three falls. And also two out of three falls, a mixed tag team match. China Mira, Chris Tolis, and Don Fields versus Millie Stafford and the Corsica Brothers. Okay. <sighs> One would suspectify that because the Fields brothers were involved, it would be in Alabama. One would suspect that. But, and the Corsica brothers, it could be Tennessee or Alabama or potentially Chris Tolos is a wild card there, but I seem to remember that Chris Tolos would have worked down south in the late 50s, early 60s, Anton Leone was all over the place at various points. Of course, he was famous for setting up an independent or outlaw promotion in California in the 80s, but this is definitely, this is no more recent than 1965. I've I've still unless it was Louisiana close to Alabama or in one of the periods of time where one of the Fuller family or Welch family was in charge of the booking of Louisiana I'm still going to put this in Alabama and I'm going to say the period of time was between 1959 and 1963 the date Monday night, September 2nd, 1957. Shit! Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis! Son of a bitch! And an interesting note here on this program, on the back page, page four. TV wrestling starts September 7. Television wrestling returns to Memphis on Saturday night, September 7 on Channel 13. Promoters Mickey Barnes, Nick Goulis, and Roy Welch have planned matches each week for the enjoyment of you fans. There is no charge for admission. However, a limited number of seats make it necessary for you to secure your tickets in advance. (laughs) All you have to do is send a self-addressed stamped envelope to promoter Mickey Barnes in care of the Chiska? The Chiska Hotel? Spell it. C-H-I-S-C-A. Son of a bitch, I get it. They didn't last there long. The Chiska Hotel Memphis. You will receive your tickets by return mail with a date stamped as to what night they will be honored, but you will get your tickets. With this new live TV wrestling card, it enables fans to see wrestling two times a week, once for free. So send your orders in now, no cost to you, no obligation, and the TV card for Saturday, September 7th, Millie Stafford versus Kathy Branch and Les Welch Versus Pat Malone. 
Wow. In parentheses, black bat. Because he worked in Memphis instead of the green shadow. At one time, he was the black bat. Yeah. Uh, but by the way, Kathy Branch married Tom Renesto and was the um, Tom Branch. brother of yeah. Tom Branch, Tom Renesto Jr., and Speedy Talltree was his brother. Um, well, now I'm embarrassed. At, and the, uh, now we know the exact date of the restart of Memphis Television in 1957. And Roy had just picked the town up. Mickey Barnes was the local promoter. They'd used him in Kingsport and in other places. Um, and I, and, and the Corsica brothers make sense. And I just didn't identify that as a Memphis card because that was, I mean, at the spot show card. That's why it, Les Wolf's promotion wasn't doing well in the fifties. It was, you know, a tag team match and fucking a girls match out of that and a couple of singles. Uh, but I'm embarrassed. Okay. I've lost that one. For our next program, let me open this up to get the card. Standing by. Special event, Paul Jones versus Dick Davis Court. Ooh. Also in a jujitsu match, Jack Roller versus Kazuo Yashimi. And the main event, two out of three falls, Joe Malkowitz versus Ed Strangler Lewis. Jesus Christ. Uh, we are, we're in the late 30s, early 40s. Hold on, let me, because this is a long time ago. Let me see if there's any clue I can give you from this that wouldn't give anything away. Uh, fire notice. <laughs> fire, we just invented it? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you one clue. <laughs> Joe Stecker, former World's Wrestling Champion who retired voluntarily from the mat game following his defeat at the hands of champion Ed Strangle Lewis in St. Louis, February 20th, is ready to start a comeback that may regain him the title. But w without giving a city, what's the name of the arena this is being held in? That's going to give it all away, but I'll do it anyway. Well, you don't have to say the New York Madison Square Garden. I guess that's okay. Example. I'm not going to say it's the Los Angeles Olympic Auditorium. But it's a building known as the Olympic Auditorium. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> well, I just said, just, all right, you didn't have to be a smart aleck. If I said, well, I could have said the Olympic now that I think about it. I'm still working on the, I can't remember the year of, of Lewis and Stecker, but it's, we're in the late 30s, right? We would, no. Would be, no? We're in the Into late the 20s. 40s? We're in the late, in the late 20s. 20s. Okay. In that case, I'm going to say 28. Very good. December 19th, 1928, Lou Darrow, the promoter, Olympic Auditorium. Carnation Lou Darrow. Um, at first, when you mentioned Paul Jones, obviously that's not the Paul Jones from Crockett. That's the Paul Jones that was the Atlanta promoter and owned pretty much of the office for all those years. Um, and... It, <laughs> Obviously, Joe, Joe Malkowitz went on to become the promoter in San Francisco uh, years later, but Los Angeles, 1928. I wouldn't have got, I would have, I would have thought we were in the thirties, but I didn't know Dick Davis court was that old. I didn't know jujitsu was that old. Let's go to our next program here, Jim. Let me open this one up. An interesting card. Let's see if you get this. Tommy Gilbert and Eddie Marlin versus Terry Garvin and Jim Garvin. Ron Garvin versus Jerry Jarrett. Don Green and Bearcat Brown versus the Fabulous Kangaroos with Sir Clements. This is, let me read this. A return explosive tag battle. Falls count on the floor, in the aisle, in the ring, and anywhere in the building. No time limit, no disqualification. And the main event? That's a Nick Gula stipulation all over the place. The interns with manager Dr. Ken Ramey versus Randy Curtis and Lorenzo Parenti. No DQ. One of the interns will wear a different colored jersey. 
That's because they used to switch because they were all in white and they were indistinguishable. So they would switch so they would, to prevent them from, they did it with the uh, Von Brauners also. They would make one member of the team wear a different color. And well, three, it's not. And three, Gar- and three Garvins, including Ron Garvin versus Jerry Jarrett. Yes, all three of the Garvin. This is 1973. I can tell you, am I right about that? November 6, 1973. Okay. And, I mean, are are you throwing me a, another Memphis? Because that could have been a Memphis card, or it could be Nashville, Birmingham. Um, ding, 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 Birmingham. Okay, there you go, Birmingham, Alabama. I thought Jerry um, Jarrett would have been the thing that could have thrown you off and made you think it was Memphis. Well, no, just because at, in 1973 he was working the full territory because he was one of the top baby faces. I didn't realize he was going to the Alabama towns. Oh, yeah, but I mean, he couldn't be in two places the same night. They were running more than one town a night, but no, he was working everywhere. He was he was one of the top baby faces. And especially if that's a night that they weren't running Memphis on the same night, if Memphis was switched or whatever. But I've also, the Kangaroos were a top heel team in the territory at that time. Don Green and Bearcat Brown were huge baby faces. Tommy Gilbert and Eddie Marlin were the the rock and roll express of the time in that they were the team, even though Eddie was in his forties, Tommy was 10 or 12 years younger and looked kind of like uh, Burt Reynolds with the mustache and the cowboy hat and everything. So they had the girls loving them. The Garvins were a heck of a heel team, but Jimmy was the manager at this point of Ron and Terry Garvin. And they would make Jimmy wrestle every once in a while because he had just turned I think 18 or 19 the year before and gone on the road with him. And he wasn't a full-fledged wrestler yet. And the big thing is the interns were one of the top heel teams that ever appeared in the Tennessee territory. But Randy Curtis and Lorenzo Parenti were a team that they just tried to push out of nowhere. They did the same thing in Louisville for about a month, putting them in main events. And then for whatever reason, it was over with and, and, you never saw Randy Curtis again. Lorenzo Parenti was around for a while because he had been around for ages. But I knew that had to be the Tennessee Territory. It was just a question of what town it was in. All right, here's our next one. The referees are Otto Cuss and Ray Gunkel. Cyclone Anaya versus Jack O'Reilly. Steve Stanley versus Jim LaRock. Ramon Torres versus Tony Martin. Gentleman Ed Francis, and I believe this would be after, I shouldn't give anything away, but I'll do it, I already did it. This would be after he was the World Junior Heavyweight Champion, I believe, versus Gene Kelly. Duke Kiyomuka versus Danny Bulldog Pletches. And the main event, Buddy Rogers versus Iron Mike. Ooh, okay. Is that DiBiase? It is DiBiase, although for the record in the program, the name DiBiase is never listed right. once. Just Iron Mike. Ah, uh, boy, you got a potpourri there. Ed Francis would be most known for the promotion in Hawaii, but he was a wrestler before that. Gene Kelly was noted for singing in the rain. Uh, Duke Kiyomoko would have been huge in well florida florida but i was about to say you've just said the referees were auto cuss and who ray gunkel and ray gunkel auto cuss would have been a referee in texas ray gunkel would later at least become the all-time top baby face of the 60s in atlanta you've got buddy rogers who everywhere mike dibiase would have been facing buddy rogers primarily in the Southwest, one would think. Uh, but there is Jim LaRock, who was a top babyface in the Evansville, Indiana area in 1959-1960. Jesus Christ. Uh, this has got to be between, one would think, 1959 and 1962. 
And I'm going to say it's in Texas. I don't know why, except for Otto. Otto Cuss never went anywhere else, did he? I don't know why Ray Gunkel would be refereeing there. Um, it is from the Dallas Sportatorium. Okay. July 3rd, 1956. I, w- I wouldn't have said that early. A little bit earlier than I would have said. Well, one of the giveaways... Steve rollered me. One of the giveaways you didn't pick up on, Gene Kelly was Gene Kaniski. Ah, shit, that's right. And here's something interesting here. That's right. New air cooling in tonight. Which I thought would be interesting considering you were there and 20 years later, 30 years later, later, and there was no air conditioning. Not a bit of it. (laughs) Now, the air cooling in the locker room was a fucking big fan. So I don't, I've never, maybe they left the uh, door to the refrigerator at the concession stand open. All right, two more. Give me some more. Give me something. This one here is an interesting program. Return grudge battle, Mike Pedusis versus Doug Lindsay. Ooh. Sandor Kovac and Steve Kovac versus Mephisto and Dante. And the main event, a five-girl Wrestle Royal, Miss Cora Combs, Miss Dorothy Carter, Miss Ann Casey, Miss Kay Noble, and Miss Barbara Galento. There will also be two other girl matches has paired off from the Wrestle Royal. Uh, that is going to be... Mike Peduce has played football for the University of Tennessee and wrestled in from the 50s through maybe the early 70s. Doug Lindsay was later known as Doug Gilbert for the 70s WWF fans, Gas House Gilbert. He was also Doug Gilbert, the masked professional. Uh, Mephisto and Dante could have been anybody did could be, if this was 1972, it could be Dennis Condry is one of them, but there was a number. Steve Kovac was also Steven little bear. Steve Kovac was big on top for Nick Goulas, uh, in the sixties and seventies Sandor Kovac. Could that be the Sandor Kovac? I'm not certain. And I, I bet say. not. Because with the five girl Wrestle Royal and Barbara Galento being involved, as well as Cora Combs, that tells me this is a Nick Goulas and Roy Welch production. And I'm going to say it's from a small town either in East Tennessee or potentially Western Virginia. And I'm going to say that it was somewhere between 1962 and 1966. Pretty good. It's Birmingham again, although not Birmingham again. Son of a gun. But January 17th, 1962. Okay. I, I'm not as good on my Birmingham as I should be, but that seems like a small card for Birmingham. It happened last week. Jumping Joe Dillman and Bob Holland handled the duties as referee in last Monday night's Wild and Wooly Pro Wrestling at the City Auditorium. See, if you'd have told me Bob Holland was one of the referees, I'd have got it. Lively action saw Jackie Fargo beat Johnny Apollo. Doug Lindsay came out over Big Don Rocky Lee. Canadian brothers Sandar and Steve Kovac won over Johnny Costas and Pedro Zapata. And Mike Pedusa's down Big Tiny Smith. You know who Big Tiny Smith is, don't you? Is that Grizzly Smith? That's Grizzly. He was working for Roy and Nick? He worked in the early 60s, a seven foot tall guy worked for everybody. Where'd they go? Fans ask many times where their favorites have gone. Here are the latest on a few Tommy O'Toole's in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada, as is Reggie Parks. Mr. Moto's in Los Angeles, California. Howard Martin is in Cleveland, Ohio. Larry Shane is in Detroit, Michigan. And finally, Dick Beyer is in Buffalo, New York. And we have one last program here, Jim. Now, there's no way you would ever get this one, so we're just going to talk about the program. Oh, well, thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to give you the card. Let's see if you... Just let's see what happens. See how close I can get. All right. I was going to talk about the program, and we'll see. We'll still talk about it, your Uh, your big program there. All right, here's the... uh, Well, here's all that's listed. 
The main event, six-man tag match, two out of three falls, 60-minute time limit. Von Brauner, Patty Mack, and Chico Cortez versus Nature Boy, Carl Linich, and Billy Sharpert. What is this? Now, is this a Jack Pfeffer deal? And and I have no idea. Those are not normal people. So you were right. I Those have no are idea not what's normal going on. People. Those are not normal people. This is volume two, number 35, November 7th, 1956, the Bowling Green Wrestling Journal. Devoted exclusively to wrestling, the only year-round sport. Bowling Green, Kentucky? Bowling Green, Kentucky. This program is the f- is for the first Kentucky one-cent sale. Six-man tag went... That's interesting. I didn't even think about that. 1956, they're calling it a six-man tag in the program. What else would they call it? Well, no, because I, I, people are now arguing that it was called Trios before it was called six-man tag match. No, it wasn't. Just in Mexico. Just in Mexico. But here it is here, 1956 in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And... The promoter, hold on, that is certainly not any Nature it, Boy I've no. ever seen. Well, it's it's not Nick and Roy, it's an outlaw group, because Bowling Green is only 60 miles from Nashville. So that would, Bowling Green was a town that Nick ran every week for 25 or 30 years, probably. Promoter and matchmaker Joe Marshall, S. Rush Nicholson, State Athletic Commission, Kenneth Marshall's the publisher of this program here, and they're <laughs> operating out of the Helm Hotel uh, and the, yeah, I guess just the Helm Hotel. And, that, you know, that used to be a deal that wrestling offices would be in hotels, anything from the Holland Hotel in New York being where Skolan and Gorilla and all of those guys would, you know, play cards and give out the free tickets and the press passes to Nick and Roy made a career of having their offices in different hotels the sam davis hotel or in nashville or wherever the case because in those days you could rent rooms in in those old downtown hotels on a monthly basis and set up an office and the wrestling fans didn't have anybody's personal address so they couldn't track you down i don't know who all those people were though what year did the von Brauner start Start wrestling? Yeah. I, I don't know what year each one of them individually started as a rookie before they came the Von, the Von before they became the Von Brauners. Because when I I'm, see a guy listed here as Von Brauner and it's spelled B-R-A-W-N-E-R, and now I see his full name here, Johan Von Brauner. Well, but you know what? The Kurt and Carl Von Brauner, the orig- which one of them was named Jimmy Brauner, and it was spelled that way, B-R-A-W-N-E-R. That may have been him as a rookie because the team of the Von Brauners, I think, got together, what, 59-ish, 60-ish? And with Gentleman Saul, and they were together for about 10 or 12 years in Florida, California, Tennessee, et cetera, all over the place. You see that? Fun with guest the program. And there it is, another edition. We'll do this again soon. Good time? Well, yeah, it's just you have to, you you keep, throwing me swerves and curves there when you go back to birmingham twice you're double dipping in birmingham see that threw me off that wasn't fair i call foul all right jim let's play a game let's get one of our games here on the show right let's now. play a game let's play a game how about some guess the program you know remember about three or four months ago we said you know the wrestling business is heating up all these stars coming into AEW. And the WWE is responding, and the shows got kind of good, and Danielson was a star. And we're thinking, hey, this is starting to be a real wrestling war. And I'd rather watch my home movies now from when I was six. My, how things change. Go ahead. What's this game we're playing? All right, Jim, this is Guess the Program. You're going to try to guess the year and the location. All right. You, of these cards. You sprung this on me a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't do as well as I wanted to. So I'm going to try to be better. Opening match, which starts at 8 p.m., the Libyan versus Savannah Jack. The second match. Okay. Jumpin' Joe Savaldi versus 
Nature Boy, Buddy Landell. The third match, Terry Taylor versus Nature Boy, Buddy Landell. Wait, so Buddy's booked twice. Yes. Okay. Back-to-back back back matches, apparently. Yeah. Terry Taylor and Iceman King Parsons versus Rick Steiner and Sting. An elimination six-man tag match. The one-man gang, Wild Bill Irwin and Bad Leroy Brown versus the missing link, Chavo Guerrero and Hacksaw Duggan. Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert Jesus. versus Hollywood John Tatum. The Fabulous Freebirds versus the Fantastics. And the main event, Ted DiBiase versus Terry Bam Bam Gordy. Good Lord. Well, it is Mid-South Wrestling, and it's 1980. Oh, God damn. Early 1985, right? Or mid-1985. It's not, and I'll, I'll actually tell you just... What? Uh, it's not Mid-South. Technically, it's UWF. Oh, well, okay. Well, you know what I'm saying. It's uh, Bill Watts' company, and that is that would have to be 85, because if Buddy hadn't left to go to Crockett yet... But wait a minute. Buddy left early to go to Crockett. Did he come back? Let me remind you, Buddy Landell was in Crockett in 1985. Buddy Landell was fired from Crockett by the beginning of 1986. Yeah, and this was 1986, and this was... I bet this was, was this a UWF show, but one of the UWF shows that he did in the Dallas territory. This is, well, and my hand just stuck to this thing. This is <laughs> the, what have you been doing with it? This is the UWF in Houston, Texas, October okay. 31st, 1986. Halloween day at the, it was at the summit or Sam Houston. This is at the Sam Houston, I believe. Let me just... Do yep, Houston return, uh, returns to the Sam Houston. Oh, I'm flipping this thing all over. This is the UWF PWI Open. The tournament begins. And another interesting thing about this, as I flip through this thing, is that this is the first program. This is... Oh, no, excuse me. I'm wrong there. But this is volume one, number four of the official UWF bulletin. It's not the traditional Houston wrestling look. They, at the end, started using the UWF program look and right. then applying the insides would be customized by Houston wrestling. And uh, that would have probably happened. I have Houston programs in the traditional style through somewhere in 85. That would have been the last year or so they were in business. They did that. This next program, Jim, let me find the card here. In the opener, one fall, 30 minutes, Wally Satsumi <laughs> versus Wimpy Willington. Oh, for God's sake. In the second match, Kay Bell versus Chief Little Wolf. The next match, as part of a double main event, Two falls, or best of two falls, 45-minute time limit. Dick Rains versus Bobby McCoon. And Abe Cashy versus Lucky Saminovich. Ooh, okay. Kay Bell was one of Sandy Scott's favorite wrestlers. He liked old Kay Bell. Um, Abe King Kong Cashy... Did he not have Vern Gagne's first pro wrestling match in Minnesota in the late 40s? Was he not the opponent? I don't know. I could check on that. I'm not sure. Uh, Dirty Dick Reigns was a big star in the Texas Territory. Uh, Lucky Seminovich was a journeyman in a lot of territories. This has to be no more recent than the late 50s, and I would say probably more like earlier mid-50s, and just because of Dick Rains, I'm going to say, was it in Texas? First, let me say you are correct. 
Abe Cashy was defeated by Vern Gagne in Vern Gagne's first ever wrestling match in 1949. And he was, Cashy was a big name back in those days. So that was a stunning victory. This card is Sunday, December 2nd, 1951, Honolulu, Hawaii, the Civic Auditorium. Son of a bitch. Son of a bitch. I wouldn't have thought, obviously, of uh, Hawaii because... No, not son of a bitch, Saminovich. Yeah, well, you know what I'm saying. And that was before that they started uh, the tours in Japan. That's right, actually. 51. So that w this was very early Hawaiian wrestling. Okay, this next one here... The card's all over the place. I got to try to get this one for you. That's the second bout. That's the semifinal. Okay. Australian tag team, Bob Riker and Billy Sandow versus Carol Kowalski and Tony Milano. Billy Darnell versus Ray Thunder. And I'm going to assume that's Ray Thunder Stern. Stern. It just says Thunder there. Marvin Atomic Mercer versus Mike Lordy, Pacific Coast Idol. Is Lordy L-O-R-T-I-E? I know, oh, it's L-O-R-D-I. I think that's a misspelling. And finally, in the windup, two out of three falls, no time limit. Two bitter foes with nary a thought of life or limb. Dutch <laughs> Nature Boy Road <laughs> versus the Zebra Kid. Okay, I was going to ask you, before we got there, was Buddy Rogers on the card because of Billy Darnell, Ray Thunderstern, and Marvin Mercer was, uh, Atomic Mercer, was a star in the Midwest in Ohio, so was Zebra Kid, um, Herman Dutch Road being advertised instead of Buddy Rogers puts this at what? 1946 or earlier um well, well i'm gonna give you a little bit of a clue puts him at 46 or earlier you could say but not necessarily everywhere, everywhere because he was known by a name in certain places before he was known by another name that's tr uh was zebra kid was george bolus here or do we know we don't know there's not a photo of george bolus the zebra kid on here that can that be Billy Sandow or is that a rib in the opening match? There's no way that's. I believe it's a different wrestler using yeah, that name. Yeah, that's yeah. Because um, his photos here, and it's not the. Uh, it's not Stranger Lewis's Billy Sandow. Are we in Ohio? We are not. Are we in Texas? We are not. Are we in New Jersey? Closer to home, we are in New Jersey. We are in New Jersey in 1948. Pretty close. We are in Camden, New Jersey, Monday, March 26th, 1951. Ah, but it's Camden, so of course he's Herman Dutch Road because that's his hometown. And apparently there will also be an Easter parade as part of the show. Every wrestler, a top name in the game, and it means all the action you want and like you want it. Top your <laughs> holiday by taking in this thrill pack program. Our very best wishes to you and you. <laughs> it's just our very best wishes to you and you for a happy Easter. <laughs> all right, well, there's that uh, program. And every, every name on the card, a top name. Possibly not the actual real name, but a top name. This next one is probably a giveaway for you, but it still could be a little interesting. So let me uh, go to this one. The opening match, Eric Embry versus Armando Guerrero. Coco Samoa versus Al Perez. Scott Casey versus Ali Bay the Turk. Ninja Warrior versus Buddy Moreno. In a tag team championship match, Although, how could it be? Well, I, I, I won't explain it. The Sheep Herders and Bobby Jaggers versus Sweet Brown Sugar and Tiger Conway Jr. Oh, I guess it's a handicap match with the titles on the line. And then finally, Tully Blanchard versus Bob Sweetan. 
Oh, excuse me. And also a 14 man battle Royal to end this card. Well, that, um, that 14 man battle Royal gave it away. No, um, <laughs> we're in Southwest championship wrestling. Um, 19 it's the the early 80s i see some guys here that were in florida in 81 and i see a couple of guys here that were in tennessee in 81 i want to remind you the sheep herders are on this show there's a giveaway for you because you know what what the timeline was they came to tennessee in 82 Sweet Brown Sugar was Skip Young at that time. Is this is this 82 or is it 83? 1983, Saturday, July 9th, at the Hof Heights Pavilion. Or Hof Heinz Pavilion, I guess you say? The Hof Heinz Pavilion, Houston, Texas. Oh! Oh, so this is when they were trying to run opposition in Houston. Yeah. It's the San Antonio territory and the San Antonio talent, but they were running against Paul and Houston with very little success. And with this card, you can kind of tell why. This is also one of the first programs, if not the first program, I got to check my files. When Southwest started doing programs on their own because they owed Norm Kitzer money. (laughs) <laughs> they just stopped having wrestling news or pro wrestling enterprises do their programs and started doing them on their own. And they're really nice. But of course they didn't just owe Norm Kitzer money. This is right before they owed USA network money. Yeah. They owed everybody money at that point here in 1983. Let me go to the next program here. Of course, on the cover is Adrian Adonis holding up Terry Funk's world title, as well as Lou Fez's <laughs> world title. This next one here, Jim, let me open this up. Uh, okay, here we go. The Brute versus Cowboy Paul Jones. Ooh. Lenny Montana and Mike Pedusis versus the Assassins. Ooh. Kurt and Carl Von Brauner with Gentleman Saul Weingroff versus the Kentuckians, Jake Smith and Luke Brown. And in the main event for a championship I will not name, the Great Malenko versus Dickie Steinborn. Okay. It's the Carolinas or it's Florida. It's the... Can, can I ask you a question? Yes. You say it's the Carolinas or Florida. Obviously, if you just look at the Assassins and the Kentuckians being on the card alone... It would tell you that it could be several different territories. Is the fact that the Von Brauners or the Great Malenko, that they're on the show here, is that what cancels out any thought of any of the other territories those two teams were? Well, I'm thinking mid-60s. I'm thinking Malenko was still in good with Eddie Graham at that point, so he would have been possibly working Florida. Dick Steinborn spent some time down there, but because of the both the Assassins and the Kentuckians, I thought about the Carolinas, but then I don't know that the Von Brauners worked there with Saul. So that but they did run have a nice run in Florida. However, have the cowboy Paul Jones be in the mid sixties, he had he's from Port Arthur, Texas. He uh, worked both the Carolinas and Florida later on in his career, but this could be a complete red herring. Um, The Brute may or may not have been Bugsy McGraw in his previous incarnation. Lenny Montana and Mike Pedusis could have been anywhere. Where else, as I think about it, would all of these people in what other territory? I don't see it being... And the Brood is not Bugsy McGraw here. Okay. Because it is probably what I would say 1965 or 66. 1962, August 17th, 1962, a Friday night in Miami Beach. Very okay. Okay. I I didn't have the year, but I had one of the territories. I thought it was Florida, like I said, or the Carolinas, and then 
The Von Brauners didn't make sense there, but the Von Brauners and Saul were big in Florida at that period of time. Cowboy Paul Jones had to be a rookie there because he he would go to Australia in, what, 64 or 65? So anyway, yes, I'm ashamed I was four years off. How many territories back then had three of the top tag teams at the same time? The Assassins, the Kentuckians, and the Von Brauners? Well, a lot of them. Because think how many great tag teams there were back then. Dozens. There you go. All right, Jim, this next program here. Let me open it up. Pat Swanson is your referee. Good to know. Vic Holbrook went to a draw with Frankie Murdoch. Huh. Sonny Boy Cassidy defeated Irish Jackie. <laughs> Louis Martinez. There, there, the, the, that's a midget match. Doesn't even say that here. It doesn't even note that. Oh, but here's a photo. Yep. All right. Louis Martinez defeated Ellis Bashara. Bashara. Semifinal match. The Zebra Kid defeated, He's everywhere. defeated Bill Stedham. Main event. One of the main events. Two out of three falls. 90 minutes. Farmer Jones defeated Elephant Boy. And the other main event. Six-man tag team match. Ellis Bashara, Frank Murdoch, and Zebra Kid defeated Louis Martinez, Vic Holbrook, and Bill <laughs> Stedham. Well, and that's the the old-fashioned way of doing things. Six guys on the card, four matches, including a six-man tag or whatever. Um, <sighs> Elephant Boy would have been there with Zebra Kid. Luis Martinez, That this is early, early. He would have been very young. I've never heard of Zebra Kid's opponent. Frank Murdoch was Dick Murdoch's father, Frankie Hill Murdoch. Vic Holbrook was a big star on the West Coast in the 50s. Uh, this has to be late 50s at, at best, at, at most recent, mid to late 50s. And we're going... We're going out west again. Maybe it's not Texas. Maybe it's New Mexico. Maybe it's Arizona. It, could it possibly be somewhere in California? But it would be mid-50s in the southwest or thereabouts. That's as close as I can get. How, how close am I? Pretty close. Monday evening, June 1st, 1953. The Northside Coliseum, Fort Worth, Texas. Fort Worth, Texas. And the, they went to the Northside Coliseum before they went to the Will Rogers Coliseum. There you go. All right. One last program here. Drum roll, please. Here are your preliminary matches. Bob DeMars versus Larry Hamilton. One fall, 20-minute time limit. Joe Dusick. Versus Dave Sims. One fall, 20-minute time limit. And then the main event, six-man tag team match. Ernie Dusick and Joe Dusick with Bob DeMars versus Dave Sims, Ray Vilmer, and Larry Hamilton. Woo! Um, Central States? Uh, well, I mean, before anyone used that term or called it Central States, Topeka, Kansas. Okay, I was going to say Kansas or Missouri. Um, 19 mid-50s. Because uh, when, did, when did Larry Hamilton get in the business? Because Jody is his younger brother. They main evented Madison Square Garden when Jody was 21. That was in 1959-ish, 58-ish, wasn't it? And Larry Hamilton had been around for a while before that. Been around for, I'm going to say, oh, God, uh, Ray Vilmer worked for Sam Muchnick in St. Louis in the late 40s, early 50s, 1952. Ooh, so close. Whoa! 
Topeka, Kansas, May 19th, 1953. Bam! And that's Guess the Program, this week's edition. <laughs> and for anyone who sends in their own thing, we actually use the programs I have here in my collection in hand. So please, uh, I don't want people to waste their time and send me, oh, here's 20 cards Jim should guess. That's not the way this is going to work. Yeah. Any closing thoughts on Guess the Program? Well, I mean, they, they, can, they can send like a photocopy of the program that you can read, but we don't want them to just make up cards and we don't know if they're legitimate or not. That's what you're saying. Well, Jim, before we wrap things up, let's play a few games. We got some programs here. Uh oh. These are uh oh programs. These may be tough. Of course, guess the program. I will talk about a card that is listed in a program from my collection I have in my hand. Jim will do his best to guess the town, the date, and I guess that's it the town and the date. Are you ready, Jim? I am ready. All right, let's start with this first one. The first event, Black Gordman versus Richard Blood. Ah. The second event, Captain Frank Dusick versus Wild Bill Irwin. The third event, there is a title on the line, but I will not name it due to it giving away something right. about the show. Bugsy McGraw versus Jose Lothario. The co-feature, Kevin Von Erich and the Spoiler versus King Kong Bundy and Arman Hussein. The main event for the World Heavyweight Championship, Ric Flair of Minneapolis, 240 pounds, versus Kerry Von Erich of Lake Dallas, 260 pounds. And for some reason, there is one photo of him doing like a Sig Heil. I don't know why they're using this one. <laughs> and then the co-feature, Al Madrill versus the Great Kabuki. Well, I knew this was Texas after the second match with Frank Dusick and Bill Irwin. The year has to be 1981 because it would be, if, if Flair was the champion, and I think it would be the late in 1981 because he didn't win the title until what, September? Yeah, why are you stuck on 81? Um, why not 82 or 83? Because I think this is very early because Armand Hussein was still in Dallas. So was Jardine. And Hussein is wrestling. Whereas later on, they took him out of the ring, and it was him and Gary Hart, H&H &H Enterprises, right? And they were co-managers. That's right. Um, and also, would this have been late 1981? Because did not Bugsy McGraw go to Dallas right after he left Memphis? Uh... So yeah, I'm gonna. We're we're in the Dallas territory. It could be Fort Worth. It could be Dallas. It could be. Well, at that time, it, I don't think it would have been anywhere but Dallas or Fort Worth. Um, late 1981. You're very very close. It is Friday, April 23rd, 1982. God damn it! Now. I'm going to give it to you when you say the Dallas Territory, because it is technically, but that's one of the things that makes this an interesting program. 1982, at the Joe and Harry Freeman Coliseum. San Antonio. San Antonio, Texas. And you did the reverse to me the other day when you had the uh, program from the San Antonio office, but they were running in Houston opposition to Paul Bosch. And here's... Fritz going into San Antonio, where they used to use his talent, running against Joe Blanchard. So everyone's just running against each other. Every, everybody wanted to take over San Antonio, and nobody drew a dime in the last 50 years there. This is the association official program, the match the wrestling world wants the most. The showdown will be here Friday, May 7th. Fritz versus Kabuki. Why has Fritz von Erich been a box office champion throughout most of his career? Because he has the talent. Because he has mastered the Iron Claw, and because he has the vast ring experience, all of the above are true, but the and bottom... also because he owns the company. But the bottom line is that Fritz is a winner! A man who can out-wrestle and out-rough the best of them. 
So that's that program. Jim, our next program. The opening match, one fall, 30-minute time limit. Dale Wayne versus Victor Costello. Okay. The second match, Al LeClerc versus Joe Meich. Wait, spell that last one. M-A-I-C-H. I may be mispronouncing that. I'm not sure. Okay. The next match, two out of three falls, 45-minute time limit. Buck Masters versus, it says here, Lewis Klein, but it's Lou Klein. Lou Klein. All right. I finally heard of somebody. And the main event, two out of three falls, 60-minute time limit. Miguel Torres versus Burt Ruby. Well, we're in Michigan. Burt Ruby's wrestling. Lou Klein is on the card. Uh, both of them were older than dirt. Lou Klein's mother charged the light brigade. He was so old. Um, How do you have to insult his mother? You could have just insulted him and said he was so old. Well, then I would have been accusing him of gay relations with the light brigade. <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't get wrestling history talk like this anywhere else, folks. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's got to be the 40s. And we're in Michigan somewhere. I got no other clue. You know, I'm actually trying to find a firm location here. And that's the only thing I don't have. Uh, you know, like these old programs, they list the streets and then they have the phone numbers with the uh, first two initials. But they don't actually say where. I believe this is, if not Detroit, it is Michigan. December 11th, a Tuesday, 1945. Boom. They have four days. After, uh, well, no, that was 41. So I said four, four years and four days after Pearl Harbor Day. Here's a uh, note from inside this program here. By the way, the lucky number is A4508. So if they call this one, we won something. Bingo. Oh, two tickets to any future event. That's a good deal. So what's the name of the building they're in? Fairview Presents. I mean, I'm not saying that's the name of it. Mac at Fairview. I'm guessing it's the Fairview. I I have not heard. This has to be some kind of small spot show. It, but it was in Michigan, obviously. When intermission rolls around and hunger comes to you, then buy a red hot dog. It's good in filling, too. But here's what it says about tag teams, a tag team match. There are two wrestlers to a team. Only two wrestlers start the match with the referee tossing a coin to decide the initial competitors. The two wrestlers who do not start the match retire to a corner outside the ring, each holding a short rope attached to the ring post. Again, I want to just reiterate, this is 1945. When one of the... Well, go ahead. I was just going to say the first tag team wrestling match that ever took place in Louisville, Kentucky, and it's in my one of my books that I'm trying to... I think it was 1943... With the Welch brothers, the tag team wrestling was new at that point in a lot of places, and people didn't understand it. They had to explain it. When one of the starting wrestlers appears in trouble and is close enough to his partner so that the latter can reach his hand without entering the ring and still maintain hold of the rope, he may then be relieved in the ring by his partner, while he must leave the ring and take up the original place of his teammate outside the ring. Both members of a team must be pinned to constitute a fall. And in most matches, the best two of three falls decides the winning team. According to the rules, it is important that the man outside the ring must not touch any other part of his partner's body except his hand. Boom! In order to make himself eligible to enter the ring and replace Boom! his teammate. Boom! <laughs> I didn't Boom! know. I didn't Hold know that. Wait a minute. Oh, that's, that's not the, the wrong bomb. one. No, I thought, no, I, thought no. I had a bomb on here. So, ah. <laughs> yeah. And here's another thing uh, that delineates an interesting early rule that was later on judged to be unwieldy and got in the way that to win a fall, both guys needed to be pinned. That went away fairly quickly because you were eating up a lot of finishes and it was difficult to, to carry off. It stayed in Lucha, right? 
Uh, well, and that was you either pinned both guys or pinned the team captain, one or the other, right? If it was a six man. But the point is, it didn't. It didn't last long in this country. It didn't. Didn't happen everywhere in the United States when they introduced tag wrestling, and the places it did, it didn't last long because it was unwieldy and hard to get the point across. All right, Jim, our next program I have here, I'm going to leave off the opening match because it wasn't on the program. It was written in by someone. Okay. And uh, it'll give away everything. But there is no TV for this championship card. No TV. Which, according to the note here, drew 10,000, that can't be right, 10,527 people. At least that's what I assume the person is saying was the uh, well, attendance. Well, it could have been it could have been ten thousand five hundred twenty-seven dollars. We'll when we figure out where it is, I'll tell you which one I think. Jane Sherrill lost to Lita Merez. The Alaskan lost to a substitution, Pedro Morales. Uh. I, I'm not certain on that because the way it's written, I think it's Morales, but I'm trying to double check here. I believe it's Pedro Morales. Ray Stevens and Rocky Montero versus Los Medicos of Mexico. A Texas death match, Pepper Gomez lost to John Tolis, and the main event for a championship I will not name. Well, actually, uh, <laughs> no, well, it's, it's an interesting thing here. Both men are champions in this match. Freddie Blassie versus Bobo Brazil. Okay, well, it's the Los Angeles Territory. Um, but not necessarily the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. I think you're trying to fuck with that, me. It is the Olympic. I'm not going to make... Is it the Olympic? I can see okay. why you think I would fuck with you, but I'm not going to here. Okay, well, I, I can see why everybody thinks that, that you'll fuck. Well, in that case, if it's the Olympic, that was 10,527 fans. And I'm going to give the year... And you know what? Now, yes. that, now that we said the Olympic, I'm going to give you one more clue. Freddie Blassie is listed as the America's champion. Bobo Brazil is the world champion. WWA champion, right? It I'm doesn't say, say WWA, just world well, champion. Well, but world champion, right. but that was the WWA. Could that be 1968 or 69 or 70? Friday, yeah. March 8th, 1968. There you go. Charter member of the WWA, the Worldwide Wrestling Associates. And what was the uh, what was the opening match that was written in that would have given it away for me? Ricky Ronaldo lost to Mister Moto. <laughs> as soon as you heard Moto, you would have known where it was. Well, yeah, but I, I, I as I said, I I knew once you got to uh, Gomez told us and in Blassie and Bobo, it had to be the Los Angeles territory and 10,527. That's the only place in the Olympic that they could have put that many people in. I mentioned that it may be $10,527 because I have a couple of programs, uh, that I got from, uh, not only Gordon Soley's collection, but also from a guy that had gotten them from Boyd Pierce. And when the offices sent programs to other offices, they would write down the house because my Amarillo program that was sent to the Florida office, and Gordon Soley had had uh, had it in his collection, it was written in sellout and like $8,700 rather than the attendance because all the promoters wanted each other to know what kind of money they were doing. So sometimes you will see something like that. I actually thought before I got the Blassie versus Bobo that there was a chance you could have thought it was Texas. No, when when you, well, Jane Sherrill could have been anywhere, right? When you got to Alaskan and Pedro Morales, and then when you mentioned Rocky Montero, I'm thinking, was this mid '60s in maybe New Mexico or Arizona? But then once you got to Gomez and Tolos, okay, there we go. Here's an interesting one. The opening match, one fall, 30 minutes, Juan Hernandez versus Ted Christie. The second bout, Ralph Granillo. What? Ralph Granillo or Ralph Granillo 
versus Enrique Romero. The Ricky f- Romero, but could that have been Grimaldi? I don't think so. I don't think so. G-R-A-N-I-L-L-O. The third match, a special attraction. It's a trophy match. Joe Blanchard versus Tony Martin. Uh, and Tony Martin, of course, Tom Renesto. And the main event, two out of three falls, one hour time limit. John Tolis and Tom Rice versus Rocky Valentine and Prince Mayava. Okay, hold on. Rocky Valentine, is that Buddy Fuller? Uh, I actually don't think he is the Rocky Valentine here. I was thinking it may be a different Rocky Valentine. Okay. Tom Rice was a wrestler in the 60s from Alabama and later on quit the business and became a member of the Alabama, what, House of Representatives or Congress or whatever. He had a political career. Rocky Valentine, was that the name that Buddy Fuller used for Jack Pfeffer when he wanted to make him a Valentine brother? Was it Cowboy Something Valentine? I have one of those programs over here. Uh, Now you're messing me up. Actually, I think, and I could be wrong, I was thinking this was Johnny Valentine. Hmm. Joe Blanchard. Actually, there's a picture right here on the cover. It's Johnny Valentine. It's So they're just calling him Rocky. Cowboy Rocky Valentine. Huh. Says Cowboy, in quotes. Ted Christie, that could be anywhere. Vic and Ted Christie were big in California in the 40s and 50s. Ricky Romero, Enrique Romero, that's Ricky Romero, that's early, it's not Texas, um, or not the West Texas, I don't think, because, go ahead. And I should clarify here, because I think some fans probably thought I mispronounced it. I didn't mean to say Prince... Mayavia. I said Prince Mayava. Different yeah. guy. Neff Mayava, right? Right. So, because it's not Peter Mayavia. That's when they named Peter Mayavia, they named him after the only Samoan that they could think of in wrestling up to that point, which was Neff Mayava, but they didn't, nobody knew how to spell it or pronounce it. John Tolos. It is younger days. Joe Blanchard and Tom Renesto in their younger days. This has to be the late 50s or early 60s at most recent, but I'm thinking it's in the 50s. And is this, this is Texas or somewhere out west, but is it West Texas? It is not. Is it anywhere in Texas? It is not. God damn you. Is it anywhere in New Mexico or the southwestern states? It is not a part of the southwestern states, any southwestern state territory that I know of. Okay, then one more question. Would this be considered more of an outlaw, independent promotion of the time, or was it a legitimate promotional territory? A legitimate territory, I'm not saying this was the main town of the territory. That's why if you just named the territory, that would be fine. Yeah, it's a spot show. This is a spot show. God damn, this is a weird, but it's very Texas-centric, but... um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say then the Pacific Northwest. Here's a picture of Prince Big Head Mayava. (laughs) San Bernardino, California. Son of a bitch! Saturday, December 31st, 1955. Okay, I had the the era right, but I, I, would, I would not have got that in a million years. Would you have gone to that show on New Year's Eve? Probably not. Jim, our next card. The opening match, and I have the results here in the program. A draw between Mike Riker and Prince Pullins. Half Beast Man Furpo defeated <laughs> Rene Goulet. <laughs> what else did Bob Luce have to say? Black- <laughs> Blackjack Lanza defeated Louis Martinez. We had a no contest in a tag team match. The Skullmen, Mad Dog and Butcher, 
versus Wilbur Snyder and Pat O'Connor. Cowboy Watts versus Lars Anderson. And finally, the main event, Edouard Carpentier versus the mysterious Dr. X. Oh, um, well, we're in the Midwest. And my question is, is it Chicago or is it a Vern town? Well, um, remember, go, go. Vern did own a piece of Chicago, so you do. Well, that's what I'm that. saying. Is it is it a com- completely wholly owned subsidiary town of the AWA, or is it Chicago, where Vern was involved, but so was Bruiser and Snyder and and Bob Luce? And I have to, uh, the way you described Furpo, I'm going with Chicago, the International Amphitheater, and I'm going to say it was in 19. 19- 69. It is the International Amphitheater in Chicago, Tuesday, March 18th, 1969. Bam! This would have given it away if I told you about an advertisement here for a once in a lifetime Vern Gagne tour to sunny Spain and Portugal. <laughs> April 23rd to May 7th, two fun weeks, right for a colorful. A colorful brochure today, Vern Gagne Tour, and it has an address here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Dickman Hotel, has a little picture of Vern, and it says, come on along. Do you think Vern actually went on that trip with people? Was this a way for Vern to get a free trip? I mean, I would never put that past a wrestling promoter. The Dickman Hotel, by the way, was a Y, -Y D-Y-C-K, right? Yes. Because they had had a lot of class. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, just no regular eye dicks. They had a Y dick. Hammond, Indiana, wrestling dates. Hammond Civic Center. Buy tickets now, Saturday, March 8th, and Saturday, March 22nd, and watch the show Sunday, Monday, Thursday. It was on three days a week? Yeah. Wow. Chicago? Are you kidding? Girls, while they last. <laughs> King of sport charms. Ten- Girls, while they last. 10 karat gold filled wrestling charms. Plus, King of Sport tie tax for men and boys. Only $3.98, tax included. You can get them from the office. Well, I don't need tax. I can keep it on myself. It's interesting. You can get it from the office. Boyd Pierce was selling them to the office. I'm assuming they're from Boyd Pierce if it's all these little things with King of Wrestling King of Sport on it. <laughs> he was selling it to Vern in the office. That's interesting. All right. One more program here. Is this the only place the card's listed? No. There's two. There's a card on the cover and there's a card on the inside. The inside's the spot show, I think. The outside is uh, also... The, the outside... No, it's the same card. What the fuck is this? All right, here we... Just, just wrap it up there, Skippy. Chatty Yakuchi versus Pedro Valdez. Bob Armstrong versus The Challenger. Rip and Randy, the Tyler boys, versus, there's nothing listed here. Like it just says versus, and then there's a line to go to the next match. Okay. There's nothing there. Nick Bockwinkle versus Joe Scarpa. Carl Von Stroheim versus Professor Kimura. El Mongol and Leo Garibaldi versus Buddy Colt and Homer Odell, and the main event... In general! The main event, no time limit, Dr. Bill Miller versus Doug Gilbert, the professional. Well, we're in Georgia. Yes, we are. Um, and I'm going to say that that is either... <sighs> and- 19... Go, what? Let me just uh, say here, because I'm looking through the program, the reason there's nothing listed for the Tyler Brothers, it's their debut. I guess there was nothing planned yet. But it says Tyler Brothers debut. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say 1969 or 1970. And we're in Georgia, and I don't know if that's the Omni or if it's the uh, uh, City Auditorium in Atlanta or... I don't know if it would be another one of the towns. That sounds like an Atlanta card at the time. So 68 or 69 in Atlanta at the City Auditorium because they weren't running the Omni yet. Friday, May 29th, 1970, Lakewood Park. Shit! 
outdoors. <laughs> I forgot about that. Lakewood Park outdoors. It, was that Memorial Day weekend? Uh, May 29th. It may have been. Probably makes sense. Go outside. Memorial Day weekend. Big wrestling show. Hey, listen to this one. I'm not going to make you guess this one. But uh, it's interesting just because of what it is. Here are the matches listed for this show. It is Clovis, New Mexico, June 30th, 1967. Jerry Kozak versus the Duke. Two out of three falls or one hour time limit. Dory Funk Sr. and Gory Guerrero versus the Alaskan and Mad Dog Maurice. And finally, a nine-man Russian roulette battle royal. The last man gets $500. That's how you run a small show. And that's the card, yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Kozak and the Duke, you've got two guys. Dory Funk Sr., and he's the owns the territory. And Gory Guerrero is Eddie and Chavo's, uh, the Guerrero's father. I, I don't think Mad Dog Maurice was Mad Dog Vachon. I think that was some some friend of theirs. So there with a tag and uh, a fucking single match, you've got six guys book two underneath guys and put the manager in the fucking thing. And you've got a nine man battle Royal and you only have to pay nine people and a referee. There you go. Bring a friend to wrestling every Friday night. Try our concessions, your favorite <laughs> beverage, hot dogs, popcorn, and candy. That's all it says. <laughs> and then finally, there's actually an article here. Hillbilly scuffler going great. Comes to Clovis soon. About Big Bad John, the handsome scuffler from the hills of Kentucky. Oh my God. The most amazing young warrior to hit wrestling's big time in the last quarter of a century. Wow. Have you ever heard anybody call Big Bad John handsome? Big Bad John, the handsome scuffler from the hills of Kentucky. Well, who wrote and, this? And, what well, he did when he was young, you see the the old pictures of Big Bad John, and he didn't have the big belly. He was a little leaner, but he had slicked back hair, and he did look like one of the Kentuckians from those days, Grizzly Smith or Luke Brown or whatever, with the long hair, and he was so, you know, big. But, um, hmm, Big Bad John. Then later, about three years later, he was a fucking hell's angel. I don't know where we're going, Jim. It's your program. Well, do you have any more emails over there? Anything you wanted to talk about? Anything on your agenda? Well, thank you for that pitch, Brian. Last, actually, that's what I told you earlier that I had so that you would give me a segment because in actuality, I'm going to flip the script on you, Brian. Like wild card. I've got a segment that you have no forethought or foreknowledge about that I'm going to spring on you right now. And let's see how good you are. What is the recurring segment that we do on this program that ever everybody just loves and goes ape shit over oh geez there's so many well there's so many so many running through your mind guess the program that's right that is where you take a program out of your collection tell me the lineup and ask me to determine the location and the year that it happened but never in the history of this program, Brian Last, have we flipped this on its ass and me asked you the questions. And right here in public, if you will, I am daring you, challenging you, double dog daring you. You don't have a hair on your balls if you do not accept this challenge. Yeah, I'll accept any challenge. I'm not worried about that. Whose programs right. are these from? They're my collection. They're from your collection, not some goofball yes. sending in random things from home. No, no, I don't deal with goofballs over here. So nah, it's a goofball-free organization over here. You would go and put your hands on your things and ruin your collection potentially <laughs> just for me to embarrass you in this segment? I put my hands on my things on a regular basis because I do it carefully. I'll have you know. Never know when something could bend, break, or fall off. You're, you're and, in charge of your fingers. We've already established that. And I don't know how much embarrassing is going to be done around here. That's what we're going to we're going to perpetrate and find out. Right? For the record, for the record, I've had two coffees today, but they were late, and I haven't had vitamin water yet. So, oh my god! So yes, what what would the people say? What would the cult of Cornet out there? What would they say if on any one of these programs 
if I was to say, well, when we play guess the program, I was to say, well, you know, I haven't had a Sprite Zero. If you hadn't, hadn't had my vitamins. If you hadn't had a Sprite Zero, we would have heard about it the entire show. We probably wouldn't be doing the program. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, Actually, yeah, that's right. But I wouldn't use it as an excuse to not know the date <laughs> of a the, wrestling card. You. That might be All the right. only thing you would use as an excuse now that I think about it. <laughs> Well, I, or maybe I picked a bad for instance, but nevertheless, so you haven't had your vitamins and you've only had two coffees and you're going to try as best you can laboring under those handicaps, right? Is this one program or a series? This of is a number of programs. Let's see how you do over the long haul. See, you start getting worried already, getting the limber tail over there. I remind you, you're the star of the show. I'm the host of the show. That's what listeners want. They don't want the focus to be on me. And that's, we're putting the focus on you. We're putting you on the spot. See how much you know there, pal. All right, let's do this. All right, let's start off with an easy one. I'll give you the card as you normally do for the opening match onto the main event. You tell me the year, or approximate year, and the approximate location. We'll start off with an easy one. Mike Romano versus Jerry Monahan. Next match. Jack McCarthy versus Sandor Zabo. Next match, Scotty McDougal, who is, of course, from Scotland, taking on Big Glenn Munn from Lincoln, Nebraska. Huh. And the main event, with a two-hour time limit, Texas Cowboy Jack Russell versus Germany's athletic idol, Richard Shikat. Four matches. Main event, Shikat, Russell. Sandor Zabo on the card. As well as Big Glenn Munn. Big Glenn Munn is the interesting one there. Tell the folks why. Well, the name... Because he's Wayne Munn's brother. That's right. Now tell the folks who Wayne Munn is. Well, he's he's Big Wayne Munn. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the thing is it's sort of like we've got a Jim Belushi situation going on here. Care to take any, uh, any passes at this one. So Dick Shikad and Sandar Zabo were on the same show. Sandar Zabo. And I'll, I'll give you another hint. The promoter was Abe Feinberg. Oh, I fucking know that name too. All right. So this is the 40s. Dick, it wasn't a world title, you didn't say, for the main event. It was just two hours? It is, it is not. It's just a two-hour time limit match with Germany's athletic idol, Richard Schickat. Hmm. Maybe it is the 30s. 1939. Am I right on the year? No, you are not. <laughs> All right, well, 1941, Minnesota. Yeah, I know it's not Minnesota. <laughs> Where is it? February 7th, 1933. Wow, okay, I'm totally off. At the Armory in Louisville, Kentucky. Really? Who's the promoter? Abe Fine. Well, I don't know. It's His name is most often spelled F-I-N-B-E-R-G. So it could possibly have been Finberg, but I would say Feinberg. And that's an alternate spelling sometimes I've seen. Right. Another spelling would be F-E-I-N Berg. Yes, that's yeah. uh, F yes. That's there you have it. All righty. Well, what else I'm do you know so about what, what else do you know about that card? I mean, do you know anything about what kind of crowd it drew? Absolutely, Pocket. No, <laughs> actually, um, this particular card, the only reason that I was able to get this is because Cosper did a lot of this research and everything, but this is a, hold on, I'm going to count. It's a weird, it's not a fold over like four page. It's a fold over six page and it folds twice. And it's advertising a variety of events uh, like Earl Carroll vanities at the Memorial auditorium in Louisville, February 3rd. The Kentucky Hotel danced to the tuneful melodies of Milburn Stone and his orchestra. I don't know if it's the same guy that played Doc on, on Gunsmoke. 
Uh, there's a couple of other ads for hotels and shit. Then the wrestling lineup. And then it's an actual, uh, there's also the program for, hold on, I'm trying to turn this carefully, program for the vanities with who plays all of the, the Earl Carroll vanities with who plays all the parts and the various acts and scenes involved. So it's, it's interesting. But um, is that the oldest program from Louisville you have? Yes. It's the oldest one I've ever seen. Yeah, I've never seen one from the 30s, no. But this was probably, I think, what was it, two years before uh, Haywood Allen, who was an assistant to Feinberg, uh, began the Allen Athletic Club, and it ran for a little over 20 years. I got another one. What started oh, messing yeah. with me was the whole young German idol thing. <laughs> um, just because of, you know, thinking about the timing of World War II and then trying to think of Zabo, and I, yeah, that's what threw me off on the year completely. But. He's listed here as a 205-pound Hungarian champion, so he wasn't very old. No. And tickets, by the way, a dollar ringside, 75 cents main floor, entire balcony, 50 cents, ladies, 25 cents. All seats plus 10% United States tax. And tickets were on sale at Goodman's Newsstand. In those days, for something like that, they the armory, uh, the later to become the Louisville Gardens, actually seated more people then in those days before it was renovated into a modern arena than it does now or did in its day. But uh, for something like that, the research that uh, Cosper has done, there would still be anywhere of two to 3,000 people to 5,000 people in on a big show in Louisville even back in those days. and. The heyday, the biggest crowds we've come to find out were not even the biggest crowds consistently for the longest period of time were the Jarrett days. But there was a period between 1950 and 1955 when their big shows uh, for the Allen Athletic Club under Francis McDonough, who took it over, were eight and nine thousand people, which was way more now than the revamped gardens could ever seat after the early 60s. So it was a but that was with the national TV, and they'd bring in Thez versus Baron Leone, a rematch of the Los Angeles match, was one of the Derby Eve spectacular matches that drew like 9,000 people. You know, we've seen shows where, you know, discounted tickets for children, if you're with an adult or something. What do you think about the idea of such a discount for women to get them into the show? Well, that was common in the 30s, because not only did women mostly not go to boxing and wrestling, but also they definitely weren't going to go unescorted. So the idea was, hey, you can bring your wife for a quarter if you come. And that, you know, they would get a few more people in that way. But that was, it wasn't just wrestling back then. And this was in the Depression. So. Yeah, and TV would have changed that. Because once women started watching these wrestlers on TV, all of a sudden you had a whole new audience. Right. And it, I mean, I don't have it in front of me to prove it, but I think there was ladies, special ladies admission prices to different variety of sports back then or different varieties of functions. Anyway, I got another one for you. This, this will be a little easier. I was jacking with you on the first one. I think you'll nail this one right away. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. The opening match. Rowdy Red Roberts versus Red McIntyre. The second match, Jim Caulfield versus Buddy Knox. The third match, Bibber McCoy versus, listen to this name, Angelo Sistoldi from Boston, Massachusetts. I believe this is a wrestling promoter's attempt at, at spelling Savoldi, but it was Sistoldi. The first main event, Helen Hild versus Teresa Tice. And the second main event, to a finish, Tarzan White versus Babe Zaharias. Hmm. I'm guessing it's early 50s. Red Roberts. Is Opening it, match. Is it Georgia? 
You are correct. Uh, now I got to guess the year. That that's where I'm not going to get it. And what and what led me there? What's led me to kind of the time period is just knowing it's actually Helen Hall being on the show and kind of knowing her history a little bit. 1951, maybe. Oh, 50, 50, 50? June 23rd, 1950. Oh. Paul Jones Sports Attractions. Yeah, there you go. Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta. Okay, I didn't even know it was Atlanta. Okay. Atlanta, Georgia, and obviously at the City Auditorium back then. And Helen Hild, obviously, for the folks who don't know, was Ted DiBiase's mother. That's right. And Teresa Tice was an established lady wrestler at the time who in a couple of years from this would meet and marry Ray Stevens and help in his early training. Babe Zaharias, who wrestled Tarzan White in the final main event, was actually George Zaharias, who was married to Babe Diedrichson Zaharias, who was the most famous female athlete in United States history, but as a wrestler, he sometimes used Babe Zaharias because it, I guess it was more name recognition, right? Um, and a couple of items um, in the cavalcade of new stars signed to appear here, young 218-pound Chattanooga dropkick artist Eddie Gossett wow. will make his first... <laughs> Wow. Make his first Atlanta appearance on Friday, July 7th. Young and Chattanooga Eddie, dropkick artist. Wow. Yes, 218 pounds. Uh, Eddie Gossett, of course, would later become Eddie Graham. Also, uh, in the Paul Jones's Cauliflower Gossip column, uh, Gorgeous George, the Marcel tough man from the West Coast, defeated Don Eagle, the Mohawk Indian, for the Eastern and wow. European heavyweight title. If you had told me that, I would have immediately known 1950. That would have been uh, a good Because away. that was the double cross in Chicago. That's right. Buddy Rogers will meet champion Luthez at Wrigley Field, Chicago, June 21st. Luthez will appear here July 7th. Um, Babe Zaharias and brother Chris have received several good offers to defend their tag team championship around Chicago. George Temple is wrestling <laughs> on the West Coast. That's Shirley Temple's yeah. brother was a wrestler, George. Anyway, so that you got that one pretty daggum close there, pal. I could have done better. Well, let's see. Maybe you'll do better with the, the next one. The program clues. Would it, what, what did you say the date was of the Georgia one? The date was of the... The of Atlanta the program of Friday, June 23rd, 1950. Yeah, I would have gotten the summer of 1950 if you had told me Don Eagle and Gorgeous George. Well, of course you would. But that would that was extraneous information, not part of the rules of our game here. You wouldn't be trying to make me cheat, would you? Hey, I invented this game. Well, in that case, then I'm allowed to change the rules. All <laughs> right. The next card. Frank Townsend. Versus Bob Corby. Second match, Eugenio Marin versus Ombre Montana. Third match, Fritz Wallach versus Arnold Skoland. Next match, Miguel Torres versus Ted Lewin. And the main event, two out of three falls, Johnny Barron and Don Lewin versus Dr. Jerry Graham and his brother, Eddie Graham. Fascinating. Okay. So Arnold Skolin being on the show and the Graham brother. Can you give me the card one more time? Because there was something that made me think one thing. And then by the end of it, I thought something else. Can you give me the card okay. one more time? Frank Townsend and Bob Corby. Yeah. Ombre Montana, Eugenio Marin. Arnold Skoland, Fritz Wallach, Ted Lewin, Miguel Torres, and then the Graham brothers against Johnny Barrand and Don Lewin. I was going to say the Texas territory, but this is the New York territory, I believe. I, I will get you are correct. And I'm saying that because of the Graham brothers, because of Arnold Skoland, obviously. So this is New York. The Graham brothers are teamed up. 
Dr. Jerry and his brother Eddie. It's not, I don't think it's 57. It could be 58 or 59. I, I need a final answer yeah, no, no, or, no, or, and, and or even a question. I'm actually, trying to th- I'm to actually in my head, that. I'm trying to think if it's a spot show or if it's the garden. I can't imagine that would be the, a garden card. So I'm going to guess it's a show in New Jersey somewhere. And I'm going <laughs> to go with it's, uh, 58. Arg! Temple Hall, Highland Park, New Jersey, April 10th, 1959. Fuck! Oh, come on! I was so close. And next Friday night at Temple Hall, Highland Park, Fuck. New Jersey, was a Friday night town. Apparently, because next Friday night, you'll see Haystacks Calhoun and Red Bastine against Carl Von Hess and Judo Jack Terry in a tag natch. A tag <laughs> natch. And other TV stars. Plus, the next night, a super duper wrestling show at the Patterson Armory in Patterson, New Jersey on April the 18th. Order your tickets now. So you got the state, you got the fact that it was a spot show, and you were only a year off. So that ain't bad. The Graham least... brothers teaming up in the Northeast is what helped me narrow it down because there's a yeah. period where it's over and Eddie goes to Florida, even though Vince could still get him to come back if he wanted him. And there's kind of a main period where it's Dr. Jerry and his brother, because Jerry was the bigger star. Well, let's go to another one and see how you fare. You're, right. doing, you're doing pretty good since that swerve I threw in on you at first. Here is the card. The first match. Lee Garcia versus Ken Cooper. Second match. Prince Omar versus Tito Carrion. The next match, tag team action, the Masked Medics, number one and two, versus Pedro Godoy and Pat O'Brien. And the main event, a handicap match, Chief Big Heart versus Swede Hansen and P.Y. Chung. This is Jim Crockett Sr., I think. And I think that because of P.Y. Chung, actually, specifically. That's Tojo Yamamoto before he was Tojo Yamamoto. And I believe that was what he used for well, his run in the Carolinas. Correct. Now, at that time, I'm trying to remember if Jim Crockett's still at Johnson City. I'm just In my head, I'm trying to figure out where his territory boundaries were for the general period of time I'm thinking. I know where they would go north and uh, east. But it's definitely a Crockett show. Give me a couple of the matches again. Uh, well, the main events, Chief Big Heart versus P.Y. Chung and Swede Hansen and the Masked Medics versus Pedro Godoy and Pat O'Brien. And Pat O'Brien is not Pat Malone, who we have learned used that name in the 40s and 50s. Uh, but it is a, there's a picture of him here, and I don't recognize the guy, but it ain't him. And it doesn't list any manager for the medics. It does not list any manager for the medics, nor are they in the is a manager in the picture of the medics that is in this program. Hmm. Can you tell me if it's <laughs> North Carolina or Tennessee? North Carolina. See, when you, when people second guess themselves, sometimes sometimes they ought to just no, go with their first. I was Johnson City was in my head for some reason. I guess because Tojo and Tennessee, it just it fucks with your head sometimes the way things come together. But P Y Chung, P Y Chung, I'm gonna go. Uh, fuck, I'm gonna get the year wrong. I'm gonna go with sixty two. If not Greensboro, Charlotte. Boom. Jim Crockett Promotions, the Park Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, August 14th, 1961. Oh, man. Again, you're, you're right there. You're, you're getting the territories. You're right there with the, with the years, but not quite. But some of the ads, Crockett always had great ads. Because Remember, the story was Jim Crockett Sr. There was a bar and grill that he his office for ages was a special table in that business and he would conduct all of the promotion business from there where he's got a bunch of advertisements for restaurants including 
the South 21 curb service restaurant and the Auto Burger, one mile east of the Coliseum, 15 cent hamburger, 20 cent cheeseburger, 15 cent french fries, and milkshake. And uh, all the drinks are either 10 or 15 cents. You can get lemonade, grape, soft drinks, hot chocolate. You watch. You know what the guy who owned that place said when he went home? What'd he say? It's like a license to print money. (laughs) Championship wrestling was seen on WBTV Channel 3, Saturdays, 5.30 to 6.30. That was the strongest television station in North Carolina at the time. And also there was the Hickory House Restaurant with their special barbecue and curb service. Anyway, and and Red Top Cab. Any picture of Bill Ward? A picture of Bill Ward, a picture (laughs) of of Jim Crockett. (laughs) Stamey's Drive-In Restaurant has seafood and steak. All righty, let's go to another one. You're you're not doing too bad so far. Let's see if we can get you anything here. Ah, here we go. Are you ready? Yeah. The opening match, Rocky Montero versus Jack Armstrong. The second match, a get-even bout. Les Roberts from Australia versus Rocky Johnson from Nova Scotia is listed that way. A special attraction match for the first time ever in the United States, the All-Asian Championship Carl Heisinger, who is a bleached blonde German fellow with a beard, but he's billed as from Chicago, against a gentleman named Il Kim Kintaro Oki. This is the Olympic Auditorium. Hold on. Fucking feeling froggy, aren't you? John Tolos and the great Kojika. Yeah, this is the Olympic Auditorium. Versus La Pantera Negra and Tony (laughs) Rocco. (laughs) The main event, Fred Blassie versus The Sheik. I'm going with... Ah, the year is going to throw me off because it could be any... Rocky Johnson. The Sheik is in there. Freddie Blassie. Anyone... Since I got the... Since I know exactly where it is, can you tell me who's a champion? Is Blassie the America's champion? There is, it's not a title match. It's a grudge match. Grudge match. It is not for the title. <sighs> Who's Rocky Johnson's opponent? Les Roberts, who, he, he remember, he worked as Dingo the Sundowner. He's an Australian fellow. And what was the tag team match? Tag team match was, it's for us, since you've already got the Olympic Auditorium, for the America's tag team title. La Pantera Negra and Tony Rocco versus John Tolos and the great Kojika. Bob Barnett hated Tony Rocco. <laughs> his least favorite wrestler ever. Um, I'm going to get the year wrong. I'm going to go with 70. It's either se- I was going to say it was either 71 or 72, but it could be earlier, especially with Rocky Johnson being there. I'm going to go with 69. Just Throw a number out there. Oh, my God. You said 71, 72, 69, June 26, 1970. Fuck. God damn it. (laughs) I apologize to the Los Angeles historians out there. And if you join the Olympic Discount Club for $2, you get a discount on all the Wednesday night wrestling events. You get one ticket with each one purchased. And if you buy one and receive the one next to it, or you can buy one and receive the one next to it for only a dollar on Big Friday Matt cards. You get the wrestling news delivered free to your house. Hey, all right. And uh, yeah, for two dollars. But they have it. They have one of the cards as a to show you what you get when you get the membership, and it's written in handwriting, sample only, like people were trying to clip it out of the program and turn it in. And here's one I know you're going to get. Here's one I think you'll really like. This card. <clears throat> oh, that trick never works. Yeah, well, it's, it's this one will there, fella. The opening match. Bill White and Ed Wiskoski versus Roy Lee Welch and Bob Orton Jr. 
You might want to take some notes on this one. Florida. Keep I'm going. I'm not done Keep going. Yet. Keep going. The Infernos, managed by J.C. Dykes versus Big Bill Dromo and Jerry Oates. Georgia. Rocket Monroe versus Bearcat Brown. Yeah, I'm going to stay in Georgia right now. Sputnik Monroe versus Tiger Conway Jr. See, once again, that could be Florida. What's next? The Medics. These probably guys. Are not, <laughs> probably not the same ones as earlier in, in the program versus Eddie and Mike Graham. That would make you think, ding, 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 it's Florida. However, based on the time period, it could be when they were going up to Georgia to help out. But keep going. Mr. Wrestling 2 versus Billy Spears. And it is Atlanta, Georgia, maybe the Omni. What's the next match? For the United States Championship, the Sheik, managed by the Grand Wizard <laughs> versus Bobo Brazil. Okay. Then, and by the way, that is interesting because you, have you ever seen the Sheik build as being managed by the, even though Abdullah Farouk was the Grand Wizard, Never it was a dual that. personality. Yeah. But the Grand Wizard at this point in this place had more magazine publicity than did Abdullah Farouk. This is a mask at stake match for a title with no time limit, no disqualification. Cowboy Bill Watts, the champion versus Mr. Wrestling Tim Woods. Bill Watts is the champion, Georgia. It's either the North American Championship there. Well, that was in Florida or the... Okay, keep going. Next match, the finals of a Cadillac tournament. There is no time limit. This is a round-robin three-man tournament. The winner will drive away in a 1973 Cadillac. And the way this match works is... The three guys. I was going to say 73 for the record. Hold on. Oh, I just shit. I just gave the goddamn year away, didn't I? Yep. Well, nevertheless. But let me stop and explain how I would have said 73. It's obvious to me that it's a Georgia show. It's obvious that it's during the war. And it's obvious that it's before Jerry Jarrett was booking. So that I puts know, it in 73. And, and, yeah, and also, I knew you were going to know this, but I wanted to get to, but I make, gave the goddamn Cadillac thing away. But anyway, the way they determine this is they flip coins, and the odd man sits out. The two guys with it match the coin flip wrestle a match, and whoever wins that wrestles the odd guy. And one man has to win two falls. So if the odd guy then beats the guy that just won, then the first guy gets back in and they go till somebody wins two falls, which nobody does anymore. And it'd be a lot easier to understand than this goddamn 18-man clusterfuck. But anyway, Bobby Duncan versus Bob Armstrong versus Bobby Shane. And the main event, extra added match, NWA-ordered lumberjack match, Norvell Austin versus Dandy Jack. Not Dandy Jack Donovan, but the manager Dandy Jack. Crawford? Uh, I believe that was his last name, I think. But uh, you've already said it. The Atlanta Omni and the date, Friday, May 18th, 1973. But do you know what's special about that particular event? May 1873, it's the first Omni show. That is the first Omni show. And this program that I hold in my hands that you can hear is from Gordon Soley's personal collection. Wow. I got it at one of the fan fests from his uh, daughter and son-in-law that were there with that had written the book and et cetera. And I got a couple, I got the first and second Omni events uh, from his personal collection. And this, this was a big deal because at that time, that was the biggest indoor arena that had ever run for wrestling in the South, right? 1973. And it was a, the Omni was pretty brand new at that point. 
the Omni ended up being a game changer, but also being something that in the long run hurt the company because when you didn't have the city auditorium and you had to run the Omni, it cost a lot more money. Yeah, but they what they started doing was running the city auditorium every Friday night for three weeks, and then the Omni, the big spectacular with outside talent, would be once a month. And the auditorium seated, what, 6,000 people, so it was more affordable and it was easier, and then you went to and, and did more than 6,000 people for the big show, but when they closed the city auditorium, that's when things went to hell because now... They couldn't, they, they did a few times try to run the Omni every week, uh, not for long, but they couldn't run a building of that size weekly and sustain, you know, it was unsustainable as far as the rent. And you couldn't do, even when their business was hot, 15,000 people every fucking week. So they had to back up to every two weeks or every three weeks and they lost the momentum of the regular fans ticket money and that combined with the extra rent that's why they ended up going to intermittent spectaculars but it wasn't well not intermittent they were still there at least once a month but it wasn't the schedule it used to be considering what nick goulas ended up doing building his office again with cash how come more wrestlers considering the political relationships they had when they were promoters and a local town. Why didn't they just build their own buildings? When a city auditorium went down, why didn't they spend a few bucks, find a politician <laughs> to work with, and build a 5,000 seat building somewhere? I know it sounds crazy to think of it that way, but if your business depends on that, I don't well, know. Well, but you know, here's the that there's a wide gap between I'm going to build this nice little office for myself over here for 150 grand 40 years ago or whatever it was, and I'm going to build a five or six thousand seat arena that then I not only have to build it, but I have to do the upkeep and the maintenance. And then am I going to rent it out for other events or am I just going to use it once a week or once every two weeks? And other times it sits, it, it, you know, they did, they got away with it in Mexico because of the, I'm sure inexpensive production or production con construction costs, as well as the, multitude of shows they ran and the business was set up differently down there but i mean you know we did it with ovw because and it was the idea to do with ring of honor under sinclair because now we're talking about an existing building that you can customize to seat a thousand people but in those days the uh, a building that seated a thousand or two thousand people in one of the promotions main towns wasn't going to do anybody any good so there it's a Lot, and then plus you still have to go through building permits. And even for for what we did in OVW, which was kind of like a glorified, you know, television studio soundstage type of thing rather than an actual sports arena, there was the number of bathroom stalls and you have to have and how far the the urinal on the wall needs to be from this thing and the code and fire violations and staffing and no, in this country, in the days of the territories, for the crowds that most of the promotions were drawing, that would have been a ridiculous expense. It would have been like building a new mid-sized sports arena in these towns. I wonder how many wrestling promoters tried to use their influence on local politicians to say, hey, you're tearing down this building, replace it with something new or whatever. Sell it to us. I don't know that that ever came into their mind, to be honest. But, you know, again, if the city owned something and it was selling it, there was probably a reason why. Such as you need to practically redo this place from the start. But that was the, I mean, it, it even used to be in like, I've seen spot show contracts that Crockett, and certainly we worked off a lot of Crockett's paperwork because Sandy Scott had it to do Smoky Mountain wrestling paperwork. And some of the other territories that I've worked at, their letter going out to potential sponsoring groups like football teams and high schools, athletic boosters, whatever, to bring spot shows to town. Well, the main thing was you have to be able to provide a building that seats at least 1,500 people, I think was the cutoff. They didn't want to, in those days, except if it was, you know, Tupelo on a Friday night because everybody's got to be in town for Memphis TV eight hours later, they didn't want to fuck with a building or running a show that couldn't draw. A thousand or fifteen hundred people.
in a small town. All right, and that was guess anyway, the program. Well, hold on, hold on there, cowboy. I think we got another one. I think we missed one. Oh. Hold on. I'm trying to file. Ah, wait a minute. Here it is. One more. One more. I haven't heard Pedro Godoy's name enough today. Well, you won't hear it here, but you will hear another couple of interesting names. The first match, Tojo Yamamoto versus Billy Wicks. Huh. The second match, Tretch Phillips and Corsica Joe versus Lynn Rossi and Tony Belergian. The third match for the NWA United States Heavyweight Championship, Wilbur Snyder defends against a fellow named Kanji Inoki, who, as you well know, is Antonio Inoki. And the main event return 10-round boxing match, special referee Archie Moore. Alex Perez versus Prince Pullins. All right. Well, it's definitely the Tennessee territory, I believe. A couple of interesting things make me think it could be a different town. I don't think it's Memphis because of Len Rossi being on the show. I know it's a weird thing, and not that he didn't wrestle in Memphis, but I, I'm thinking Nashville, not Memphis. 65, Nashville. Because of Noki. Hold up, boom on the year, but not boom on the town. Fuck. You fucking kayfabed yourself. Memphis. November 29, 1965 in Memphis. And part of the reason why Lynn Rossi may have been there is because Jerry Jarrett wasn't a thing yet. And we don't know for sure that Birmingham was running that night. That may have been... See, it wasn't a big thing for Lynn Rossi to be in... Uh, as a matter of fact, he'd been working a program the previous weeks with the mysterious medics who apparently were everywhere. And as a matter of fact, the following week, Inoki would team up with Hiro Matsuda against Lynn Rossi and Tony Belarusian. You know but what? Nevertheless, you know what? We just got an email uh, that was sent in asking about that letter you read on the show. That was Lance Russell's letter where he talked about his favorite match ever was a tag match with Matsuda and Inoki. Yeah. And the listener wanted to know where could that have possibly been from? That doesn't sound like a Memphis match. And here we are talking 1965. Both guys are there. Well, and it was in Memphis because Inoki was sent by the Japanese promotion, what was the, the JWA, right, the original, to America in 1965, just like they would send all the other young guys. Baba went in, what, 62? He was all over the country, the giant Baba from Japan. As a mysterious. main eventer. Yeah. As a main eventer, wrestling for multiple world titles, NWA and others, because of his size, and that was completely unusual, and it was 15 years after the war. Well... Enoki didn't get that kind of treatment because he wasn't a giant and he was sent to Memphis and he, he worked the tri cities territory in East Tennessee. He was in Johnson city in Kingsport. That's why 1965 I said, that's a great answer to a trivia question. The people got to see Ron Wright, Whitey Caldwell and Antonio Enoki. Um, Billy Wicks threw think, me off. Billy Wicks being there in 65 that late. Cause I kind of feel like, in my head, I almost feel like he went away after like 61, <laughs> but I know well, he still worked a lot of shows. Well, not a lot of shows. Here's the thing. Billy Wicks was in the, just in this period of time that I'm looking at September 27, October 4, October 11, October 18th. He's the opening match every week. He was working at the sheriff's department in Memphis, and he still wrestled locally. And, but at the same time, they, he wasn't, they weren't really doing anything with him, but he just, you know, to keep... Keep his hand in and see the boys. Uh, but the Eddie Graham, uh, the, the tag team change, for example, Eddie Graham and Sam Steamboat were the recognized world tag team champions in Memphis in 1965. Here they wrestle uh, Alex Perez and Tojo Yamamoto in uh, three or four weeks in a row uh, in a program. Uh, Buddy Fuller and Lester Welch were uh, a top tag team at that point. And Lester Welch either later on or then did own part of Florida. The point is there was a, 
talent exchange, and that's where Jerry Jarrett would have got first gotten to know Eddie Graham is when he was coming to Memphis in the mid-60s. While he was establishing Florida, he was working with Nick and Roy and some of the other promoters, you know, to probably to make extra money to establish Florida and make contacts. So that tag team title match you're talking about that Lance mentioned in his letter did happen in Memphis and he was there at the Coliseum to, to call it. But anyway, but yes, point is November 29, 1965. And it was Memphis. And this was about two years before Jerry Jarrett started booking and became an influence. And that card, um, the newspaper reported it drew about 5,500 people, which was at the Ellis auditorium. This before the mid South Coliseum, probably, 2,2500 short of a, of a sellout. But in Memphis, from what we can gather from the, you know, they didn't list the attendance a lot in those days in the newspaper, but every so often you'd see 3,800, 4,000, 5,000. So that was about what Memphis was weekly through the 60s until Jarrett took over and then they moved to the Coliseum in 72. And that expanded their capacity from around 7,500 or 8,000 up to 11,000 something. And here on February 15, 1965, and I'll give you back your fucking program, your show, Dick the Bruiser got arrested <laughs> on, uh, on uh, February 15th, 1965 by Memphis police. Would you like to hear about it? Yeah. When officers J.D. Williams and E.O. Petri went to the auditorium to police a wrestling match, they probably didn't anticipate they would pick up a few bruises of their own at the hands of Dick the Bruiser. The Bruiser, whose real name is Richard Alice, 30, of Indianapolis, was in Memphis last night to wrestle Pat O'Connor. And that's not his real name. No, it's Alice, but they Well, it's William. It's not even Richard. Well, there you go. So... Um, during the match, O'Connor got thrown out of the ring. I turned my back on the ring to keep the crowd off O'Connor when I was struck from behind by Dick the Bruiser, said Officer Williams in his report today. <laughs> Officer Pitry, joining in the fray, got kicked by the Bruiser. The officers called for help and arrested a Alice, escorted him first to his dressing room to change clothes and then to jail. Alice put up $26 forfeits each on charges of disor disorderly conduct and assault and battery, got out of jail, and then apologized to the officers. And what a card that was. Wilbur Snyder versus Ronnie Etchison, Dick the Bruiser versus Pat O'Connor, Alex Perez versus Rocky Smith, and for the world tag team title, Kurt and Carl Von Brauner with Saul Weingroff against Bobby and Lee Fields, the Fields brothers. Hey, in terms of what we were talking about before with Atlanta, so obviously the Mid-South Coliseum opens. When did the Ellis Auditorium actually close? Um, well, it, about the same time as uh, the Mid-South Coliseum had been there. Uh, I'm not sure what year it opened. It was there for the Beatles, so that was 65? S uh, around about 65, six, well, 64, the first American tour, 66, the big one, but... Wrestling had always been at Ellis Auditorium because that's where it had been since fucking 30s or 40s. And at that time, the audience, the, the promoters felt they wouldn't go to the Coliseum because downtown in those days, everybody walked. You didn't need public transportation. You didn't need a car. And especially the audience... After the late 50s and Sputnik, the audience was heavily African-American. They all lived in the downtown area. The regular fans that had been accustomed to going to the Ellis for years and years would go there. The, pe the promoters didn't think that people would drive out to what was especially then the suburbs. It's Now Memphis is just huge, but the suburbs pay for parking potentially, go to a different building. As Teeny used to say, the wrestling fan is a creature of habit. And changing buildings in a town almost never happened once one was established unless you had a really big show that had to go somewhere or you lost your other building like they did in Atlanta with City Auditorium. They did the same thing in Memphis with the Ellis Auditorium. 
that was torn down to make now what stands there or what did stand there. I've been mean, lately was the cook convention center, which Jared would run when the Coliseum wasn't available, like for the mid South fair or certain things. What about in 77? Yeah. Well, in 77, Nick, Nick's office still had the mid South Coliseum contract in his name. So when Jarrett split off, he knew he not only had to go to a new TV station, he had to go to a new building. And the only other building in town was the Cook Convention Center. And that period of time from April of 77 for about, what was it, 8, 10 weeks until Nick gave up, those are the only wrestling events that have ever drawn at the Cook Convention Center. He, Jared was doing, according to the newspapers, who know, Mr. Coffee was the manager. He may have sweetened it a little bit, but yeah, we've seen pictures and video. They were doing five, six, seven thousand people in the Cook Convention Center because that was the only place to go see Lawler and the stars of Jarrett's program. Nick stayed at the Mid South Coliseum and ran like six or seven shows, and I think the last one got down to under five hundred people in an eleven thousand seat building. So he pulled out, and as soon as he pulled out, the Coliseum who had wanted to do business with Jared anyway, immediately gave Jared the first date as soon as they heard Nick was pulling out. And that first date was April. Well, he split, well, so it was six weeks. He split off the first part of March and the first show the, that Jared ran in the Coliseum was April 24th. And that was with Rocky Johnson and Harley Race, Lawler and Jack Briscoe. Eddie Graham was a guest backstage. Dusty was on the show. He brought in everybody from the NWA. But Ron Fuller sent people from Knoxville. It was a big event, jacked up ticket prices to show that he was making a statement that he was the wrestling promotion in Memphis. So, and But then after that, the only time, again, every time that he went to the Cook Convention Center, I was there on one show in 1982, the house was $14,000. That was maybe 2,500 to three, not even 3,000 people. And it just, it was the fill-in place that, so the reverse became true. Once the people got used to going to the Mid-South Coliseum, they wouldn't go back downtown. And 10 years later, downtown had changed and was not the place in Memphis that you necessarily wanted to be late at night. So it kind of what goes around comes around, but that's the situation is, is they were afraid to move. But once that they did, um, it didn't even take a year and, and they had a sellout with Jackie Fargo and Al Green in the hair match. That was Jarrett's first big push to sell out the mid South Coliseum in 1972. Well, there it is. Guess the program. I think I did all right. You did pretty good. You did better than I thought you were going to. The special holiday edition of the drive through continues right now. Here's the host and star of the show, Mr. Jim Cornette. Hey, wait, what? you're doing this again? I thought we already uh, determined that you're not palming this thing off on me. Let's play some guess the program. You want to? Oh, you want me to go? Since it's my show. You want me to go grab some and try to see what I could do to? No, I don't need you to grab any right now because I'm going to flip the script again on you. Wild card, is I've got some more here for you because people enjoyed, apparently, listening to you twist in the wind trying to figure things out. You, the big expert, the big know-it-all, the big blabbermouth. Last time I did this. You want to you wanna try it again? Are you accepting my challenge? I don't have a, a WrestleMania sign. To, I'm pointing on one of the, the programs hanging on my wall. You want to accept the challenge? Yeah, I'll accept any challenge. You know that. And by the way, I did pretty good last time from what I remember. And that was what you said. You said I did pretty good. Well, you missed a year once. I did several times. I did uh, it every time. I don't think I got the year right <laughs> once last time. Well, I got a couple here. Just a few. I'm going to start you with an easy one. See, this way we get to talk about wrestling without having to watch television. An easy one. Milo of Croton <laughs> yeah. versus a rock. Versus Jesus Christ. Okay. <laughs> First match. I'm telling you, this is an easy one. First match. Tony Morelli versus Dick Byer. Second match. Don 
Badelman versus Count Billy Varga. Now, let me stop and just say, because people like when we kind of explain what we're thinking. Uh huh. The first thought, perhaps the lazy thought, although perhaps the right thought, just based off the first two matches listed, would be Buffalo. You would think it has to be Buffalo. It has to be upstate New York. Well, and tell the people why you would think that. Dick Byer, of course. Legendary wrestler out of Syracuse would become the destroyer, Dr. X, to the fans in the Midwest. Don Beetleman from the Buffalo area is the future Don Curtis, who would settle as far away from Buffalo as he could in Jacksonville, Florida. And become the promoter there after his wrestling days. That's right. And the third and but Billy final. Varga, But Count okay. Billy Varga was a big star uh. in various places, and specifically was a known wrestler off TV in L.A. You are correct there. He was. And the main event. Two out of three falls, no time limit. Kokichi Indo and Ricky Dozan versus Gene Kaniski and Lord James Blears. So it has to be Los Angeles because of Blears. Blears wasn't working, I don't think. Northeast and not, I was about to say independent shows, Jesus Christ. Northeast dates in the early 60s. Although Ricky Dozan, it could be earlier. No, I'm not going to go too early. Oh, no, wait, Dick Byer, though, when Ricky Dozan was in LA, he would have already been the destroyer there. So it can't be Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. The worm is turning. Who's Blears' partner again? Gene Kaniski. Buffalo 56. Ooh. April 15, 1956. <clears throat> you said Buffalo, New York? Yeah. You're only 5,500 miles off. Oh. The Civic Auditorium in Honolulu, Hawaii. God damn. What's the date? April 15, 1956. Billy Varga was in from California. Yeah. Kaniski, because of Blears, he knew Ganya. Kaniski was hot in the Midwest, and he was obviously booked at that point in time or somewhere around that point in time in, uh, in Honolulu to... Uh, to work on top with Lord Blears and Ricky Dozan. That's the biggest giveaway that I'm kicking myself over, because when the fuck did he work upstate New York? Never. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You got, uh, Byer and Curtis got you off kilter. That got me the year. Dick Byer is what got me the year. It was actually a combination of Dick Byer, not so much Don Curtis, but Kaniski. It was those two, just thinking about, Names they used on cards and where they would be in age. That got me to 56. But it also got me to the other side of the world. So I, I thought don't... that would be easy for Hawaii and Brian. That's why I warmed you up with an easy one. Well, you know, one of the issues that people beloved by the Hawaiians like myself deal with is the lack of Hawaiian wrestling history that's readily available before Ed Francis. And I think this is a problem that hopefully we can cure one day. You and your people. My people. They've accepted me as one of their own. I'm, one right, of the, I'm their people. Let's try another one. Your, if, if your people can back you up on this. The first match, Jack Bentz versus Ivor Barrett. Second match, the Russian Crusher versus Little Eagle. Third match, Lenny Montana versus, and this is a misprint, and you'll know Rito Carrion. Okay. <laughs> instead of Tito Carrion. Right. Plus the Von Brauners versus Joe Scarpa. And <sighs> this one, because it's they're listed as Scarpa and Curtis. This one could be Jack Curtis Sr. Uh, of the the Coke and Curtis family. Or Which makes it, sense, because I'm thinking already, just in terms of who's there, the fact that the Von Brauners and Joe Scarpa, the future Jay Strongbow, are on the same show, it's putting it in the South, so I know it's somewhere south of the Mason-Dixon line, 
The question is where? Now, Scarpa, my first thought is Buddy Fuller. That was one of his guys. So it's either Buddy Fuller or his dad. Now, his dad, well, unfortunately... Well, I, that ain't the main event now. You okay. don't have to go all the way. There's one more match. One more match for a certain kind of championship that will not be... It could either be a giveaway or it could be a fucking red herring, but it's for a title. Dick the Bruiser versus Freddie Blassie. So there you have it. You have, besides the first two preliminaries, Lenny Montana versus Tito Carrion, the Von Brauners versus Scarpa and Curtis, and Bruiser versus Blassie. Jesus Christ. Would you give me a Louisville program again? I don't think so. Although Blassie... I would, but this ain't it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and by the way, thank you, John Cosper, for sending me the Louisville history book that he just reissued and expanded. Bluegrass Brawlers. Check it out wherever you find your favorite websites. EatSleepWrestle.com That's it. So it's not that, though. So read that book to find out about everything but this show. <laughs> Lenny Montana being there, you know, Luca Brasi and The Godfather, most people think of him as a Northeast guy. Uh-oh, I bring up Lenny Montana. Let's find out who's on the phone. <laughs> Thankfully, it was nobody. But Lenny Montana, the Von Brauners, did you say with Saul Weingroff? It does not say. Is his photo in the program? It, it, this is a sheet. It just has the... It's a sheet, so you're line. breaking the rules of the actual game just to try no, to... No, it's, it's, pro, it's a program sheet. It's a lineup. It's not an entire... Not a program. A lineup from the program. You're a cheater. Okay. I guess. <laughs> but the Von Brauners, I'm going to assume, saw Weingroff, because why not? It's a fair assumption, wouldn't you say? I would say. I'm going to... I don't have it, so I'm just going to make a wild guess. Okay. Nashville, 1961. Ooh, you are very close on the year, June 29, 1962. Mm. And I'm surprised that Blassie and Bruiser didn't do it for you. Atlanta, Georgia, the City Auditorium, June 29, 1962. Son of a bitch. And this was for the World Heavyweight title. Because at that point, Fred Blassie was the WWA champion in California. A title that Dick the Bruiser would later lay a claim to, I guess is the best way to put it, and yes. make his own. And when, they, when California stopped recognizing the WWA because they rejoined the NWA, it didn't matter because Bruiser already had his own WWA title over in Indiana. But yes, June 29, 1962, Atlanta, Georgia... Of course, Fred Blassie, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of kids today may just think of him as the old man manager or may have heard about him and John Tolis. Not a lot of people talk about what a big star he was in Atlanta for years. That he was... They brought the, him back in like 72 during the war, didn't they? Yeah, yes. Fred Blassie in the late 50s and through the 60s was like the Stone Cold Steve Austin or in... in WWF or Dusty Rhodes in Florida or a Von Erich, he was the guy, the babyface, right before Ray Gunkel in, in the Georgia Territory. And one point there in the 60s, he had, it was the kidney operation, right? Yeah, I believe he, so. He, he lost one of his kidneys and had to retire from wrestling uh, for like a year, year and a half, and opened up a... Uh, a car lot among a couple of other businesses there because of his notoriety in Atlanta. And he would be advertised in the wrestling program with his venture with his see Freddie for a car or whatever the case. And then finally he said, because he'd, he'd had so many different kinds of injuries and health issues and came back from everything. So that, that run in California where they set the gate record at the, L.A. Coliseum in 71 against Tolos, he was already not only wrestling with only one kidney, I think he had had some type of legitimate problem with his eyes, right? That they shot an angle around Tolos blinding him. And he was 53 years old at the time that they drew the 25,000 people to the Coliseum. He had already been wrestling for over 30 years. And then 
the only reason he went to the WWF as a as a manager, he was still the top babyface in the Los Angeles territory, but the Athletic Commission had a rule that they wouldn't license wrestlers at that point that were over 55. He turned 55 and had to leave the main event spot in California and went right to work for Vince as one of his top managers for the next, what was it, 10 years? Even longer. No, they wrest- They let him wrestle. He came for- in to wrestle against Pedro. That's right. He came in as a wrestler and then transitioned to yeah. being a manager after a couple of years. So he was... He was wrestling for the WWF championship in Madison Square Garden when he was closing in on 60. He was still such a big star. Yeah, he was a bigger star in New York then than at any other point in his career, actually. I got more. You want more? I got more. Oh, I know you do. All right. This is going to be a fun one for you. Hold on. This is a big full-length program. I got to turn to the lineup page. Okay. The first event. Willie Love versus Bobby Gunter. I'm going to skip over the second event for just one second. The third event, Johnny Dobbs versus Gene Albert. Fourth match, Mario Duba versus Ken O'Connor. Why do I feel like I'm in Malden, Missouri? Next match, Frank Altman who is billed from Seattle, Washington, against Jack Bernard, who is billed from Louisville, Kentucky. Jack Bernard. And I've never heard of him. Okay. And the main event, Irish Jack Kennedy versus Roy Dunn. Big. That's two out of three falls with a 90-minute time limit. Roy Dunn, of course, at one point was a claimant to the World Heavyweight Championship. Do you have any ideas so far? What was the second event? Well, I didn't tell you that one yet. Do you I have know. any any thoughts or or I'm nowhere first? on this. Nowhere. You're nowhere. Nowhere. The second event. It, well, actually, up, when you, the well, early part okay. of the show, because I didn't recognize wrestler names, I really thought like, oh, this must be one of those Henry Rogers shows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now you know it's just way back in time. The second match on that card with the main event of Irish Jack Kennedy against Roy Dunn. Bill Willis versus in one fall 15 minute time limit contest against a fellow named Jack Atkinson. Okay. And that's the card. What time is bell time? Bell time is 8 30 PM. Uh, any other information from the program you can give me? Well, let's see. Let's look around here. Let's see what it says. Uh, they got a down at ringside column here. Got a picture of Roy Dunn with his world championship belt posed next to Billy Sandow. The Billy Sandow or the fake wrestler Billy Sandow? The usually? Billy Sandow. Okay. And it says here that the promoter of this event drew outdrew his opposition promotion Three to one last week in the first test of that, the opposition had moved in and they drew 834 people. And this promotion drew 2,659 people last week in this town. Is this during the Dallas promotional war? Wait a minute. Hold on. You are correct, sir. Oh, okay. I thought that was the bad sound. No, well, I, I didn't have the other kind of music, so I thought I'd just give you... That was kind of like that, 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 your fault. That's it. No, <laughs> no, it wasn't wah, 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 wah. You are correct. Dallas, Texas, during the promotional war. Because Jack Atkinson being Jack Atkinson, I thought it had to be home. But then the rest of the card, I'm like, okay, there's something going on here. And this is a part of Dallas history I don't know well right now. And this is one of the reasons I wish there was a Dallas wrestling book. And this is one of the reasons I'm collecting all these Texas programs to try to figure out the entirety of the history of Texas wrestling. Give me a year. 57. Eh, 1953. Fuck. January 13th, 1953. And there's a little article in this program on page, I believe it's, uh, is it seven? Hold on one second. 
The headline is Jack Adkison debuts against Mr. Muscles, Bill Willis. This was the debut wow. of the future Fritz von Erich wow. in the Dallas Sportatorium, January 13, 1953. I understand after that match, he got on the mic and he said, one day my kids are all going to be NWA world champion. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, on that topic, if we, if we could take a quick break from your game here, I got a program I just got. This is from June 13th, 63. This is one of those Leo Garibaldi, Texas programs that I love. These things are just okay. the most you, gorgeous. Okay, you could have you tried me on that one. You didn't have to give me the date. Well, it's not really about the card. It's about one of the articles. What you just said reminded me of it. Next week... Bruiser Bill Watts set for debut. Big Oklahoma star. Bruiser Bill Watts out to make Oklahoma debut. Big Bill Watts, mammoth former Oklahoma University football star, is one fellow who can match the little fellows in speed and agility. Despite his huskiness, Big Bill is a speedster in the ring, and his hard-charging flying tackles really rattle the opposition's teeth. And. When Bill hoists his opponent up for a body slam, that hapless individual feels like he is going into orbit. Watts was an all-state tackle while in high school at Putnam City, Oklahoma, and it was only natural that he should attend Oklahoma University under famous gridiron coach Bud Wilkinson. Bill played with the Sooners in the Orange Bowl in 1959 when they trounced a tough Syracuse team. Who was on that team? I gotta look at that. He presently mixes professional football with his grappling. After signing a bonus contract with the Houston Oilers, he was sent to the Indianapolis Warriors in the American League. He plays tackle and defensive captain for the Warriors. Bad news for many Texas wrestlers <laughs> is that Watts intends to devote more and more of his time to the wrestling game and less and less to football. The Big O will hurl his 295 pounds of, uh, the word of is here twice, of, of muscle into the Coliseum next Thursday, June 20th. An opponent will be announced tonight. So Bill Watts coming into Texas. Bruiser Bill Watts. That didn't last long. In Canada, he wasn't Bill Watts. He was Bill Watt because the promoters thought Watts was too close to Watson and you will not be anything <laughs> close to Billy Watson. How dare you? So that meant that every time they asked who was wrestling, they said, what? Yeah, who's wrestling? What? Yeah, I want to know who's on the wrestling show. What? You going to back to, go back to the game now? Let's go back to the game. I got one <laughs> for you here. <laughs> Please. The first event, Leo Seitz versus Bill Howard. Second event, John Tolos versus Red Bastine. Third event, Gordon Nelson versus El Gran Marcus. The semifinal event, Steve Strong and Jeff Ports versus Alberto Madrill and Jose Lothario. Jesus Christ. And the main event for a championship that would tip it, Mad Dog Vashon versus Superstar Billy Graham. Wow, there's a lot to this card. <laughs> for a title that would give it away. At first I thought it could be Florida based on some of the participants, but I've ruled that out. I don't think it's California. Texas is the big suspect on my list, but so is, well, AWA was, but actually by the end of it, it wasn't. Based on where guys were stars at different points, Billy Graham was a star in Texas in the 70s. This is definitely early 70s. Mad Dog Vashon had been a star in Texas earlier than that. I don't remember if he came back to wrestle Billy Graham in Houston ever, but that's one of my top suspects. If it was for a title that would give it away, it wouldn't be a title in Houston, though. That would be maybe Dallas. But maybe not. If it was Los Angeles, it would be a complete giveaway. Would they have done this match in Los Angeles? Can you give me the undercard again? The undercard again, Bill Howard versus Leo Seitz. 
Red Bastine versus John Tolos, Grand Marcus versus Gordon Nelson, Steve Strong and Jeff Ports versus Alberto Madrill and Jose Lothario. And one more clue. The program is already promoting next week, Andre the Giant versus superstar Billy Graham. Fort Worth, Texas, 1974. Ah! 75. You were one year and 50 miles off. <sighs> Was it Houston? On August 5, 1975, Dallas. I was going to say Dallas, and I thought Dallas would be too obvious. That's why I, why I went with Fort Worth. Sportatorium, Katie's, and Industrial. And next week, next Tuesday night, Andre here faces superstar Graham in a match and in arm wrestling. So who's the champion in that match, Graham and Vashon? The match was for the Texas Brass Knucks Championship. Oh, see, I, I would have thought Houston anyway. If you had told me that, I would have went right to Houston, actually. And by, and by the way, folks, the, the Texas Brass Knucks Championship, that is a match without disqualifications where punches are legal. And there must be a winner. Do they have a picture of the trophy? They do not. They don't have the trophy. Because they didn't have a belt. They had a trophy they a with belt, the a trophy. brass knuckles yeah. on it. How do you book that, though? You're bringing Andre in to wrestle Billy Graham, assuming he beats Mad Dog Vashon and retains the title or wins the title, whatever it was. But they're going to arm wrestle, too. Yes. Well, in the arm wrestling, they do the arm wrestling first. Graham starts kind of strong, but Andre gets him as he's almost beat. Graham turns the table over. Wax Andre with the table or the chair, takes off. Andre's mad. People can't wait to see the fucking main event. Finally, the main event gets in the fucking ring. Andre gets even. Graham gets some fucking juice. But some way or another, and I don't even know because I don't know, I don't have the books here in front of me with the finishes, but I would imagine that uh, since Graham was the top heel, that Graham would have tried to save himself by doing something crazy and getting disqualified and Andre making a comeback and running him off and him taking off. That's the way you'd do that. And people would have loved it. I got one more for you. You want one more? Yeah, this is fun. You got to you got to have one more here. This this might be a little test for you here. Okay. And it's advertised that every bout is a wind up could have been a main event anywhere in the country. A wind-up, by the way, used to be what they called the main event, the last match, winding it up. I was going to say a wind-up kind of puts in my head a certain time period it would certainly be before. So, the opening match, Elmer Estep versus Jim Austeri. The second match was scheduled to be Pat Welch versus Tony Martinelli. But according to the handwritten notes on this document, Martinelli was replaced by Rudy Dusick. Next match, according to the notes, the best bout of the evening, Art Legrand versus Sandor Zabo. When you say notes, the person who owned the program left notes in it about the actual quality of the matches? Yes. Wow. Yeah, as as a matter of fact, um, uh, in the Rudy Dusick versus Pat Welch match, the note is Rudy really fixed him. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the semifinal, Reb Russell versus Yvonne Robert. Oh. The notes were Yvonne Robert was a neat guy, and Reb Russell, it says, he was dirty too. He had tape on his arm and kept rubbing it on Yvonne's eyes. Yvonne took it off him and rubbed it in his eyes. <laughs> Think about how what a big pop that spot probably got back then. Fucking caused a riot. <laughs> and the main event, two out of three falls, 90-minute time limit, described as what about Vic Christie versus Emil Dusick, who was described as dirty as the devil himself. So you got Jim Osteri against Elmer Estep, Tony Martinelli replaced by Rudy Dusick against Pat Welsh, Art Legrand against Sandor Zabo, 
Rib Russell and Yvonne Robert and Emil Dusik and Vic Christie. The fact that there's a Dusik in the main event and another Dusik just around to be thrown into the card. I don't know if it's too simple to think it would be Omaha. And a lot of fans don't probably don't realize that Omaha, Nebraska was actually once a thriving wrestling town. Not just the middle of nowhere. Sorry if you live there, by the way. <laughs> <Please> <laughs> like that. Oof. Year is going to be tough. Omaha, Nebraska. I'm going to go with Omaha. Just because I don't have anything else that's a better pick right now. And I'm going to go with 1951. March 12, 1945 in Camden, New Jersey. Really? Camden, New Jersey. Wow. And they're in, it's a four page fold over, and there's a column called Radio Alley. Uh, which talks about, I guess, the radio reports of the matches and et cetera, and says hello to a lot of the fans that come by to the live events. And it says, Ali Gossip, the band leader who was scheduled to be interviewed, was sidestepped in last week's broadcast because the windup was a one-fall affair, but I'm going to endeavor to get him on the air this time. The band leader who was going to be interviewed on the wrestling radio program was named Pat Patterson. <laughs> uh but yeah so they basically they did radio uh, uh calls of the wrestling matches and that served as their promotional vehicle instead of television and also if you pick the the three people who pick the winner and come closest in judging the time of the fall on Christy and Emil Dusik will each receive two ringside tickets with the compliments of the promoter. So I was thinking it would be a little bit later, and I was thinking it was, I mean, speaking of the promoter, I was thinking it was them. Uh, and Camden Beer sponsors broadcast abouts each Monday at 10 p.m. on WCAM 1310 on your radio dial. If you collect wrestling programs, you will find out about more defunct breweries and beers than you could <laughs> ever imagine. And in Camden, apparently in 1945, there was a 12 o'clock closing law so the matches had to end at 11 45 and that was the curfew is so that the patrons could be out of the building by midnight if a match was still going on they rang the bell and stopped it is that something a promoter wants in the sense that it gives you an out it lets you do things with the booking do you like when there is something like that an automatic end that's out of your control and everyone knows it yes because Remember, they used to do that in the garden, right? In the 70s? Curfew, yeah. I mean, at 11.45, if your show has gone three hours and 15 minutes, it needs to be stopped by the city authorities. You know, for fuck's sake. Especially when, you know, in the old days, you only had five or six matches, if that. So, I mean, if it was, if you know about it ahead of time, as a wrestling promoter, you're not going to let a mandatory curfew fuck up your main event because you know about it ahead of time. But what they used to do back in the garden days was they'd put the main event on earlier in the night anyway so that the, uh, the main event for the next show could be advertised before the people left the building and also so the heel that fucked with Bruno could get out of there before he had to fight the crowd. And the curfew would generally stop some tag match that went on last anyway and people were already leaving to to beat the traffic or whatever so yeah i mean you know a mandatory curfew sounds like something that would fuck with wrestling but if it was 10 o'clock at night your show starts 7 30 or 8 i can see but no not if you had a midnight curfew and it still fucked your show up you're a fucking idiot and amazing, too, when you think about some of the shows that did not have that you know you hear those legends about those texas shows with dory funk senior how long did they say he wrestled for? Legitimately, like the Texas Death Match that went hours and hours, and people. Well, were yeah, still in. but 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 see, also the thing is, they got that thing to the point where they only advertised the Texas Death Match, and then they would advertise standby matches on the card because the people knew, oh, Dory Funk Senior is having a Texas Death Match with Cyclone Negro or whoever the fuck that could be. That could last two or three hours. 
So to build on that mythology of the Texas death match, they advertised that and sometimes only advertised standby matches in case there was time. But they really, they put the time in. It wasn't like shaving for an hour Broadway. They had, it was specifically, they were out in public in front of people for an hour at 44 falls and an hour and 44 minutes or whatever it was. And by doing that, the legend grew. You know, I'm sure it was up, but I'd love to know what the next week really was. The next time they returned there with the rematch after that. Yeah, well, probably people were still there. They were so tired out from, uh, but anyway, hey, I got one more here. I got one more. Hey, you said the other one was one more. Well, I got, but I got one more because this will be fun. Okay. I think this will be fun. Unlike the other ones. Unlike the other ones, which were miserable for you. Because this one, you got folks from all over the place. The opening match. And this uh, apparently had something, uh, a military connotation. I've never seen one of these people advertised this way before. But Stu Gibson, Colonel Stu Gibson of Louisville, Kentucky, against Sergeant Sam Steamboat of Hawaii. Now, Stu Gibson was uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, and he was a local guy, and he was a Kentucky colonel. I don't think he was a colonel in the army, but he was a Kentucky colonel. But did you ever hear of Sam Steamboat being a sergeant? No, and I'm not saying that isn't true, but I certainly have never heard that, no. So, but but in this case, Colonel Stu Gibson versus Sergeant Sam Steamboat. Second event, and this is a misprint. I'm going to tell you what's written, and then you're already probably going to know who it is. But from Samoa, Chief Ava versus Rip Rogers. <laughs> third fall, or third fall, third match, Enrique Torres versus Cato. What? Cato? <laughs> okay. Obviously, it says Enrique Torres from Palo Duro, California versus Cato from Japan. And, and as I said, Chief Ava is from Samoa. Rip Rogers, by the way, built from Florida. Next match. And this Cato, for the record, would have predated the TV the show. Green, that's well, right. Well, it would have predated the TV show, but not the radio show. Oh, that's true. That's Green true. Hornet's been on the radio since the 30s. Fourth match, Larry Shane from Detroit versus Fritz Von Erich from Waterpool, New York. <laughs> Larry Shane is the favorite wrestler of Dave Brzezinski. I believe he actually lived upstairs from Dave Brzezinski. That's one yeah. of the reasons Dave became a big wrestling fan. One of the huge babyface leaping Larry Shane was yeah. a huge babyface in the Midwest. Detroit was killed in a car wreck at the height of his career. Semi-final event. Hartford, Connecticut's own Bull Curry against El Medico from Mexico City. And the main event for a championship that is not the one that you think. Luthez from St. Louis versus Johnny Valentine from Washington State. Two out of three falls, 90-minute time limit. Okay. There was something you said earlier that made me think Texas, but I've said that about just about every single program you've mentioned today so far. <laughs> Rip Rogers made me think Texas. Rip Rogers, not the famous Rip Rogers who curses a lot and knows how to train wrestlers, but Eddie Graham broke into the business. Well, not broke in, but the first real break he got was his Rip Rogers in Texas from Dory Funk Sr. Right. Sam Steamboat wrestled in Texas, although I never heard of him as Sergeant Sam Steamboat. Bull Curry, major star in Texas. There's a title that would give it away. Well, the title would give away the time, the, the year, if not necessarily the location. Johnny Valentine's a big star in Texas. Give me a couple of the matches again. Stu Gibson versus Sam Steamboat, Colonel right. versus Sergeant. Chief Ava would not be Chief Peter Maivia, but Chief Neff Mava versus Rip Rogers. 
And, of course, Chief Neff Mava was the only Samoan that anybody knew in wrestling. So when Peter Maivia needed a Samoan name, that, 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 that's how they – but they didn't know how to spell it either. Or pronounce it. Yeah, so it or just pronounce became it. Maivia. Uh, Enrique Torres against Keto. Larry Shane versus Fritz Von Erich, Waterpool, New York's favorite son. Bull Curry, El Medico, Luthez, Johnny Valentine. El Medico. I'm going with Houston, Texas. Bull Curry versus El Medico. Houston, Texas. If it's not Houston, it's a fucking another Texas show you're trying to hit me with. <laughs> Johnny Valentine was a big star there. He's the champion going into this match with Fez. Houston was one of the few places, even more so than Tennessee, that did gimmick matches. So the idea that there's a military match on the show kind of, even though it's the undercard, I mean, usually they actually did gimmick matches for the main event. Like, real gimmick matches. Like, loser rides a donkey. <laughs> you know, loser rides a donkey <laughs> down Main Street. Like, crazy shit. I'm going with Houston, Texas. 1959. And ladies and gentlemen. Oh, by the way, hold on here. Update. Sam Steamboat is stationed at Fort Hood. So, he was in oh. the service and was stationed at Fort Hood. And we are in Texas, but we're back at the Dallas Sportatorium. God, I didn't think you'd hit me with Dallas twice. God. April 8, 1958, and think about this. I was one the year reason, The reason why I said the title would give you the date is because this was Luthez defending the international world title. Oh! Against Johnny Valentine. He had already dropped the belt to Hutton. Yeah. But this was, he, in, in addition to going overseas to defend the international title that he created for himself, because everybody around the world, all the wrestling fans, news traveled slower in those days, and people didn't realize that Thez was no longer the world champion. He dropped the NWA belt on purpose to his hand-picked successor, Dick Hutton, who didn't draw... 15 cents in Chinese money, but was an NCAA wrestling champion, so Thez would do a job to him for him. And then Thez named himself the international champion and did an international tour for more money than he'd make with the NWA title. And he came back here and defended the, the international title. And the, the headline is, Great Lou Thez puts new world title up against Big Valentine. International world title won by Thez goes to the main event winner. And this is Dallas. That means and this, this is, is Dallas. This is happening with the permission of the NWA. Yes, because Hutton wasn't fucking drawing 15 cents in Chinese money. That's the worst thing Thez ever did, really, was insist on Hutton. And, you know, things end up kind of working out in a way in the end. But when you think about the different people he could have dropped it to, Vern Gagne, Buddy Rogers. I mean, there were various candidates that. Would have been be anyone would have been better than Dick Hutton. Benito yeah. Gardini would have been better than Dick <laughs> Hutton in terms of at least being a wrestling star. But Thez did. He wasn't worried about who was the biggest star. He was worried about I'm if I'm going to do a job, it's going to be somebody that can really legitimately fucking stand a chance of beating me, or otherwise, fuck it, good luck. I haven't seen much Dick Hutton based on anything you've ever seen or heard, more specifically. Was it like a Dan Severn situation in terms of trying to convert a wrestler into a pro wrestler? What was he like in the ring? Did he have any good qualities in the ring? Like, what have you heard about Dick Hutton from anyone you've ever asked about him? Well, from, from what I can tell, Dan Severn was Nature Boy Ric Flair compared to... Oh, wow. Dick Hutton. Well, it just... That was the thing. I mean, Dan understood that there was a show business aspect, and Dan had also had a, you know tremendous background in professional sports in the UFC and etc cetera, etc cetera. Hutton legitimately won the NCAA title and was one of the highest ranking amateur wrestlers in collegiate wrestling in the United States but then turned pro and basically what was it 2 years later he Thez puts the belt on him he was still green he was boring he could wrestle and he had the size, but there was no person. I mean, look at the pictures of him standing there. He doesn't even have a fucking facial expression. He was the original Dick same face, right? 
You know, it and almost it, looks like he's from another era. It almost looks like he was transported yeah. from wrestling 20 years earlier. And that's probably why Thez was in love with him. <laughs> yeah, really. But that's but he never he never got it and he never caught on. And you know, he he had no personality, no showbiz, no charisma. He couldn't build the match. You know, he I mean it's not Dan the Beast Severn. Dan had a nickname. Dan understood building hyping fights. Uh, but no, it was just Hutton was nah. and he, after he had that little run, what we wasn't more than a year and lost the belt, he was out of the business pretty quickly, right? Yeah. Did he? I mean, he stayed mostly wrestling around his home area for a little while, and then you didn't hear his name again. And that may be an interesting question to a or interesting interesting answer to a trivia question to a Hutton Torian to a Hutton Torian he is the only NWA world heavyweight champion in the history of wrestling that within what just a couple of years after he was the champion he was out of the business completely and was in, not in any demand to be booked anywhere <laughs> it, it just that's it was what it was Right. It's amazing there weren't more defections from the promoters during that year. And there and there were a bunch. The NWA lost members, and that's why it's amazing there weren't more, quite yeah. frankly. Well, they, that's when they just started, you know, well, we won't drop out of the NWA, we'll just name our own champion. And the other regional champions started sprouting up, and that's why they had to go ahead and go with O'Connor and then Rogers to get the, all the promoters back in the fold because you know, they could draw money with those guys. They couldn't draw any money with her. And I'm going to take your show hostage for a second here because I got something I want to do to you. I want to play a little game with you, son. We Ooh. haven't played Guess the Program in a while. And I came across something. I was doing some research for an upcoming project. I want to, it'll be on Vice like everything else I do is these days. But I came across, I don't have the actual program, but I have the lineup. And I wanted to just see if you could determine where this was and when it was, as we normally do with guests of the program, by me giving you the card and then you trying to figure out the date and the place, right? Okay. I'm going to deviate from our normal pattern in that normally we start with the preliminaries, we go up to the main event, I'm going to go in reverse. Main event, down to the first match, right? Right. The main event for the Southern Heavyweight title, Don McIntyre over Bobby Lane. We're in Georgia. I'm going to, that's my first guess. No, wait, I've, I've, goddamn, I've read the wrong goddamn, I've read the wrong line. It's two weeks in a row. Let me come back. I oh, fucked that. <laughs> well, I look down. You don't even have to edit this. It's the same thing. It was, it, I look down and because it's the same. It's the same title match uh, and the same defending champion two weeks in a row. And I look down the wrong line. Let me go go back. Main event: Southern Heavyweight Title. Don McIntyre drew with Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. This is the right card. My first guess is still Atlanta, but we'll see how this transpires, as I was thinking originally. Yes, because of the Southern title and Don McIntyre. That's right. Who owned but a piece of the office in Atlanta? The semifinal match, Bobby Lane beat Sammy Silvers. And in the opening match, Don Colt huh. beat... Honey Boy Fargo. Wow! That, of course, is the future Don Fargo against his future Honey Boy, Jackie Fargo. Jackie Fargo. Wow, okay. So I believe it, it's definitely before 57. Now I have to decide if it's 54, 55, or 56, because those are my three years that I'm guessing. And if I remembered Don Fargo's wonderful biography on Crowbar Press better, I would remember what year he started. But they were up there by 50 cents. 
I'm going with 55 or 56 Southern heavyweight title, Don McIntyre. I'm going with 1956. Wait a minute. Hold on. Atlanta, Georgia. Hold on one second. Um, I need to find it. Hold on. Where is it? No, that's that's not the oh, right one. Come on. That that wasn't the right one at all. No, it wasn't. Well, that could work. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, fuck. You are wrong, sir. What? July 6, 1953. Wow. And the city, Tampa, Florida. Wow. Because, and by the way, Don Colt was a bodybuilder and regional bodybuilding champion in the Pittsburgh area, and I believe he had his first match in 1949, if I'm not mistaken. However, Don Colt and Jackie Fargo, both independently of each other, were booked to, in the first couple of years of their careers, were booked to wrestle in Florida, which at the time was not a big money territory at all. The crowds in Tampa, 2000, that was capacity for the building that they were running at that point. And people forget that in the 40s and 50s, Florida wasn't a vacation destination. It was a fucking swamp. And it was still a, is. Well, and besides for Miami Beach, which by even in those days, Miami Beach was where you went to something. die. It's well, you know, people had money there, whatever. But Tampa, Orlando, there were no amusement parks, there were no tourist attractions. These were small towns, and Florida was a, a you know, they had regular wrestling for years, like everywhere else, but it was not big business. And Roy Welch and Nick Goulas took Tampa over in the mid to late forties, and were using. The whole Tennessee crew down from Nashville, Nick was the front man promoter. Roy was booking. They used Pat Malone, the green shadow, wild Bill Caney, the whole Tennessee crew. And they ran Florida for a while until an opposition promoter came in. And I think he had the benefit of being closer to home and they were, you know, a long way from Tennessee, but it wasn't until Eddie Graham uh, moved there and became the top wrestling in-ring attraction and then bought into the promotion with Cowboy Luttrell in the early and mid-60s that Florida became a more lucrative wrestling territory. But anyway, so yeah, Don Fargo versus Jackie Fargo in the preliminary before Don was a Fargo and before Jackie was a star. And the Southern title at that point in time, uh, some of the Atlanta talent was being imported into Florida because they didn't really have a goddamn full crew down there at, at most points. And a very interesting in, um, I believe 1952 was the first year that a kid from Chattanooga, Tennessee went down to Florida and wrestled preliminary matches and must've liked the area of the country and seen an opportunity because he went back. Eddie Gossett, debuted in 1952 working preliminaries and later on obviously would team up with Dr. Jerry and become Eddie Graham and own the whole thing for 25 years. Anyway, honey boy, honey boy Fargo. That was his first. Cause he was, he had a Jackie had a baby face when he was in his early twenties. He didn't have all those scars and all the tattoos and done all the hard ways and everything at that point. It was Don McIntyre who sold his shares of the Georgia office to Buddy Fuller when Buddy Fuller became partners with Ray Gunkel. Yes. And then Paul Jones, to be fair. Who always had some shares. Who always, till the very end. Because he, he was older than any other human being on the face of the earth. A few programs here I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, wait a minute. Are you talking about our old game, Guess the Program? Not necessarily. Actually, two of these here are not guests of the program. I want to tell you what they are because they're fascinating. I thought okay. Well, you just want to brag about them. Then. I have other ones you could try to guess. We'll see how good you are. Okay, you know what? Fuck it. We'll start with the guessing. We'll see. All how right. We'll just we'll f see you. How I'll guessing is all right. F you. I'll I'll answer then. I'll f figure it out. Hold. On. I've got paper here. That's good. All I right. Got, I got paper here. All right, Jim. Here's the card. 
The opener, one fall, Baron Gatoni versus Timothy Gahe... Gio Hagen. Gio Hagen. Okay. Brother Frank Jairs and Babe Zaharias versus Paul DeGaulle and Dynamite Lay. <laughs> 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 Is that, <laughs> is that, and by the way, that's L-E-I-G-H, right? No, it says L-A-Y, Dynamite Lay. Oh, wait, you know what? No, is was that, a, uh, was that a nickname for Charlie Lay? Hold on, let me take a look. Let me... Remember Mid-South, Mid-South uh, Commissioner Charlie Lay at one point? Who never left Florida, hold Who on. Who never left Florida. I'm looking here inside here, Paul DeGaulle. Uh... I can't say that because it'll reveal who this is or where this card is. It does not say. It is not stipulated anywhere. It may be Charlie Light. All right. And by, and by the way, Babe Zaharias apparently was a... And goddamn, I read the the research on this, but it's a complicated situation. But Babe Zaharias was not George Zaharias, nor his brother Chris Zaharias, but was a... A uh, wrestling manufactured Zaharias brother. I can't remember who it, it was a well-known name, but I can't remember who now, but go ahead. And finally, the main event, two out of three falls, 60 minute time limit, Wild Red Berry versus Chris Tolis. And next week, the Canadian Ooh. Bear. God damn it. We are, we are in the early 1950s, early to mid. We are, I don't, I, 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 what part of the country am I trying to say? I don't think we're in the Midwest like Chicago. I think we're out Kansas, Missouri, Iowa way. Um, shh. Or can, did I say Kansas? We're not in Kansas. Or Iowa. Anymore, it's Toto. the Kansas City, Iowa way, I believe you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, God damn it. Uh, I don't think anything's going to come. I'm going to say 1954, somewhere in Kansas or Missouri. The date? Friday, May 11th, 1956. Shit. The town? Knoxville, Tennessee. No! Yes! Holy shit! <laughs> I would have never thought... You know, and okay, Frank Jairs was in the Tennessee Territory in the mid-50s when he wrote, or when his son later on, you know, wrote about it in... Whatever Happened to Gorgeous Whatever George. Happened to Gorgeous George, but I wouldn't have put Red Berry and Chris Tolos on top in Knoxville in 1954. So, you got me there, pal. All right, let's go to this next program. Some interesting copy here, but let's just go to the card. The opening bout, 30 minutes, one fall. Dick Beyer, 225, Buffalo, New York, versus Joe Scarpa, 230, Jersey City, New Jersey. The second bout... By way of Paul Huska, Oklahoma. The second bout being a special added attraction for the Colored Ladies World Wrestling Championship... Babs Wingo versus Ethel Johnson. They were sisters, obviously. That story has been told recently. The semifinal match, Tor Yamada versus Johnny Rodsek. And How do you spell that? How do you spell that? R-O-D-C-E-K. Never heard of him. Yeah, yeah. it could be Rod Check. Uh, before the... Well, I guess I should say this after the main event. The main event, two out of three falls, one hour time limit. Chief Little Eagle, 222 out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, versus the Red Terror, 245, parts unknown. While Bill Longson is pretty sore because he didn't get the championship match with Hutton, he's just dying to get another shot at that title. Anyway, he's challenged, it sets that. Anyway, he's challenged the Red Terror, using it as a stepping stone to the title match. He intends to unmask the Terror with his famous pile driving hold. But Little Eagle, that's in the future. Yes. Little Eagle is wrestling Red Terror tonight. That's right. And obviously, he just said Champion Hutton, so we're in either 1957 or 58, right? 
That is correct. Okay. And we're down south, I think. I think that because Scarpa worked a lot in the south in his early in his career. Tori Yamada was the Japanese heel in the Tennessee territory before Tojo Yamamoto. Buyer worked before he became the destroyer in the timeline fits. Buyer worked down south. Colored ladies is another clue. Um, the question is, is this is this a Birmingham? Is this probably wouldn't be Chattanooga? Huntsville, Alabama, uh, potentially somewhere in West Tennessee. Ah, Birmingham, 1957. The date, Tuesday, April 22nd, 1958. Ah, okay. Louisville, Kentucky. Love what? Ha, 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 you prick. <laughs> you prick. All right, this was in the dark days of the Goldenrod Athletic Club when Wee Willie Davis That's right. had tried to take over running the town upon the death of Francis McDonough, the prior promoter. And no wonder these cards didn't fucking draw. Good Lord. Coming All soon. Right. Coming soon. Jackie and Don Fargo. Wow. Now that, but you know what? April 58. I've got, I've got to get with, um, I got to get with Cosper and see if he is, because he researched the Allen Athletic Club and Francis McDonough's years. I don't know if he's done Wee Willie Davis's yet. We were not certain that the Fargos ever appeared in Louisville during the their 50s run because that was not, Louisville was not controlled by the Nashville booking office at that point. So that'd be interesting. And again, coming soon doesn't necessarily mean they actually showed up or. Well, no, there was a lot of coming and... soons that never came at all, especially when they went out with me. All right. Well, let me uh, go to this next one. Here. <laughs> all right. Here's the card. This is a giveaway. This is easy. I'll give you an easy one. Why? Well, apparently I need it. The opening bout, George Becker versus Pat O'Brien. The second preliminary bout, Lenny Montana versus Anton Leone. The semifinal match, a tag team match, Don McClarity and Pedro Morales versus, versus Laverne Baxter and Gypsy Joe. Oof. And the main event, and this will be a little bit of a giveaway, for the World Heavyweight Championship, Buddy Rogers defends against Rip Hawk. Uh, I believe we are in Evansville, Indiana, are we not? We are not, thankfully. What? Who wants to be there? Well, God damn it! now you've thrown me off. Um, Because I've just been reading those uh, excellent Evansville history books from Sean Delaney. And they actually did have Rogers defend the title against Rip Hawk when Rip Hawk was the top star in Evansville back in 1959. Um, well, then this is odd. Okay, George Becker obviously started out in the probably late 30s and was the booker for Jim Crockett Promotions when Jim Crockett Sr. ran the territory. And up until... The uh, change over to George Scott, etc. And Becker and Weaver were the top babyface tag team. Pat O'Brien, I have learned that Pat Malone, the Green Shadow, actually worked a lot of his career as Pat O'Brien. Um, Pedro Morales with Don McClarity is odd. McClarity's known as a top guy in the Atlanta territory. Pedro would have had to been a rookie or nearly thereabouts. Laverne Baxter and Gypsy Joe is a goddamn great combination. We've got to be in 19, obviously 62, uh, 61 or 62, with Rogers defending the title. By 63, he was pretty much tied up with Vince and about to drop it. Uh, and. 
this this has to be in the south somewhere or potentially the it's if it's not Evansville boy boy Laverne Baxter was a, a top guy a lot of times in the Gulf Coast area but this doesn't seem like it would be that. Where the fuck would Pedro Morales have popped up in this band of Merry Misfits? Uh, 1961 in the Carolina Territory. The date? October 23rd, a Monday, 1961, Charlotte's Park Center. Boom! There you go. The Carolina Territory pretty much encompasses Charlotte Park Center. Uh, so I'll, I'll take that as a moral victory. Coming next week, Pat O'Connor, former world's heavyweight champion and now holder of the United States title will appear in Charlotte next week. And you see that little tidbit, Pedro Morales in Charlotte. If you would have said, would Pedro Morales have worked in Charlotte in 1961? He'd get the same answer as when we said, would, did Antonio Inoki work in Kingsport, Tennessee in 1965? I thought Rip and the Hawk, answer is yes, he did. I thought Rip Hawk was actually going to be the giveaway to you. Well, see, yeah, it threw me off bad because at that point in time, I have just been reading these books and Rip Hawk was, came in and, and started doing the Evansville, Indiana local TV studio show and became the top star in the, in the town to the point where he even actually moved there and, and bought a house and, you know, that whole thing. And I'm thinking, where would, at that point in time, where would Rip Hawk have been in contention for the NWA world title? Because, yes, Rip Hawk and Swede Hansen were a legendary tag team in Charlotte, but that came along afterwards. And, you know, it's it's odd. The, the, the crew that they used in the 50s and early 60s in Charlotte is it it had a completely different flavor than what you would think is the modern Charlotte stars. Tojo Yamamoto as PY Chung got not only got an NWA world title match against Buddy Rogers and I would have loved to have seen that son of a bitch, but he was so hot as a heel in Charlotte Tojo that was the main event of a fucking ballpark show outdoors in the summertime. And if but if you had said in 1975 in Louisville, Kentucky, to any smart fan, even Weasel Dooley. Do you think Tojo ever got a shot at Buddy Rogers for the NWA title? You don't looked at that person like their fucking heads were on fire. So you never know about these things. Jim, our next one, the opening bout. I assume it's the opening bout. It must be. A special rematch. Wild Red Berry versus Tommy Phelps. Okay. The semifinal, Bob Geigel versus Bulldog Pletchus. Danny Bulldog Pletchus to you. It only says Bulldog here. I'm going based on what, say, what it says actually right <laughs> here. And the main event for a tag title I will not name, the fabulous kangaroos, the champions, Roy Heffernan and Al Costello versus Juan Garcia and Sonny Myers. Well... Um, we are in, now we're in Kansas, either that or Missouri. Uh, you know what? I'm going to, just to make this interesting, tell you you're wrong on both and you probably, what? I know why you think you, it would be there, but it's not. Well, God damn it. All right. Well, Geigel didn't just wrestle there for, for his entire life. And, and wild red berry was a big, big name all over the place. Um, Sonny Myers sort of homesteaded the central states territory. If it's Costello and Heffernan, it has to be what pre-1965. And now you've you've got me completely out of my train of thought and the drugs are kicking in also. I'll give you another clue just because I'm big on clues this week. Okay. The headline story in this program Lou Thez here next Monday night, rematch, Bulldog versus Thez. Again, a title I'm not going to name is once again at stake, the winner to meet the world champion, Pat O'Connor. 
Aha! All right, and then in that case, we're looking at 1959 or 1960. Are you trying to throw or run by another ringer in here? This is going to be some one of my favorite towns in the world in some fashion. No, I've never actually heard you talk about this town. I don't know if you've ever been there. You must have, but I've never heard you talk about it. Where the fuck would they have been then? Um, I have, I, I have no, I, besides, I know it's either 1959 or 1960. I would think I have no idea the location of where this would be. Monday night, February 16th, 1959, the civic auditorium, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what. I, I never went to Albuquerque often. But I was in Albuquerque twice, and one time I was in Albuquerque, I was in three different people. So <laughs> it's a memorable place, but uh, I would have never guessed Sonny Myers and what, Juan Garcia, uh, the interpreter for fucking Juan Valdez against the kangaroos in Albuquerque. And what was the date? The date was February 16th, 1959. Here's from the headline about Thez coming back. The five times former world heavyweight wrestling champion, Lou Thez, who was also the seven state regional title holder here last Monday night for a mere 20 minutes, will be back next week and once again take on Bulldog Pletchis with the same silver and gold Rocky Mountain title belt at stake. Well, there you go. So he was the champion for 20 minutes. Oh, they probably pulled some kind of goddamn... It's like raw. Uh, reverse decision or whatever, <laughs> you know. All right, one more that uh, I'll quiz you with, and then I'll hit you with a few interesting ones. The opening bout, Tony Belagian versus Johnny Svensky. Second bout, Jerry Mace of Ireland versus Johnny Berend, Rochester, New York. The semifinal, Johnny Rougeau out of Montreal, 235 pounds, versus Aldo Bogny, South America, 248 pounds, one fall, 30-minute time limit. And the main event, Australian tag team match, referee Bearcat Wright, mm. Ivan and Carol Kalmakoff, versus Fritz von Erich and Carl von Schober, Russians versus Germans. Fritz and von Schober. That sounds like. Could it be the Midwest? Could it be the. Could it be an upstate New York area type of thing? I don't. It also could very well be straight into the capital sports territory of the. Late 50s, early 60s. Um, if I name the promoter or the matchmaker, you'll get it right away. Well, and that kind of would spoil it, wouldn't it? But, but otherwise, there are... Who's the matchmaker? I'll give you the promoter. The matchmaker... I think the matchmaker okay. is an even bigger giveaway, although to you, okay, you'll get it either way. Promoter. Dennis Stecker. Okay, well, wait a minute now. Then we're talking about the the Midwest and the AWA territory, what would become the AWA territory. That is correct. But then at that period of time, had it become the AWA yet? I guess you're taking that as a rhetorical question. I, I, you know what? I'll just give it to you. Uh, <laughs> what? No, rhetorically. You it had not become the AWA yet. Uh, so th we're looking at, what would this be, 1957 Minneapolis? January 8th, 1957, Tuesday, Minneapolis Auditorium. Boom, there you go. All right. How about that? The Russians versus the Germans in 57 with Bearcat Wright as the referee. You know, that is, well, but Minnesota was never the seat of strife in the civil rights world or the seat of the you know, communist blacklist. So you got, you got Nazis, you got Russians, and you got African-Americans 
living in harmony, beating the fuck out of each other. I'll give you this card. This may be a tough one, but the story is actually what's on the cover here. The opening match, one fall, 30-minute time limit, Benny Trudell versus Ray Stevens. Two out of three fall, one-hour time limit match, Miss M. Young versus Miss P. Hoffman. And the main event, two out of three falls, returned by public demand, no time limit, winner take all. Chris Saharius versus Junior Mr. America, Harry Smith. Good Lord. Uh, Chris Zaharius actually was George Zaharius' brother, right? He had a real brother, just not Babe. Harry Smith uh, is not that old, the one I'm thinking of. M. Young and P. Hoffman... I got no, and I mean, Ray Stevens, this has to be, he's a rookie. So what, 1953, four, maybe two. Um, are we somewhere in Ohio we or West not. Virginia? We are not. Where did he go? Where did he go? Um, are we out West again? We are not. Are we tired of me guessing hopelessly? Where is this fucking thing? The promoter, Cowboy Latrell. The announcer, Gordon Soley. The physician. Florida. We're in Florida. We're in Tampa. October 15th, Monday, 1956. The headline on the front page of the program. Grudge match on tap this Monday night at Auditorium. October 15th. Watch for your live TV wrestling starting Wednesday, noon, on WFLA, October 17th. Wow. Starting. Starting at, um, at noon. You know, and we were talking about this when we talked about the research I'd done on the Graham Brothers and for one of the Vice shoots here recently. Florida, before Eddie Graham, was not neither a big money territory nor was it a place where wrestling drew huge crowds because Florida was pre amusement parks and development and et cetera. Florida was a, you know, sleepy Southern state. It wasn't except for Miami beach where the gangsters started going early. It wasn't a goddamn scene of a lot of hubbub and Tampa, Florida you go through the old fifties results and you know, the newspaper, records attendances a big wrestling crowd in tampa was 1500 people back in those days and with a card like that you can probably see why and cowboy luttrell had run it for years and years and years but eddie graham had been there a couple times he'd been there as a rookie you know down from chattanooga just in the opening matches and then he had been there right before he got that run in amarillo with dory funk senior and he obviously saw, you know, th there's opportunity here. A guy that understood the wrestling business could come down here and get over as the top guy and be able to buy in. And I've got to hook up with Vince McMahon, who may have, my, my gimmick brother, Dr. Jerry, may have been Vince's favorite wrestler when he was a kid, Vince Jr.'s favorite wrestler, but Vince Sr. probably put more faith and stock in Eddie Graham that he didn't Jerry. So, you know, I think that's why Eddie Graham went there when he could have his pick of going anywhere after he'd just come off of selling out Madison Square Garden because he didn't want to just be one of the boys and bounce around. He wanted to be a, a top guy, take over a territory, become an owner, et cetera, et cetera. But boy, what a all-star card there. Tampa, Florida. Listen to a couple of the things in the program here. Around the ringside, all of us on the promotional end of wrestling hope that you will thoroughly enjoy the coming season. We feel that at times you will be happy with the outcome of the matches, and that at other times you will be unhappy. <laughs> you may even find fault with the officials. But wrestling is not alone can find the fans criticizing officials. The basketball, baseball, football, and boxing fans hate officials, especially if their favorites are beaten. When you attend wrestling matches, or any other sports event, 
enjoy yourself and relax. If you do that, the money you will spend for the entertainment will be worthwhile. And after all, all sports are produced for your entertainment. Surely, the outcome of world problems are not involved. Relax, and you will enjoy long life. <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> uh, apparently, Cowboy Luttrell or somebody in his office waxing poetic and philosophically. And also, they probably had a lot of heat on the referees because they've been doing a lot of fuck finishes. The next time a critic cracks a lung abusing the ancient sport of wrestling, you could do him a favor. Buy him a ringside ticket, and we will bet he'll come back for more helpings. Why? Because the mat game is as colorful as a hurricane stuck paint shop, as versatile as a jack of all trades, as fresh as the present second of time, and as infinite as eternity. It is the scent of blood, sweat, and <laughs> liniment. <laughs> its trademarks are toil, tears, and pain, softened by touches of laughter and applause. Smoothed by human nature and humor. This has been AEW Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is that? And we promise not one unpleased face will be left. Hey, one quick okay. thing before we move off this program and uh, on with the show. The TV's debuting. It's not even that it's debuting at noon. It's debuting Wednesday at noon. What are your thoughts on... You know, again, this is 1956, Tampa, Florida. That's the time spot that wrestling's getting. Uh, uh, that's a little perplexing and puzzling. But, again, I think there may be more to that story. Now, also, if you want to Google real quick, I know this is your show, but when did that television station come on the air in, uh, in Tampa, Florida? WFLA. It's one of the longstanding stations, but was it a brand new station? Or could it have been that they flummoxed up and that's when they taped the program? Because didn't they always in Florida tape the TV wrestling show on a a weekday or a prior day for rebroadcast, even when they were doing it from their own building? WFLA went on the air February 14th, 1955. Again, this program is October 15th, 56. And on the back here I have... Notice wrestling fans, don't forget to tune your TV set to WFLA Channel 8, Wednesday at 12 noon. Okay. When for the first time in wrestling history, live matches will be shown in Florida. Free tickets may be had by writing WFLA TV Wrestling and enclosing a stamped addressed envelope. Okay, that is bizarre, and I don't... I don't think it lasted long. Maybe it was a brand new station. They said they'd been on the air for a year. That's when, you know what? They may have not had videotape capability. They may have, you know, if you want to do a show in our studio, it's got to be live because that was the case with some local television stations back in the 50s that did not have the ability to record and rebroadcast. So maybe that's the time they had. I, it, like I said, it, it probably didn't last that that long. But uh, I don't remember another, even 1950s, wrestling television program being on a, a regular slot on a weekday during the day. With live matches. But but live or tapey. Well, would... On ta I mean, you got in the modern era when you had afternoon programming blocks and of things and W world class was on ESPN four o'clock in the afternoon, but just a local TV program with the local promotion being on a weekday between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. I don't remember that ever. 1956, you're a wrestling promoter. You take that because you know, as soon as you get on that TV, it's going to become probably the one show on that network that gets the biggest reaction. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and also if they'd never had television before, they obviously wanted to get in on it, but uh, the prospects were slim because there weren't that many stations and opportunities, so they took what they could get. But then obviously with the, what, you know, 30 years after that relationship that Florida had with television wrestling, it worked pretty quick and they started switching it to weekends where it could, you know, gain a bigger viewership. 
Well, speaking of a grand prize, we've got to come up with one because we're going to close the program here today with a little contest between me and the great Brian Last because we play this game quite often on the drive through Guess the Program, where we bring a program out of our collection and tell the other one what the lineup is, and that person has to guess what the year and the location was. And when we did this here very recently on your program, Brian, you put in a bunch of ringers on me. I've never heard such god obscure names and lackadaisical cards. You were trying to make me look like I didn't know what I was doing. And I'll have you know that I can take care of that for myself. I don't need your help. So what we've done here to settle this thing is we've just grabbed, I've grabbed three classic wrestling programs at random from my collection, and you've grabbed three classic wrestling programs from your collection, and we're going to give each other these lineups, and we're going to see who can do best. Can we get two out of three? Can we get all three? Can we get zero out of three? Who's going to have the best record here? And I know you're probably going to try to fuck with me again, no, but I'm, I'm giving you a fair shot with... I gave you major your wrestling shot. names here over the last hundred years. Just as I did. I don't know what part of, I, I don't know how I fucked with you playing guess the program by asking you to guess the program. But okay, got, there was, there was one time a guy in the main event I'd never even heard of. It was so obscure. Well, you see, you're making me question. I had some ones here. I thought were kind of going to be easy for you. A layup. And now I question whether I'm going to give you the easy ones and make you look good. Oh, oh, okay. I'll see there now. See, now you're going to tease what you're taking away from me before I even saw it. I don't know. All right, I'll start. All right, you start. This is, see, this one's going to be so easy. It's going to be too easy, but I'll do it anyway. All right. Chief White Owl, 244, Cherokee, versus Pedro Godoy, Havana, Cuba, 238. The Stomper... Versus Jack Murphy. Good old Jack Murphy. There'll be a four girl... Jack, Jack Dropkick Murphy, they called him. There'll be a four girl tag team match. Also a tag team match for the championship of the world. The challengers, the Hells Angels. Versus the champions, Lou and Roy Klein. <laughs> Danny Hodge. Versus Big Sokka. 287 and a half pounds out of Tokyo. He is a manager. Well, and that all that's CG Sakaguchi. That is correct. One of Enoki's longtime right hand men. Ernie Ladd versus Flying Fred Curry. Paul Diamond, 235 out of Miami Beach, versus Lou Thez, Phoenix, 229 pounds. For the British Empire Heavyweight Champion. Actually, it doesn't even say it was a title match. The British Empire heavyweight champion... Now, wait a minute. That ain't going to be Billy Robinson. Is that going to be Whipper Billy Watson? Whipper Billy Watson versus Terry White. From Montreal, 235, Bill Terry versus Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. New Jersey, 230 pounds. Edouard Carpentier, France, 237 pounds. Versus Wild Bull Curry. <laughs> Coincidentally enough, the same weight out of Hartford, Connecticut. And finally, the main event, a lumberjack tag team match with a special referee that you already know where this is from. The special referee's yeah. Lord Layton. <laughs> 20 men stationed around the ring to ensure law and order. The mighty Igor, 286 out of Poland. And Ivan Kamelkoff. Out of Kalmakov. Russia. Kalmakov, excuse not, not me. Not camel cough. 238 out of Russia. He's not a heavy smoker. He doesn't have a camel cough. Well, he was the manager here, so it's the mighty Igor and his manager versus the United States heavyweight champion, the Sheik, with his manager. And his manager. The Weasel out of Syria, 195 pounds. Abdullah Farouk. All right, so we are in the Kobo Arena in Detroit, obviously. Nobody else did it. Did cards like that. And by the way, Terry White, the noted challenger for the British Empire title, that's because Whipper Billy Watson came down from Toronto as a special attraction and they needed something to showcase him. 
Um, you know, the, the only thing, this is not obviously during the 72 through 74 promotional war with Bruiser in Indiana. This, they just, Sheik booked giant cards in the Kobo and a lot of these matches probably ended up on his television program. I don't see any reason why Stomper versus Jack Murphy should not be given away on free TV. 11 matches. Uh, as far as a year, Rogers, Buddy Rogers is the key here because his comeback for the Sheik was short and done pretty much probably as a test run for himself as well as a favor to the Sheik. And I am going to say, and also because Lou Klein and Lou and Roy Klein were still brothers at that point. Um, Hell's Angels, the World Tag Team Champions. Chief Hell's Angels White were Al. the challengers. Well, but still, they're in the World Tag Team title picture. Right. Uh, Carpentier on the card. I'm going to say 1967. The date, Saturday, September 13th, 1969. Damn! The Kobo Convention Arena. Now, 11 wait a minute. So, wait First a minute. bout, 8.30 p.m. Where did Rogers make a comeback in 67? Or am I... You may be confusing that with this things. one. In 69, he had the Detroit comeback. Well, if you call this a comeback, I don't know what you yes, call this. Yes, didn't he do a brief comeback in 67? I have to consult Somewhere. the Tim Hornbaker book, the fine biography of Buddy Rogers. All right. Well, I'm I'm two years off, and I got the town. You got the town. All right. In that case, I will go next. And see, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to give you one that's not unheard of, that you ought to be able to figure this out. The opening match, the Red Shadow versus Jack Welch. Second event, George McCreary versus Ali Vaziri. Third match, Don Carson versus Ron Fuller. In the fourth event, Mike Graham will face Dick Slater. If Mike Graham wins, he gets a match with Slater's manager, Dandy Jack. For a tag team championship, Joe and Paul, the LeDuc brothers, taking on Rip Hawk and Billy Spears. The Mad Magician, Billy Spears, so-called because he could produce a foreign object from any part of his body. There's also an 18-man battle royal with a $9,000 jackpot featuring all of the aforementioned competitors, plus Haystacks Calhoun, Tex McKenzie, and the Great Malenko. And the main event is for a championship. Dusty Rhodes versus number one Paul Jones. Wow, this is all over the place. I thought it was one place, then I thought it was another place. Uh huh. And then I think it's another place. You used to do a little, but a little didn't get it, so a little got more and more. Give me the opening match again Red Shadow versus Jack Welch. What was the second match? Ali Vaziri versus George McCreary. And the main event was Dusty against who? Paul Jones? Number one, Paul Jones. It says that in the program, number one? Well, no, I'm just, because that's the way we all Well, know. no, that matters, as, as opposed that... to, As opposed to the 30s wrestler, Paul Jones. But if it said number one, Paul Jones, it would actually put a year on it. All right, well, actually, in the, in the text of the article about the main event, it says, Paul Jones is an egotistical drugstore cowboy who needs to get taught a lesson by the man who is not only number one, but is also the uncrowned champion, and that person is me. So he was potentially referring to himself as number one, and Dusty was playing off of that. Okay, I'm going with Tampa, Florida, just because I think it's in the Florida territory. I thought it may have been Knoxville or Alabama at different points as you were going through the card. But then I realized, because of a few things, it's probably Florida, the main event being one of them. The fact that it's Dusty against Paul Jones for what is probably a state title. Ali Vaziri was not yet 
any of the other gimmicks. He's still using his real name, so Vern has just started sending him around. And by the way, for the youngsters out there, Ali Vaziri would go on to become greater known or more widely known as the Iron Sheik. Dick Slater has Dandy Jack as a manager, and again, he's against Mike Graham. Mike Graham didn't really work too many places outside of the Florida Territory, and I'm picking Tampa because out of all the towns in the Territory, I think that'd be the program you'd pick. I can't imagine you're going to hit me with a West Palm Beach. <laughs> I mean, that'd be a real fucking kick to the groin. That'd be just a dick thing to do, wouldn't <laughs> it? Well, I'm going with Tampa, Florida, 1975. Eh. Oh, fuck. You got neither the town nor the year because it is Miami Beach. Oh, you did do it, you see? Miami Beach. Well, no, Miami Beach was a weekly town as it ran more and drew better than Tampa most of the time. And it was January 2, 1974. Fuck, I was going to say 74 too. Shit! Yes, you were, fuck. and... As a matter of fact, this makes sense because the first time I saw Ali Vaziri, who at that point weighed about 212 pounds and had washboard abs and a full head of hair, uh, was in the spring of 74 when he came up from Florida to Tennessee and was doing jobs on television. So yes, January 1974, Miami Beach. The sun and fun capital of the world. Okay, so fun. the score now... Yeah is I've got, we're going to get one point for each, if one point for the town right and one point for the date right. And I've got one point because I got the town, if not the date, and you have no points. I got the territory. The town, the territory, goddamn. That could be like what's in New Orleans. No, Oak City, same thing. All See right. what I mean there? All right, well, let's go to, the, I got one here for you. All right. The opening bout, two out of three falls. Tom Drake versus Tor Yamato. Okay, hold on, Drake Yamato. Bout two, best two out of three falls. Lester Welch versus Carlos Rodriguez. Okay. Bout three, once again, best two out of three falls. Billy Wicks versus Rocky Colombo. Okay. And the main event, which is a tournament match and an elimination for a championship I will not name here. Best two out of three falls. Spider Galento <laughs> versus Sputnik Monroe. Okay, Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I won't say Ellis Auditorium. Could this have been one of the outdoor shows? Probably not, though. When you said Tom Drake and Tori Yamato, I was going to head for Birmingham in 1959 or 60, but now we're back in Memphis with Billy Wicks and Spider Galento against Sputnik Monroe. Was that the Tennessee heavyweight title tournament? Was that going on in the summer of 1959? Well, you could just add a couple of points to your list there because you got the city and you got the date, and I said I had some easy ones for you. This was one of them. Uh-huh. Monday, August 24th, 1959, the week after the big outdoor show, Billy Wicks versus Sputnik Monroe with Rocky Marciano as the referee. All right. And actually, it says it right here. NWA suggests tournament. National Wrestling Alliance officials suggested this past week that promoter Buddy Fuller schedule a short four-week tournament to decide the Tennessee championship. Rocky Marciano reported the action after last week's championship match was stopped and the NWA ruled the title vacant. Four tournament bouts are scheduled for tonight. Bada boom. So I've got three points and you got none yet. I'm focusing on the history. You're making this about some sort of thing we should go to prize picks for. Why don't we <laughs> talk about the history here? <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about some history here. Here's a nice lineup for you. From the opening match, Jim Dalton versus Robert Fuller. Next match, tag team match, Roberto Soto and Ricky Gibson. That's Robert's older brother, by the way, for the young folks. 
against Bobby Shane and the aforementioned Billy Spears. My first thought is Atlanta, but let's keep going. A tag team match, Bob Armstrong versus Tom Jones. Uh, no, shit. What am I saying? They've, they've got well, what this a tag team out. match that is. Well, no, they've, they've got this laid out a they're little holograms? Re reading. Let's try this. <laughs> okay, no, they have. It's. <laughs> they put a versus instead of an and. And I'm trying to figure out how the fuck they've. All right. It's, it's, they're trying to say. It's going to be Bob Armstrong and Tom Jones versus Stan Vashon and Cowboy Bobby Duncan. Then there's going to be a 10-minute intermission. Then the triple main event starts with a pile driver legal match. You cannot be disqualified, fined, or suspended for using a pile driver. Buddy Colt versus Bob Orton Sr., for the World Junior Heavyweight title, Danny Hodge defends against Hiro Matsuda. And finally, in the big main event, the Funk Brothers, Terry and Dory Funk Jr. versus Tim Mr. Wrestling Woods and his partner, Mr. Wrestling Number 2. Okay, this is a loaded show, and my first thought was Atlanta, and at various points I realized it could be a swerve and it could be Florida. because. There's a lot of Florida there, but also this is around the period of time during the Atlanta wrestling war where a lot of Florida talent worked in Georgia. Eddie Graham was doing a lot with that office, and eventually he was able to hand out points to people like Jack Briscoe. I'm going with Atlanta, Georgia. It's a loaded show, maybe even the Omni. Atlanta, Georgia, 1973. Boom! On both counts. Atlanta City Auditorium, October 5th, 1973. Ah, City Auditorium. So you got two points there for place and date. And by crack, and what a loaded show. Can you imagine? That's why Atlanta got the reputation of being the, you know, hottest city in the country during that promotional war because of the talent that was being sent in by Florida. And uh, from this period of time and later on through mid-1974, Jared Jarrett was sending guys down from Memphis as well, from the Tennessee Territory. Lawler worked Atlanta a lot in 1974, which is where he met Bobby Shane and got the crown and the idea of the King of Wrestling. There was, it was literally the, the top talent or most of the top talent from Florida, Tennessee, this, the talent that was still with the NWA office in Georgia, and different international stars like the Funks that would come in because they were close with Eddie Graham and, you know, the NWA wanted to win the war of Atlanta. They didn't want to lose the biggest city in the South at that time to an outlaw promotion. So for, but again, what a run, you know, every top wrestler in the goddamn business went through Atlanta over those two years. All right. And every big star of the previous few years in Atlanta was working opposition. I mean, until they ran yeah. out of things they could do, because they couldn't add too many new people to the roster that were going to work. That was pretty hot, too. It was. Well, and Gunkel was doing business that a lot of wrestling promotions in normal times would have killed for, and they were the opposition that were fighting from underneath. All right, I got one here for you. Let's see if you're fighting underneath on this one. All righty. It's two to three. I'm ahead. The opening bout, Bob Cummings versus Larry Hamilton. Bout two, Cyclone Anaya versus Cowboy Carlson. The final preliminary bout, Sonny Myers versus Harry Lewis. <laughs> the semifinal, Sugi Sito or Suji Sito. Suji Sito. Versus Danny Savage. And the main event, two out of three falls, Don Evans. Versus Argentina Rocca. All right. Good Lord. I got, I ain't got a lot of Larry Hamilton. This, it almost has to be. It's either the Northeast or a rogue 
Carolina show. Larry Hamilton worked in the Northeast uh, with his brother Jody in the late 50s, early 60s. Larry Hamilton became the Missouri Mauler later on. Cowboy Carlson and... Uh, was it a hurricane or cyclone at various times? Anaya. They were out of the picture of any mainstream card by the early 60s, I think. Sonny Myers, you would think Missouri, but as we established in this game previously, he worked in the olden days around a lot of places. Danny Savage, uh, Suji Sito could be. When you go with Don Evans, Don and Moose Evans were partners. And, and alleged brothers, but Raka is the big thing. This has to be a Northeastern spot show or some kind of fringe Carolina's event when Raka tried to go opposite, I would think, uh, or work opposition to Vince Sr., but that doesn't really, none of these other people fit that. Um, or could it have been that Raka was just, this is, early mid fifties and rock is just booked out in one of these weird locations. And I was correct about Missouri. Now that I look at Larry Hamilton and Sonny Myers on the same card. <sighs> you know what? It's a spot show in Missouri in 1957. The date Monday evening, February 22nd, 1954. Ah! The location, the Northside Coliseum, Fort Worth, Texas. Texas. Son of a bitch. Well, all That's right, no I got zero. That was no that. points, just to make no sure points. you got that. No points. So it's going to come down to this, apparently. My last program, it's still three to two. You're one behind. You can either tie or go ahead here. And considering some of the other things that we've said and done here, it's amazing that I picked this up. Are you ready for this card? It's an all or nothing to make or break. I'm nervous. I don't know. The opening match. Hogan Wharton versus The Brute. And by the way, uh, I've got a picture of Hogan Wharton here. And I got to be honest with you, if he ever became anybody else under another name, I don't recognize him. But he's big and popular, according to the program. Second match, Bad Boy Hines. Remember, one of the brother team, there was Bad Boy and there was Billy Hines. Bad Boy Hines versus Duke Kiyomoka. Third match, Lynn Crosby versus Torbellino Blanco. Fourth event, the semifinal, Pepper Gomez versus Adnan KZ. And finally, the main event, two out of three falls, no time limit, no disqualification, not lazy booking because it meant something Danny McShane versus Wild Bull Curry the obvious thing would be to think Houston Texas although it could be San Antonio it could be I don't think it would be El Paso it could be San Antonio it could be even Dallas at any point in the 50s it's definitely in the 50s I'm going to go with Houston Texas or a small spot show outside of Houston, which would count as Houston, because <laughs> no one's going to pick Galveston. Um, Danny McShane versus Bull Curry, no DQ, anything goes. Is there? Um, who are the referees listed? Uh, the referee listed is Otto Cuss, K U S S. Right, you remember Otto? I remember. I know the name from Texas programs. What was the semi? And Lynn Crosby, by the way, would later on be known better as Lenny Montana when he appeared in The Godfather. What was the semi? 
the semifinal, Pepper Gomez versus Adnan Casey. Not Chief Billy White Wolf and not Sheik Adnan Casey, yeah. just Adnan Casey. That's the one that really threw me off the most, actually, because, uh, huh. I'm going with Houston, Texas. Pepper Gomez is there. Da -da -da. Bull Curry and Danny McShane. Danny McShane had really slowed down by the end of the decade, except for really special appearances. But I don't know anything about what built this up, so it could literally just be any time. I'm going with based on Pepper Gomez. See, I can't. I was about to say a year, but I'm thinking, did Adnan L. Casey wrestle that far back? I'm going to go a little later than I wanted to. 1957, Houston, Texas. Well, now, wait a minute. You said earlier uh, that you said uh, it was like 1959, and now you said you're going later, but that's earlier. Oh, no. I, I was actually so which think, is it? What, I was actually thinking it would be 55, and then uh, okay, I'm, gonna go with, I'm going with 57 based on Adnan L. Casey. Well, let me explain something to you, my fine young man. You won... The because you phrased it Houston, Texas, or a spot show close by. <laughs> well, does 60 miles count as close? Beaumont, Texas. Yes, that absolutely counts because it was booked out by okay. the Houston office, and no one would pick right. Beaumont, yeah. Texas. Beaumont, Texas, at the Sportatorium in Beaumont on Saturday evening, May 7, 1960. Oh. So you got the, the, the place, you missed the year, and we're tied at three and three. You want to go to a, you have any more programs there? You want to go to a lightning I did, round? I didn't, I thought two out of three ain't bad. I didn't know we would tie. I don't, but uh, hold on here. I can, I can, re, you reach one, I'll reach one. I can one. give you an easy one. Depends on how we want this to end. I can <laughs> give you an easy one. I just, I think the people just want it to end. I don't know they really want to particular resolution out of this. See, this you one's, pick, this you one's pick one, I'll pick one, and let's see what happens. Okay. This is too easy. I can't do this one. Let me go to All this right, one. Wait a minute. I'm looking for one that you won't get. Okay, me. you ready? Yeah, go ahead. Jesse James versus the Magnificent Chevier. Wait a minute. Chevalier. It's not spelled like that here. <laughs> well, they, they had our time... Spelling Chevalier back in those days. Go ahead. It's not Maurice Chevalier, but Golden Boy versus Hobo Brazil. Oh, come on. All right. I want a I year and I want an arena. Hold on. Okay. Tony Zolo versus, apparently returning from the dead, Gorgeous George. And finally, the main event, four-man tag team match, Frank Scarpa and Cowboy Blatz. Versus Wild Bull Curry and Bruno Sam Nartino. And that was you want an arena to it was the, the, the Boston area. All right, under the Beaumont, Texas rules, I'll give you the Boston area. It was the Boston Arena. Okay, well the Boston area, because that was one of those uh Pfeffer fed uh, Tony Santos outlaw shows in the Boston area. And because of the names that are being parodied and the fact that that happened back in the early to mid sixties, I'm going to say 1964. Boston. You get one point for Boston. It's at the All Boston right. Arena Annex. Thursday, December 9th, 1965. God damn it, that I was either going to say 64 or 65, and I went, all right. Hey, real quick, before we move on, let's get, who's your favorite of all the fake names and real names here in this Jack Pfeffer Fed program? Golden Boy, Gene Dundee, Schlitz Von Erich, <laughs> Lukez, Hercules Taylor, Laverne Gagner. <laughs> that one is just filled with spite. Hold on. Yeah, it's filled with spite. Ilio DiPaolo, spelled D-I-P-A-U-L-O. Jumping Joe Brewer. Hobo Brazil. Gorgeous George. 
the Boston Bruiser, and finally, Vilmer Snader. <laughs> oh, and actually, excuse me, there's some more here. Bruno Sam Nartino, as well as Bruno Sam Martino. Jimmy Valentine. Hans Schmidt. This is the real Hans Schmidt. Luthez. Gene Karniski. And it's not Gene Karniski. The Mad Mongol. Cowboy Blatz. Johnny Powders. Johnny Powders? Powders. <laughs> Out of that whole bunch, I like Hobo Brazil because it just so, it just says it. Here's a hobo from Brazil. I was in the back at the Louisville Gardens. Bobo was working in the Tennessee Territory, and this was, God, was it 77 or 78? So at that point, he'd already been wrestling for 30 years, right? And he was nearing his early 50s. And he's waiting to go out and I'm standing there because I've just taken some pictures and, you know, I didn't want to just jump in front of Bobo's entrance. And as he's kind of jogging in place, one of the, the, uh, ushers, the, the, the Andy Frayne security ushers that used to work the gardens, one of them would always watch the back door to the alley and the, uh, another one came through to do something. And you heard him because the, the sound carried in this back holding area in the gardens, it was metal doors and concrete walls and it would just echo and even though they were whispering you could hear him who's that big black guy over there and the other guy said well that that's bozo brazier and bobo <laughs> looked over and he looked back at me and he had that voice he sounded a little bit like ernie ladd but he was much lower speaking he said 30 years in the wrestling business and it's bozo brazier <laughs> 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 uh, it's so fucking funny <laughs> all right you got one more because you got one point there so you're all winning. right and i'm and God damn, i'm here. trying to, i'm trying to find one for you that's not a gimme um, i'm giving you that was a gimme if that it was boston come on all right it could have been fucking i don't know north hollywood all right um oh geez no that's not this is there a main event without this fucking guy? <sighs> We're going with Memphis, Tennessee. No. Nineteen. <laughs> All right, asshole. It's Mister Asshole. I got, I got one for you. Then here's the card: Sonny Myers versus Bulldog Danny Pletchis. Has Sonny Myers been mentioned on any other wrestling show as much as he's been mentioned here this week? No, and somehow weeks? he just pops up everywhere. <laughs> he's all over the goddamn place. Paul Bunyan versus oh. Leaping Larry Shaney and the er, Le Leaping Shane? Larry Shane Shaney Leaping Larry Shane and the Bruiser. Well, well, when you say the Bruiser, uh, well, keep going. I'll I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Peggy Allen versus Kitty Adams. Dick Steinborn versus Art Nelson. And Doug Donovan versus Ricky Romero. Again, I think we're in Texas. I don't think you'd hit me with New Mexico. We're in Texas. We're either in Houston, Texas, or a town they would possibly book out talent to. Or maybe somewhere else, like El Paso, or even San Antonio. San Antonio had a lot of really good programs. The El Paso ones are good, too. Give me the card once again, uh, the main event. Okay, and, and actually, I gave, it, I gave it to you in the wrong order because I'm tired. Doug Donovan versus Ricky Romero. Doug Donovan would later on become one of the Von Brauners, correct? Dick Steinborn versus Art Nelson. Peggy Allen versus Kitty Adams. A handicap match with Paul Bunyan against Larry Shane and the Bruiser. And Sonny Myers versus Bulldog Pletchis. 
That's the main event, or Rita Romero was the main event. That, that that's that's the main event. Is Sunny Sunny Myers and Bulldog Plexus was, was the main event. <sighs> Could that be a Houston show? I don't know. Could that draw a house? I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna. I don't think you'd hit me with back to back Houston programs, because that'd be a dickish thing to do, or Houston related territory or, or towns. I'm but gonna, if you if you if you think about other things I've said off air, nevertheless. <sighs> Off air, you talk about the fucking gardener. Um, <laughs> I'm going with. I'm going with San. An- I'm going with El Paso. Nine, uh, Nineteen fifty-eight. Oh my god! That's the year you got it. We're yeah! still tied. Yeah, we're still fucking tied. Yeah. It's Amarillo, Texas. Fuck! I should have Amarillo that. by morning up from San Antonio. And the only, I told you I'd been looking at this Amarillo book of, that Scott Teal did. Yes, And that's did. what I could reach. So I said, okay, I was trying to find a main event that Dory Funk Sr. was not in to give it away completely. But it was Amarillo, but you still got, we're still tied. Fuck it. I'm saying we're kissing each other's sisters. And I've seen your sister. I win. I'm getting the better end of the deal. I win because you cheated. You didn't have the program. You went to a book. You just went through something in a book. That's not well, how the, the game works. Up. You forfeit. I win. That's cheating. Wait a minute. Hold on here. I've been. <laughs> I've been disqualified. Procedural error. I apologize. All right. I'm disqualified. Great Brian last wins four to four on a disqualification. And this has been guess the program here on your show. (laughs) Well, there it is a collection of guess the program. I guess we should only say volume one because we'll be playing this again more and more on the show in the future. But Jim, any closing words here on this omnibus? No, actually I've got to go. There's somebody knocking on my front door and they're holding a covered casserole dish. It looks like my Aunt Lola's broccoli and cheese. Who could that be? I don't know. Possibly one of our sponsors. Well, we'll let you go right now and check out who's at the door for Jim Cornette. I'm the great Brian Last. Tally ho!